Right now, more than ever, graphic design is all around us. Words and pictures, the building blocks of graphic design, are quite literally everywhere. They're the elements that make up our interface to both the digital world and the printed world. And as graphic design elements become more prevalent in our lives, graphic design as a practice becomes more important in our culture, and there's an increased need for more graphic designers. Graphic design is a really broad field. It can take many forms. You can be a graphic designer and just make books or logos. You could design web interfaces or t-shirts, chocolate boxes or political posters. But what all of these specialized areas of graphic design have in common is that design is being used to represent a product or an idea or a message and convey that to an audience. Design is a way of communicating something to someone else through visual means. There are many different types of graphic designer. Some are very technical, some very formal. Some have a practice derived by research or concept, and some are driven purely by style or aesthetics, others by the desire to experiment, but they all deal with controlled communication through text and image. Sometimes designers just use image, illustration, and sometimes they just use text, typography, but mostly designers use a combination of the two, tied together by the use of color and composition. In this course, I'd like to try and reduce this vast and varied practice down to some fundamental skills. These are the building blocks you need to master in order to be able to eventually build something more complex and refined, and they're going to be relevant to pretty much every specialized area of graphic design. We're going to break graphic design down into its basic components, image, type, shape, and color, and then we'll look at composition, where we put all the elements together into a composed piece of graphic design. By breaking the larger practice of graphic design down into these smaller areas, we can examine how each of them works and learn about them in greater depth. I don't just want you to watch a video of someone talking about design, I want you to make design, to get your hands dirty, to get excited about making. So this fundamentals course is going to be a practical one. I'm going to show you visual examples of the things I'm talking about, and I'm going to have you make some of those same things. After all, if you want to be a designer, you have to be a visual person. You have to be a maker, either a maker of meaning or a maker of form, or preferably both. By the end of this course, you will have tasted the core aspects that make up the practice of graphic design. You'll have experimented with image making, tried your hand at typography, and learnt about color, shape, and composition. Hopefully, you'll have acquired an appetite to develop those skills, a desire to continue to build your skills, with the ultimate goal of becoming a successful graphic designer. To begin this course, we're going to look at image making techniques. Many graphic design practices involve image making, and these images often work as literal depictions. The image represents the thing itself, and we call these kind of images denotative images. For instance, Let's say I make an image of an apple. It sounds simple, but how that apple is represented can say a lot to the viewer. The technique used to make the image of the apple, the aesthetics of the image, well, that can say a lot about the apple itself. It can make the apple look healthy and delicious, or rotten and disgusting. So how the image is made becomes very important. The designed image says something about the actual object, about what kind of apple it is. The designer is adding extra information and communicating that information to the viewer, and this can have a big effect. In this case, it might make the difference between whether you want to eat the apple or not. It gets more complicated as you begin to change that denotative or archetypal image and pair that image with other elements. And when designers do this, the apple is no longer just an apple. It can represent or suggest a different idea, and we call these kind of images connotative images. For instance, if we put a mortarboard on the apple or a test grade by the side of it, then that apple becomes about knowledge. If we put a few lines indicating the apple is falling, you could read that as being about gravity. One half red, one half green, that could be about good and evil. Or a snake wrapped around the apple, well, you might read that image as being about sin or temptation. In this course, we're going to make images that are both literal and metaphorical, images that are denotative and connotative. We're going to look at some of the formal strategies and techniques used in image making, and we're going to do this with a spirit of experimentation and embracing ideas of process. And what this means is 
We aren't necessarily looking to see who can draw the most perfect apple. Graphic design isn't always about perfection. Quite often it's more about making the unexpected or the original. And we're interested in everyone being able to investigate a broad range of making techniques, to generate their own images and to really enjoy the process of image making. So I want you to give yourself permission to make in this loose and generative way to really enjoy the process of making. I think you'll make some images that will be beautiful, successful and surprising. What is denotative image making? Well, it sounds quite complicated, but in fact, denotative image making is the simplest kind of image making. Let's say you're making an image of an object. Denotative image making is when you make an image of that object and it is exactly what the object is. Your image is an exact representation of that object. There's no other meaning attached to it. It literally is what it is. So for this project we're going to look at some everyday objects and we're going to use those as the basis for some image making techniques and skill development. So let's start out by looking at a few good ideas for what those objects might be. So here's a very denotative image of a pencil. It'd be quite hard for a viewer to look at this and really get any other message from this image other than the fact that it's a pencil. A lot of denotation is really trying to get the essence of an image, trying to strip it down to its core communicative value and that's a useful skill to have as a designer. So here for instance is a pair of glasses again it'd be hard to read that as anything else. Other good objects for this project might be something like a cup or perhaps even a pair of scissors. Something where it's an object that has a range of possibilities but also has a level of simplicity to the object. So you could use something like a bunch of keys perhaps a corkscrew or a shoe. I'd pick something that is an everyday object, something that's just lying around the house that you can use, something that has a level of simplicity to it in terms of how it can be represented visually but also has the possibility for a little bit of complexity as well. So it could be a pair of headphones or the object that I'm going to use for this example which is an apple. When you make an image of an object, a denotative image that is, the first thing that you have to really think about is what is the essence of that object? How do we recognize this image, for instance, as an apple? Well, it's partly the shape, it's partly the color, the texture, it might be the proportions of it, and it might be that it has certain elements that help us recognize that it's an apple and not something else. It's important to understand that a single object can exist in many different states and still communicate itself. So for instance, here's half an apple. It has very different signifiers, very different things that tell us it's an apple than the first image, but we still understand it. Now the pips and the stalk and the shape of the apple communicate much more than just the skin of the apple and the shape of the apple in the first image. And we can break that image down to an even smaller segment and it still be recognizable as an apple. We can even use the pieces to make up a new whole and still understand that it's an apple and we can also change our viewpoint. If you think of yourself as a camera you can move all around the object and see it from different angles. So the apple in real life can exist in many forms or states but the apple as a representation, as an image, well that also exists in a lot of different states but we have to make that, we have to communicate that to an audience. And we're making marks here as designers and as illustrators, so we have to understand, well, what's the essence of that object? How am I going to make a mark on a piece of paper that's going to communicate that to an audience? So here's our half an apple again, and we still recognize it as an apple, but now it's got a visual style to it, because the image has been made by a designer instead of photographed in a realistic way. And here we can see just a part of the apple, the core of the apple, standing in for the whole, but we still understand that it's an apple. And the designer is controlling the communication here. And you can see what happens when it goes wrong. Is this an apple or a cherry? It's hard to tell because the designer hasn't really got at the quintessential aspects of the apple and communicated them to the audience. Instead, there's some elements that can read as a cherry in there, so we get confused. And what's making this image confusing might just be as simple as the relationship in scale between the stalk and the body of the fruit. And part of the designer's job 
is to control those messages, control those visual cues that might mean other things and make them mean the thing that you want them to. And later on we're going to look at how you can deliberately mix those messages and use them to your advantage. But for now, let's stick to denotation and let's try and unravel all the different ways that an image of a single object can be made. When we make a denotative image, we also have to take into account the kind of form that we're using to make that image. So here's a fairly denotative view of the apple, but it's also been reduced down to a kind of denotative image quality, if you like. It's a very simple line drawing, just drawn with a pen. The outline of the image lets us know that it's the shape of the apple, and the stalk lets us know that it's an apple, and maybe the scale relationship between the stalk and the apple. So even without color and without volume, we can get the message and we can understand that it's an apple. You could add volume and dimensionality to that apple. Still by just using black and white and gray and cross hatching here, but suddenly there's much more information. Now we understand it's an apple and it's still a denotative image. The apple is just an apple, nothing more, nothing less. But we start to see a lot more details in the image. And we could use a similar technique and give even more information by adding color to the image. So gradually the image has gone from being very little information held in the denotative form, in other words the way we made the image, to a lot more information held in the form. And that amount of visual information really correlates to an image being photorealistic or an image being iconic. If we go back to our line drawing of an apple, we can look at this as being a very simplistic and iconic image, whereas our colored pencil drawing image is much more realistic. What these two images have in common is that they're both denotative images. One just happens to be very minimal and have little information, whereas the other has much more information and detail in the technique. And part of what the designer gets to decide is what technique is going to be used to make that image because images can be made in any number of ways and still be denotative because denotative images can still be read as the object they're meant to convey in other words an apple no matter how you make that image as long as it can be read as an apple you can make it in a minimal way, a maximal way, an expressive way, an abstract way pretty much any way that you want to and there's going to be times when you want a very complex image perhaps a very decorative image and there's going to be other times where you want a simple and iconic image, say it's for an identity or a brand, something that has to be read very quickly for instance. And that's why it's important as a designer to have a range of skills and a range of techniques available to you. And that's what we're going to look at next. One of the things that I really like about graphic design and especially image making is that there are a number of techniques for you to investigate. It's almost limitless and it can be really exciting as a designer to be able to experiment and come up with new ways of working and new ways of making images. There are literally hundreds of ways to make an image and these range from ways that are very time consuming and very meticulous to ways that are very fast and easy and experimental. I'm really interested in the idea of creative inventive making. Right now there's a million images online. Pretty much anything that you want is out there and a pretty good image of almost anything that you can imagine. So what's going to make your images different? What's going to make them compelling? You could spend a lot of time meticulously making an image, or you could create a process that's much more inventive, one that's going to generate images that perhaps aren't already out there, that nobody has seen before. I would encourage you to try making in a lot of different ways. Try different techniques and different processes, whether that's things that are digital and on the computer, or that it's things that are done by hand, or a mix of the two of them. Eventually it'll be really useful to spend some time refining some of these images and really mastering a technique, but for now it's much more about generation and about iteration, trying to make a lot of things, have fun and get some kind of energy and enthusiasm going in your image making. So with most of these image making techniques we're going to look at, we're really interested in your process rather than creating a perfect image at the end of the day. So how do you get started? I would say just dive in, just start making images with any materials that you have at hand. Don't worry about your images being good or bad or very finished or not. 
just make something. The worst that's going to happen is you make an image and then you can refine it or react to it, but at least you'll be making. A good idea is to start out simple, just basic shapes, easy line drawings, simple materials and simple form. Not everybody can make an image that's as complex or maybe takes as much formal skill as this, but anybody with even basic drawing skills can make an image that works like this one. And anyone with even rudimentary computer skills can make an image that looks like this one. Think how you can be clever and inventive and interesting as an image maker, rather than just being polished and refined. And the easiest way to get started is just to start simple. Draw the image in the simplest way you possibly can with the simplest tools. So here you can see the image of the apple is reduced to a single circular form and a, with a stalk and a leaf and the color plays a very important signifying role for us to recognize it as an apple. Experiment with a lot of different tools for mark making. Even though these images are all line based, the tool that the line is made with has a great effect on what the image looks like and how the image feels. The quality of the line can be seen in the tool that makes the mark but also in the gesture that you're making. Think about how your arm is moving and how your hand is moving as you make these lines to represent the object. Your lines could be very loose and organic, or on the other hand, your lines could be much tighter and more graphic. You could have a line that feels a little bit more naive or a little bit more primitive. Or perhaps you use your line as an image making strategy. This apple, for instance, is drawn with a single stroke of a ballpoint pen, the pen never ever leaving the paper. You could also think about your images having no line quality at all and just working with volume. Here the image has no outline, it has no linear qualities to rely on to define its shape. Instead it uses texture and weight. It becomes very gestural but even without the description of the line or without color, we can still tell it's an apple. And when we start to use color with the idea of volume, you really get a sense of what the object feels like in an expressive way. Here, the designer uses volume to describe the outside of the apple, but the lack of volume actually describes the inside of the apple, the white flesh of it. Small details like the pips and the stalk let us know that it's an apple and maybe not some other kind of fruit. And in this image you can clearly see how volume works without the linear definition to contain it. Here the color is blurring out into the background and really leaving us with just an impressionistic view of the apple. This image is also relying on color as a primary means to express that the object is an apple. And this can be exaggerating even more by emphasizing and overemphasizing both the scale and the saturation of the color. So here our recognition of this object as an apple really relies on the fact that we recognize this round shape that's red with a small leaf that's green as being an apple and not something else, even though we can clearly see there are, it's made out of other elements that have other meanings. So if we were to revisit denotation for a moment, we could think that Perhaps if this leaf on top of the apple was in a different shape, then perhaps we wouldn't read it as an apple anymore, we'd read it as a tomato. So what we're really trying to get at here is, how do you make an image that gets at the essence of your object? Another aspect of image making to think about is cropping. What this means is, how close up to or how far away you are from your image. And this determines exactly what you're going to see of the image. So here, for instance, we can see a close-up of the apple, but we can still determine that it's an apple. There's still enough visual information there to let us know what it is. So sometimes it's useful to think about what is the closest that I can get to my object and still represent it in a recognizable way, versus what's the furthest away that I could get from my object and still have it be recognizable. And this notion of recognizability can be really pushed in image making, particularly in an exercise like this where you're making a lot of different versions of images of the same object. So for instance, this image might only really look like an apple in the context of you seeing it as a, in a group of images with a bunch of other apples. On its own, you might have a hard time recognizing what it is. 
But that's okay in this instance because part of what we're trying to do here is get you to experiment with different techniques and they're not always going to work. So try things that you don't know how to use. Try things you haven't done before. Maybe some, for some people that might mean looking at technology and trying to use new programs that they may be uncomfortable with. For other people it might be getting more hands-on skills and working off the computer. But try whatever you can and just really experiment and just see what happens. Part of what I think is valuable about this kind of visual experimentation is that you really push the boundaries of denotation and understand where they lie. You're really testing when is this image going to break down and stop being readable as the object that it was intended to be readable as? When does this apple stop being an apple? Another aspect of image making that you can think about is texture. We quite often think about things being very flat in a digital world and having a, a pixel texture. But if you're making images by hand and with objects and paint and raw materials onto different surfaces, quite often that texture can be much, much more important. So sometimes even the simplest element, the simplest representation of that object with a little texture can be really interesting. And one of the things that can accentuate the texture of an object or of an illustration can be a contrast. So here we can see there's two different ways of making this image. There's the soft crayon line, but then mixed with this very rough and textured collage element. So the contrast is actually what's giving the texture or making the texture be visible. So often it can be really interesting to take different processes and different kinds of materials and image making techniques and mix them up, mix them together. So maybe take something you're very familiar with and something you're less familiar with and see what happens when you pair the two. And one of the best things about this is quite often the images that you make can end up being quite surprising. And again, surprising to the viewer, but also to surprising to you as an image maker. And that means they get to be fun to make. And quite often, the more that you can mix these different ways of working and the more unexpected the work becomes and the image making becomes, then the more original the image becomes. And you start to make things that not only surprise yourself, but they're images that you probably haven't seen before or you haven't seen them made in this exact way. And that's really great. It starts to get at an originality and starts to get at you developing your own personal style and your own way of image making. And trying to get at this idea of originality or an original way of image making can quite often mean that you have to do some things that might surprise yourself or seem a little silly. So here, for example, some of these images are made by not taking the pen off the piece of paper or by deliberately drawing in a naive way or well, here, for instance, these drawings are made blind, so the, the designer, the illustrator, isn't even looking at the piece of paper while they're drawing. And again, here the image is made by just one continuous line without taking the pen off, but it's in a totally different style. It feels much more like a, a contour map as a way of drawing the apple. Be inventive and try and think of strange ways to make images. And that can sometimes be taking a low-tech or guerrilla approach to image making. So this image, for instance, is made just by putting the apple core straight on the scanner and scanning the image without really knowing what it's going to come out like. Well, here's the same idea with a different low-tech device. Here, the apples cut in half are just placed on the glass surface of a photocopier. And again, what's great about this is you can get very surprising images very, very quickly. In this segment, we're going to look at three important aspects of image making. Process, generation, and iteration. And these are much less about your skills as an image maker or as a designer, and much more about how can you develop some strategies to be productive and generate a lot of material when you're making images. So let's first of all look at process. Process is how you make images, the steps that you take in order to make them. So rather than thinking about image making as a, a very literal, direct process where you have a clear idea of what the image should be and then you make exactly that image, process-driven image making really lets you experiment along the way, quite often without an idea of what the final outcome is going to be. So for instance, we might have an idea of a process for making this image, which is to cut an apple in half, to put some 
different colored paint onto that apple and then make a print using the apple itself as the object that we're printing with. Now we might have a fairly clear idea about what this image might come out like, but we couldn't possibly predict exactly what the image might look like in all its details. And if we start to add more steps to our process, so here for instance is the image overprinted a couple of times, we actually start to get even more interesting results. And there's no real way that you could have visualized these results in the first place. You could have had a rough idea of what you think is going to happen or how you might want the image to feel, but the exact details are really down to the process itself. So here's another example where the designer made the shape of an apple out of some pieces of cardboard and then used those pieces of cardboard as a plate to make a, an image from by either coloring the image in or by rubbing over the image. And while the shape of the image might be quite predictable, the haloing and the texture really is less predictable and comes out of the process, it comes out of the making. And you can see that's accentuated even further when you start to have multiples of this image or, and to have them interact together where suddenly the negative space and the texture is even more accentuated than before. And one thing that's great about process-driven work is that you can use it as a way to make a number of images. You can make the images as the process progresses. So for instance, here's um, a woodcut where you can see it's an apple core, and then here's a later version of the woodcut where there's even more cut away. And so by making different prints at different times in the process, you start to get a range of images, and then you can go back and look at them and pick which one you really want to use. Iteration is your friend in any kind of image making. And what iteration means is just that you make a lot of variations of the same thing. You don't just make one image and be done. You actually redraw the same image, try and remake it, rework it, make slightly different versions of it. And what this is allowing you to do is to really test drive your images so that you make them and you look at them and you can assess which ones are working and which ones aren't. And sometimes the easiest way to do that is really to look at the image and say, well, is this one better than this one? And you really and you have to have two comparative images in order to make that kind of decision. And part of what iteration boils down to is the fact that you don't always get it right first time. So it's useful to have many opportunities at making the same image over and over again. Just think about it like takes in a movie or recording a song and having to record little pieces of it over and over again. You Sometimes you have to do the thing two or three times in order to get it just right. One of the great things about iterative image making is that every time you make that image you're actually practicing and you're really increasing your image making skills. So it's a really good way of mastering a certain technique because you're forcing yourself to really participate in that technique over and over again. The third aspect of image making that we're going to look at briefly is generation. Um, what we mean by this is just making as many objects as you can, just trying to continually make and to learn from that making as a continual process. So don't get put off if you get stuck or if you're having a hard time with anything. Just move on and try a different technique or a different way of working. Part of this is about acknowledging that there's no single correct way to make this image. We're really looking at you to try and be inventive, try and experiment, and try and gather a really wide, broad range of skills, and then be able to apply those skills later on to a number of different projects. Hi, today I'm going to make some prints by using an apple and directly using that apple to make the prints. I'll cut it in half and then apply ink to the apple and then print using those two halves of the apple. So first, I guess I'll cut the apple in half without hammering myself there. And then um, I have some watercolor inks here, and I guess I'll just directly apply the watercolor inks to one side of the apple to start. And not use too much water because the water, or the apple already has some water in it. And I have some uh, papers underneath my main paper here just to give some cushion to the print. I might try using some 
stamp ink, some red stamp ink, and overprint that really quickly just to try to get some more color into it. So I'm just inking up this apple using an eraser to transfer the stamp ink onto the surface of the apple. Okay. And just printing right over that last print. And the colors, yeah, are a little nicer. I might just get a second print just directly of the stamp ink to kind of just get a sense of the shape of the apple. So that's kind of nice because it still kept some of the color from the original watercolor ink, but it's primarily that nice stamp ink that's left on there. So I might try just inking up a new side of this apple with some different colors. This is a little pink. Try not to get too much water in the watercolors before applying it to the apple because there's so much water in there already. It's kind of almost dry brushing. Might try another without inking again. That's kind of nice, but it's still, it's a little too hard to see. So I might add some more color to this. Let me see, let's see. Try to add blue for a nice contrast with this, this light pink. A little darker to get a darker impression. Just roughly painting on here. Okay. Again, I'm going to try to overprint on one of the last pink impressions. I try to get some darker color, darker blue. I even try mixing colors directly on the apple. Get a kind of a gradient. And again, I kind of like this overprinting, the look of this overprinting, so I might just keep my print right over that other print again. Need a little darker darker around the edges, maybe try to get some depth in the print by just painting one of the edges darker than everything else. Let's see. Print's still a little wet, so I might try to print that again on a new sheet of paper. Print that twice, and then maybe I'll take the other apple with the stamp ink and overprint with that to get the contrasting colors and shapes of the two different apple slices or two different apple sections. Just quickly ink the edges. an overprint and we'll try one more I see it transferred some ink from the paper back to the apple which could be cool try one more print yeah that kind of has the same effect of transferring the color the watercolor back onto the apple, which I used in, in this new print. And it could be cool just to try an apple cut the other way, kind of along the latitude of the apple. Just get that contrasting shape in there. This is, I think this is ink both with stamp ink, just oil-based stamp ink, and also some watercolor.
it's kind of nice because it, it's kind of faking the dimension of the apple a little bit. So I'm going to try to finalize some of these prints with some oil pastels and some just colored pencil. Maybe add in the leaves, uh, the stems, the seeds to kind of maybe denote more of an apple um, from these prints. So I can start making a little leaf shape. Getting the outline of that. And maybe put in a little stem here. And then finalize it, maybe put a couple seeds just in the center. Using some charcoal. Maybe use a couple colors there. And then work just working in those leaves a little bit to add some depth with the second green and get that stem back on top. And maybe I'll work into these ones with the colored pencil instead of the oil pastel. And go back in there with a lighter green. Maybe I'll still use the pastel for the, the stem. And the charcoal for the, the seeds. And then go back through maybe a black stem. And a couple seeds to finish it off. I'm going to make a print by cutting apple shapes from this duct tape. I will put this, uh, this shape on a paper and ink it with this oil-based stamp ink um, to make a plate. These materials are easy to find and you can do it from your home. First of all, I'm just going to cut this. I'm putting on my cutting mat so I can cut a shape out of it more easy, easily. So, I'm just cutting an apple shape from the tape. Um, and to make it look more like an apple, I'm gonna Cut a little hole and I'm putting that on a paper and I have this ink, oil based ink and I'm applying it on that shape that I just cut out. And take another new piece of paper and I'm gonna make the print out of it. So I just put it on top of what I just made and by rubbing it, hoping to get some prints and I think we have a little apple print here. I want to make a little more of apples with it around it, so like make it a little group. Um, I have some of these like pre cut apples here. In here, um, 
I'm making, I'm composing them together. Mm. And yeah, we're missing some stem. And maybe some of them have a leaf on it. Um, maybe one apple can be the side away. And let's see what it looked like. The print. Again. I'm putting some pressure on it so I don't miss any, any shape from that I made. And I have some apple prints here. And I know that I use this for um, to make this print. But I kind of like this base too with the orange tape with the red ink on it. So I have another apple print here. Okay, I'm going to try some quick iterations using this simple apple line drawing. And what I'll do is I'll put it on the window so we have some backlight and we don't need a light table. And then I'll overlay some paper on top and just try different techniques really quickly. So first I guess I'll try something maybe with a brush with some ink residue on there so it's kind of a dry brush effect. First kind of get the general shape. Get some orange. Water on the brush. Stem. Maybe that's one quick apple. Um, yeah, I'm gonna pick some sort of like apple like colors and then just pull them all together and maybe trace it. I think now maybe I'll use this kind of fat black oil crayon. Um, just kind of get very rough, rough apple in here. Could be as quick as that. Just getting some more India ink on the brush. Just 
just black ink. Give it a little dimension. Gouache on this. Let's just try to mix the two techniques. In this next section, we're going to look at connotation with images. Now we've already looked at denotation, and we describe that as being, it is what it is. In other words, as a designer, we might make an image of an object, and that image directly represents that object. In other words, it is what it is. The image of the apple can only be read as being an apple. But connotation works in a slightly different way. It's when we start to want to suggest something else, or build a metaphor, or an idea. And that can obviously be very useful for designers in terms of communicating something more complex. The dictionary defines connotation as an idea or feeling that a word invokes in addition to its literal meaning. But as designers, we're also dealing with images. So we're going to also be looking at how images evoke in addition to their literal meaning. So let's go back and think of our apple. When we'd looked at denotation, we'd looked at making an image of that apple in the most simple means possible. And one of our simplest denotative images was just the line drawing of the apple. And it's very hard to read any other kind of meaning into this image other than the fact that it's an apple. The form is really not very ambiguous in any way. It can't be read as being some other shape, some other thing. Pretty much all we can read as a viewer from this image is an apple. So how do we make the apple do something else? How do we make the apple mean something else? Let's look at some examples of what kinds of connotation we can build from the apple, what we might have to do to the image of the apple in order to tell those stories. One of the examples that we'd looked at earlier was the idea that the apple might represent the choice between good and evil. For instance, in um, the fairy tale of Snow White, the apple, the wicked witch, gives her an apple that's half red and half green. So if we think about that as a cultural context, as a reference that people understand, or a lot of people understand within a given culture, then we can start to use that to build meaning. In this case, we can construct this image that instead of being just about two pieces of an apple, it becomes about choice, or again, about good and evil. Now, we could also create that same kind of idea, that same kind of context of good and evil and Snow White, by actually thinking about adding another element to the apple. So if we look here, just the fact that 
the apple has a bite out of it and then the hand is laid down by the side of it, that suddenly tells a much, much larger story. So we're really telling that story by adding an additional element, by giving some context to our narrative. If, for instance, we were to take away the hand, we'd be left with a totally different image. Without the hand to create the story, we're really just left with an image of an apple that could be very ambiguous. It could just be an apple that's had a bite taken out of it. So what we're doing with our image making here is much more than just making a visual representation. We're actually making meaning. We're telling stories, creating narratives, and giving extra information to the viewer. So let's look at another example. Here's our apple, but now it has a snake next to it. Now, what does that mean? How do we read this image? Reading denotation is quite easy. The apple's an apple. That's the only reading that we're trying to get as an image maker. But now with connotation, we're trying to suggest something or tell a secondary story. And that's a little bit harder. We're trying to actually control the meaning that we're conveying to an audience member. And that's a key design skill. So here you can see there's an image of a snake and suddenly this becomes about sin or temptation. It has a biblical reference in the Western world. Now, denotative images can be very culturally contextual. They can mean different things to different cultures. In general, we're trying to work with an idea of cultural consensus here, that most people might understand what this image means. But sometimes that does involve a certain culture knowing a certain history or a certain context. So things can be different in different parts of the world. So with this image, for instance, it relies on the audience knowing the story of William Tell, of the archer placing an apple on his son's head and shooting it with a bow and arrow. Otherwise, this image might just seem very strange, somebody with an apple on their head with an arrow through it. But if you know the context, then you really understand what the connotation of this image is. Let's take a look at some other ways that connotation can work. Here, for instance, we've got a maggot coming out of an apple. But it's almost antithetical to the way that the apple is drawn. It looks very happy, and even the maggot itself looks to be smiling. So here it's really interesting that the connotation, the suggestion that the apple is rotten, can actually be in direct contradiction to the denotative form, which is suggesting a, a happy apple, a healthy apple. In this image, we've added some lines and we've tilted the angle of the apple to make it look as though the apple is falling. Now this might just represent an apple falling from a tree, and that could still be a fairly denotative image. But in terms of connotation, it might also suggest the reference to Sir Isaac Newton and the apple falling from the tree that made him think of the theory of gravity. Or this image where the snake is made out of apples might actually again suggest sin. But on the other hand, we can see here a level of ambiguity. Perhaps that's not a snake at all. Perhaps it's just a hungry caterpillar. So again, the references can really be up to the reader. So sometimes there can be a level of ambiguity in connotation. And not everybody is always going to read the same image in the same way. So part of your job as a designer is to try and control the messages that you're making, and to try and think about how they're going to be read by an audience. So here, for instance, with this apple that has a letter grade next to it, that might suggest grading or teaching or a classroom. So the phrase that might come to mind could be an apple for teacher. Now that might rely on somebody knowing that phrase or understanding that phrase. But there are other images where the connotation can be universal. For instance, it's quite hard to look at this image and not think of the tech giant. You don't think of a real apple at all. You don't think of the fruit. You think of the tech company. Controlling connotation is really about controlling meaning. And again, obviously, that's very important for designers in terms of how they communicate to their audience. So for this image, for example, if you understand or know a little bit about art history or about Magritte's paintings, it's very hard to look at this and not think about that Magritte painting and not understand that it's a reference to surrealism, 
even though it's not an exact copy of the painting, it contains the same elements. So your brain is basically connecting those elements back to this other artwork, this other reference. So it becomes more than just, here's an apple wearing a bowler hat. It becomes, oh, here's a Magritte-esque surreal apple. So the way that connotation works is that it references something else. It signifies something else. And that thing that it signifies, it suggests, isn't always the same as what the thing is itself. The apple can suggest more than just an apple. And quite often connotation is tied to how we use language. So here, for instance, we can see image and text working together. And if we read this, we can read it as apple of my eye. But if we take away the text and put the apple where the pupil should be, we can still read that image as apple of my eye. We still think about that phrase, even though there's no language there to suggest that at all. And these connotations, these visual metaphors, they can almost be like a rebus or a puzzle sometimes, that they take a little unfathoming, they take a little work to understand. And this is because connotation is inherently more complex than denotation. It relies on other things. It relies on a cultural context and it relies often on a body of knowledge of the viewer. So whereas denotation works for everybody, and connotation requires a level of visual literacy or a level of contextual understanding that makes it much more complex. It's actually asking a lot more of the viewer. But the upside to this is it gives the designer way more tools to create more complicated messages. For many people, typography can be one of the hardest aspects of graphic design to understand, but it's also one of the most important. If you think about it, graphic design is really made up of communication in words and communication in pictures, and typography is half of that equation. It's how we communicate with words. For many people, type can feel like a foreign language. It almost seems like it's very obtuse, like you can't enter into it or see it or understand it in any way. So what we're going to try and do in this course is break down typography so you understand the terminology to do with it and you understand a few basic ways to work with type. What we're really hoping the outcome of this course will be is that you'll feel comfortable with using type and you'll be able to have a set of rules that let you know how to work with type but it'll also hopefully free you up a little bit to start experimenting and playing with type a bit more. In order to learn how to work with typography you're first of all going to need to learn how to talk about typography. You're going to need to know some typographic terminology, or what you might call the lexicon of letters. That's going to give you a shared vocabulary with other designers, but it's also going to let you look at letter forms and typography and understand all their intricacies and how they work. So let's start out by looking at the simplest building block of typography, the single letter. So let's look at the letter A. Letter forms are constructed of strokes. So if we look at our letter A, for instance, here we can see that the letter form is constructed of two strokes. And this construction by stroke really goes back to when letter forms were drawn by a pen or a brush. So they would have individual strokes drawn by hand to make up the letter form. Letter forms have their own specific terminology to describe the various different parts of each letter. So here we can see some different parts of the letter form that make up the anatomy of the letter A. So here you can see the two strokes of our letter form. You can see the vertical stroke is called the stem, and this holds a lot of the weight and the stress of the letter form. And then the other part of the letter form, the other stroke, is called the bowl, where it's round and curved. The end of the letter form is called the terminal, and this area can be truncated, cut perpendicular, or diagonally, or have a rounder, more ball shape. The space that's trapped inside a letter form is called the counter space, and this can be space that is entirely trapped, or space that is partially trapped. Where the end of the letter form trails off is known as a spur, and obviously the ends of the letters can also be a place where serifs might exist. A lot of typographic terms are based on the human body. 
and that's partly because letter forms were drawn on humanist proportions based either on proportions of the human figure or drawn showing evidence of human hand. So let's look at some of those terms. Here for instance we can see a group of terms that relate to the human body but also relate to letter forms. So here you can see the capital letter R has a shoulder but it also has a leg that sticks out. And these elements are named this way because they look like these parts of the human body. The small appendage on the upper part of the G is called an ear. At the bottom of the leg of the K you can see it has a foot and sticking up in the air above that you can see there's the arm. And here you can see the negative space, the counter space that's trapped inside the, the letter E is called the I. And the diagonal holding a lot of the weight and the stress of the letter S is called the spine. Now we've looked at typographic terminology to do with letter forms, let's look at some of the terminology to do with words. Here's a word made up of single letter forms, and they look like they're floating in space on the page, but they're not really floating in space, they're aligned on an invisible line called a baseline. The baseline falls at the bottom of the capital letters, and it falls at the bottom of the main central part of the lowercase letters, and you can see where a letter form like an X, for instance, really delineates that height of the lowercase letters, and that in fact is called the X height. Most lowercase letters share a common X height, and there's other measurements that we look at as well. If you look at the height of a capital letter, that's called the cap height. Now some letter forms have pieces that go above and below the X height. When they go above the X height, they're called ascenders, and when they go below the X height, they're called descenders. Roman letter forms normally come in two different types. There's the capital letters, or uppercase, and then there's the lowercase. And the reason why these letter forms are called uppercase and lowercase is because in the old days of metal type, the metal type would be kept in a type drawer or a type case and these cases would be stacked right next to the printing press and the lowercase letters would be kept in a case that was down below and the uppercase letters or capitals would be kept in a case that was up above. A lot of typography has to do with relationships of contrast between darks and lights whether that's ink on a page or pixels on a screen and as soon as you have relationships that rely on these negative and positive contrasts you realize how important something like space is to typography and there's various kinds of space in typography. So here you can see that the space between letters is called letter space or sometimes that's referred to as kerning when you alter that space. The space between words is called a word space and if you alter both the letter spacing and the word spacing then that's called tracking. So let's take a quick look at how the letter spacing and word spacing affects both the look and feel of the type but also the legibility. So let's change the tracking on these two words and see what happens. You can see if we make that very tight then the words become very hard to read. They start to collide with each other. But on the other hand if we increase the tracking and make the type very loose you can see that there's a lot of space between the letter forms and that's also going to make it seem very hard to read. You're going to start to see individual letter forms instead of reading words. One of the most important things you need to know about type is how type is measured. Because type isn't measured in centimeters or inches, it has its own separate measuring system. So let's take a look at type size. Now we already know that type has a cap height measurement and you'd think that might be a sensible way of measuring type, but that isn't how type is measured. The system for measuring type that we used is based on times when type was actually set on metal, and that, that metal was used on a printing press to print letter forms, so each letter form was a raised piece of type, and it had a body behind it, it had a solid piece of metal behind it. And that block of lead behind the type, that body, would have a uniform size so that the type could be lined up on a press in order to print it. And it's this body that we measure when we're measuring type, and that's known as the point size of the type. Now what is a point, you might ask, and that's a very good question. Basically there are 72 points in an inch, so a point is 1 of an inch. 
And this might sound like a confusing system, but it's actually very useful because it can be mathematically divided into a very harmonious proportional system. So here we can see some different standard type sizes. 120, 96 point, 72 point, all the way down to 6 or 8 point type that's quite small. And these are a standard set of type sizes and they came about again from metal typesetting and in metal typesetting you would actually have to cast the typeface at a specific size so right you couldn't cast every single size every single one point increment you'd have to select which sizes you were going to set so these harmonious mathematical relationships grew out of that so it's very different from the computer screen where you can make type be any point size you like so these basic standard sizes are really useful, especially when you're starting type. They can be a good guidelines or good starting points. So let's look at what some of these different sizes are used for. When you're first working with type, these numbers can seem quite abstract. They don't really make that much sense. So it can help to categorize them into certain usages. So the larger size type, 120, 96, 72, that would be something more like being used for headlines. The medium size type would be for subheads, 36, 24. And if you were setting text, you'd set it in something like 10 point type, although I prefer 9 point or even 8.5, a, a little bit smaller. And then something as small as a 6 and 7 point type might be for footnotes or something like that. So let's take a look and see how that actually looks as comparative sizes in a format, say, for setting text in a book, for example. So here's some types set at these different sizes. You can see the headline is set at around 96 point, the subhead around 36, the body text is probably around 9 point, and the footnotes around 7 point. So you can see already how this kind of system, this scale harmonious system, works with these different preset point sizes. And it can really help you get a rough idea of what point size you should be using for what job. We've looked at typographic terminology to do with letters and to do with words, and now we're going to look and see what happens to that terminology when we look at a block of text. And it gets a little more complicated. There's a whole new set of terms that are introduced. When the text is set in a block like this to be read, it's called body text. And one of the first things to think about is how that text is going to be aligned. The two most commonly used settings for text are either justified or range left. So here let's look at range left, also known as rag right. When the text is range left you can see on the left hand side it aligns evenly whereas on the right hand side it's uneven or ragged. And When the text is justified text you can see that it's even on both sides, both the left and the right, and this tends to form more of a square solid shape whereas range left tends to look a little more friendly I think and is a little bit easier to read. If you're setting range left text, you probably want to have 9 to 12 words in your line length. And this area across here, this is the line length, which is also known as the measure. And that's about 60 to 70 characters, which is a comfortable amount to read for anybody. It means they get to the end of the line and they can easily find their way back to the beginning of the next line. And justified text has a few more words per line and it gives you a, a little more characters per line as well, probably around 70 or 80. So justified text can be a little more economical, but it can feel a little harsher on the page. Another aspect of typography that can dramatically affect how type looks and also its legibility is something called leading. So here's two pieces of typography. The type size is 9 point, the same, and the leading is 12 point, which is also the same. So what that 12 point refers to is the leading that the 9 point type is sitting on. And leading is basically the space that exists in the lines of type from baseline to baseline. So if you imagine these baselines being visible, you could measure that space, and it wouldn't necessarily be the same measurement as the type size. So let's see what happens when we change the leading. So here's two samples of type the same type size but set with different leading and you can see straight away how different they look. They're both 9 point type but the one on the right is much much easier to read. So here you can see the type is 9 point on 9 point so that's very tight. There's very little space between each line of type and that's called being set solid when the type size and the leading are the same. 
But with the 9 on 16 you can see there's much more space between the lines, they're clearly visible, and this might be too much leading. And the way that you can tell if your leading is too much or too little is really just to think about the comfort of reading. When you get to the end of a line, how easy is it for you to travel back to the beginning of the next line? Do you, get, do you lose your way, or is your eye taken there quite easily? On the left, the lines are too tight together, so that might be confusing, but on the right, they might be so loose that you can also lose your way. A handy trick to tell if your letting is approximately right on the computer is just to take your cursor and highlight the text. If you can see too much space between the black bars that are formed, then your type probably has too much letting, and if you can't see any space at all, your type probably needs a little bit more letting. We've looked at point sizes and how that's measured from type sitting on a body, but let's look at how different typefaces can appear to be visually different, even though they're the same type size. So here's three different typefaces, and these would all be the same size, they'd all be on the same body, they might all be 72 point for instance, but they certainly don't appear to visually be the same size. So even though all three typefaces are on the same body, you can see the typeface in the middle is visually much larger, it has a much larger X height, it has shorter ascenders and descenders, so it's taking up more space within the body. And this is worth thinking about because when you set type, it isn't just the point size that's going to affect the, how the type visually appears, it's also the typeface that you choose. When you first start to work with type, one of the things that can be the most daunting is choosing a typeface. There's so many typefaces out there, it can be quite overwhelming. How do you know which one to choose? How do you know the good ones from the bad ones? Or how do you know which one might be right for a certain job? And that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at how do you choose a typeface? Let's start by clarifying just what a typeface is. We all think we know what a typeface is. It's that thing that we recognize the shape of when we see it. We see these shapes and we think, oh, that's very familiar. We know that typeface. It's Times New Roman. For most typefaces, you would use the regular or Roman version. This means that the strokes are straight and non-italic and it's an average weight, not too heavy and not too light. Each typeface is normally part of a larger type family. A simple family is made up of the regular or Roman, a bolder version, an italic version for emphasis, and a bold italic version, and this makes up a simple type family. One thing that often causes a little confusion is the difference between a typeface and a font. Often in computer programs, the typeface is described as a font, but the two terms actually aren't synonymous. So let's take a look at the difference between a font and a typeface. A typeface is what we've already looked at. So that's one style within a type family. So here we can see Times Italic is a typeface, Times Roman is a typeface, Times Bold is a typeface. And it doesn't matter what size you set that typeface in, it's still going to be the same typeface. Times Roman. When used correctly, the term font actually applies to both the typeface and the size that it's set in. So for instance, 72 point times Roman would be a totally different font than 36 point times Roman, even though they would be the same typeface. And this terminology is from the days of metal type, when type would be cast on a certain size body, and the type would actually be redrawn depending on the size that it was going to be reproduced at. So actually, 72 point times Roman would look slightly different from 36 point types Roman. And so it would be a different font because the letter forms would be adjusted to print at a certain size. And that's no longer the case with digital typography, where everything is scaled up and scaled down very evenly. So we really now have changed the way that we use the term font, and the two become relatively interchangeable. But if you ever get stuck or get confused, it's always safer just to say typeface. When choosing a typeface, it can help you to start out by asking yourself some of the larger typographic questions. Should I use a serif or a sans serif? And what's the difference between the two anyway? Well, we can take a look at that right now. Serifs basically, at the end of their strokes, they have areas that stick out beyond the end of the stroke. And these were often originally came from chisel marks where letters were carved into stone, but they also became decorative and exist in many different forms. 
One of the functions of the serif is to actually accentuate the baseline and this sometimes helps the letters be easier to read in long texts. In contrast, sans serifs have no serifs at all. You can see that the strokes are actually truncated at their terminals. They're cut off flat. This gives a very clean, modern look. And while we've been trained to read serifs perhaps a little bit easier than sans serifs, we're so accustomed to it now that you can really read both of them with the same speed and legibility. So one of the deciding factors is often just how the type looks and feels. A serif obviously feels a little bit old, more old-fashioned, a little bit more classical, whereas a sans serif can feel more modern and cleaner, more geometric as well. So we've broken down the categories into serif and sans serif, two major categories, but let's break them down a little bit further and see what happens after that. Let's start by looking at how the serif typefaces break down. Serif typefaces can be broken down into four main categories. Let's look at them chronologically. Old style, transitional, modern, and Egyptian. As you can see, they look quite different. The letter forms have different characteristics. So let's start to look at those more closely. Let's start with old style. Old style serifs have a limited contrast between the thick and the thin strokes. They appear quite heavy and quite chunky. So if you look at the letter forms, the thick strokes are really not that different from the thin strokes. They also have a diagonal stress between the thick areas and where the thinner areas are. A typeface like Plantin that you can see here would be a good example of an old style typeface. Transitional typefaces come a little bit later and you can see that they look a little bit different. They have slightly more contrast between the thicks and the thins. The thins look a lot thinner than Plantin, so the type feels a little bit lighter a little more airy and delicate. There's also, they have a slightly less diagonal stress and slightly more vertical stress, so they start to look a little bit more contemporary. Modern serifs really aren't that modern at all. They date from the late 1700s and early 1800s, and you can see they're quite a radical departure in letter forms from previous serifs. If you look closely, you can see that they have a much straighter serif. There's very little angle to it, but also it's very, very thin. It's almost a hairline serif. You can see there's a lot of contrast between the thick parts of the letter forms and the thin parts of the letter forms. In terms of stress, they're pretty much symmetrical. The last category of serifs that we're going to look at are Egyptians. Egyptians have virtually no contrast between the thick and the thin strokes of the letter form, but also no contrast in weight between the strokes and the serifs. This makes them very, very sturdy and very even. They're also often symmetrical, so there's no stress to the letter form, and they're really a precursor to modern sans serif types. We can break sans serif typefaces down into three major categories. Let's look at them chronologically grotesque, geometric, and humanist. If we look at grotesque letter forms, these are quite simple letter forms. They're built out of slightly irregular forms with an even stroke. And what this means is the typeface looks very clean and modern like a sans serif, but it still has a little bit of the funkiness and unevenness that we've seen in serif typefaces. Geometric sans serifs are much cleaner and more modern looking than grotesques. You can see here with Futura, with its round O and its geometric letter forms, how clean and modern it looks. The letter forms are built from modular systems, and this leads to repetition and evenness in the forms but there's also a sense of no decoration to the letter form, so they have a very clean and modern feeling. That minimal feeling of the geometric sans serif is somewhat in contrast to the humanist sans, and a humanist sans really feels like it's bringing back some of the characteristics of the serif, and that the term humanist comes from showing signs of handwriting or a human being in the construction of the letter form. In this case, that quite often refers to either handwriting or pen strokes. So there's a reintroduction of the idea of thicks and thins in the letter forms, but also a little more character and a few more flourishes. And this often lends humanist forms to be a little less cold and a little warmer as a sans serif. The uncluttered and modular nature of sans serif letter forms often lends themselves to having a much more extended family than we've seen with the serif typefaces we were looking at. And this often expresses itself through weight and width. So if we look at an extended family, like Universe for instance, we can see that you as the typographer suddenly have even more choices to make. You've got a range in weight and a range in widths that go from ultra black 
at one end of the scale all the way through to light at the other end of the scale or from condensed to extended as well and this gives you a really wide range of typefaces even within this one family yet they're all universe so as a typographer you're getting more and more choices about the kind of typeface that you're going to use and this can be a little overwhelming but perhaps a better way to look at it is if all these different typefaces and different weights they're all just like toys and the more toys you have the more fun you can have with them when we read we read words but at the same time we're reading words we're also reading typographic form we're seeing letters and shapes and these things communicate something to us as a viewer so let's have a look at how that works there's mainly two different things that are being communicated there's on the one hand there's a level of pragmatic functionality with the typography can we read it and on the other hand there's an expressive connotative aspect to the typography what does it make us feel like controlling both of these aspects of typography is what makes a good typographer on the one hand you control the pragmatic side of the type which is really the nuts and bolts getting things to work properly if you like that's the technical side but on the other hand you also control the expressive emotional side the connotation the way that the type feels so good typographers can deal with both of these things let's break them down and let's start by looking at functionality or denotation let's work through an example so you can see how functionality and pragmatics affect type decisions and choices let's imagine for instance that we're going to design a piece of type for a museum we're not really going to try and think about what kind of museum it is we're really just going to try and think about the pragmatics of the typography so if we looked at a serif and a sans serif for instance that would give us connotation the serif might seem like a much more old-fashioned or traditional museum whereas the sans serif might, might feel much more like a contemporary museum and what we're really interested in is just the purely functional part of this so let's choose the sans serif because that's going to work at a lot of different sizes and be a little more neutral so let's make some typographic decisions based on functional considerations so if we were going to use this typeface the sans serif for instance we might want to start out by thinking about a typeface that has a wide family a good range to it for a lot of different uses so let's say we're going to use this typeface for everything in the museum from the museum's name to signage inside the museum to catalogues and publications to posters and banners pretty much everything the museum does that's going to be part of its typographic identity so we're probably going to need something with a wide range so having an extended family is going to be really useful so straight away that's going to limit our type choices or at least inform our type choices so here I'm looking at universe as my choice for the museum's typographic identity and the next thing I probably wanted to look at in a pragmatic way is what the type looks like at different sizes because we're going to use it at a lot of different sizes and we're also going to use it on screen and in print so let's look at that and see how it works let's see what the typeface looks like when it's very small and when it's very large is it going to work at every size is it going to have that kind of range and flexibility that I need those are pragmatic considerations once I've found some typefaces that have the range and functionality that I need I can start to really narrow down my type decision and look in much more much more detail at the kind of typefaces that I'm going to choose I can start to narrow them down and really really examine them much more closely so let's look at two typefaces that I might have chosen for this project so both of these typefaces might have the range and functionality that I need so how am I going to choose between the two of them I'm actually going to have to just look a little bit closer when you first look at them these two typefaces don't look that different but on close inspection there is quite a lot of difference let's look at that one of the first things you might notice is that these two typefaces even though they're the same size one appears to be a little larger than the other and that's because you can see here they're sitting on the same baseline but actually the X height is a little bit larger on this typeface than this typeface but also the cap height is a little bit larger as well the typeface on the right also seems to look a little bit heavier a little bit darker and the letter forms look a little bit more condensed or narrower as well let's look at why the reason for that might be if we look really closely at the construction of the letter forms 
we can see that the typeface on the left actually has way more thicks and thins. So you can see the parts of the letter form here are getting a lot thinner. There's a lot more differentiation in the line. The stroke in this typeface is much more even. And one thing that you can see a lot of difference in is actually the letter S here. If you look at the shape that the letter S makes, this feels very, very different. So it's really useful when you're trying to analyze a typeface like this to look very, very closely and see what the differences are between the two typefaces. One thing that can help you see those differences is to take some of the letter forms, blow them up really large, and lay them one on top of the other. So now the typeface on the left has the black outline, and the typeface on the right has the red outline. Where the two areas overlap is this darker gray, and where the areas are different, you can see the lighter gray. So you can see that some characters, they're actually quite similar. This E, very, very similar. You can see a little difference in weight, but they're really the end of the stroke here is where the big difference is. And then other letters like the M, you can see, they have a lot of difference. The thickness and the evenness of the stroke is different. The width of the letter form is different. And even with this S, you can see the stress we were talking about, how it's very different in here. And also the terminals are very different as well. Now these differences might seem very, very small, but the reason why we're looking at them is because when we actually set the type and look at type and read it in these typefaces, the difference is actually going to be quite large. So let's take a look at what these two typefaces actually look like when they're set. So here you can see how even those tiny differences, they make a big difference when you're actually looking at the type. So one might appear to be, one typeface here appears to be much larger than the other. This typeface appears to have more leading than this typeface. All of these things are coming out and being visible just based on those tiny characteristics of the typeface because these two pieces of type are set with the same type size and the same leading. So one of the reasons I'm making you look at all these things in great detail is to try and get you to really be analytical about typography, to really like see all the differences and really understand how to control and use them. If denotative typography deals with the functional, pragmatic, analytical skills of typography, the technical skills if you like, then connotation really deals with the expressive, the emotive side of typography. And a lot of that comes out in how we read typographic form, how that makes us feel. We read in two different ways. We read what the word says, but we also read the shapes of the letter forms. We read the form of the letter forms. As an example, let's set the same word in two different typefaces. Here you can see the word fast in Cooper Black on the left and in Universe on the right. And the two look very different. One of them certainly looks much faster than the other. The typographic form of the Cooper, for instance, is heavy and blobby and has a lot of weight to it. It's very static, so it's antithetical to what it says. It actually it seems like it's the opposite of fast. Whereas the universe on the right feels sleek and light, it's got a lot of movement to it as well. So it feels like it's reiterating what the word actually says. It feels fast. If we delete the letter S, then suddenly we read the typographic form in a whole different context because the word says something different. Suddenly the Cooper Black looks very, very appropriate. Its heaviness, its blobbiness, its weightiness, those all feel appropriate for what the word says, whereas the universe on the right suddenly feels the one that's antithetical to what the word says. So controlling this kind of connotation and thinking about the relationship between what words say and what their typographic form is, is really, really important for designers because it's a way that they can create messages and control those messages for an audience. So let's look at how typographic connotation can work in a little bit more of a subtle way. Imagine that we're trying to design some typography for a painter who's having an exhibition. His name's John Painterman. Here we can see his name in Baskerville, and he feels like a fairly traditional kind of painter, a kind of a classical painter. All the information that we're getting about John, apart from his name, is coming from the typographic form. We could make John feel even more like a painter by maybe setting his name in a brushstroke typeface. By setting his name in this kind of typeface, we get an idea that perhaps John is a traditional painter that paints with a brush. But if we read this form 
it also feels like maybe it's a little bit too old-fashioned or maybe John's a calligrapher instead of a painter. Maybe we could think of a typeface that's a little bit more classy, a little more upmarket. Maybe John paints landscapes and maybe we want to make some reference to that in the typographic form of his name. Although now he feels like he's probably a gardener rather than a painter. Or maybe John is a more modern painter. Maybe he'd like to be represented by a typeface that's much more cleaner, much more neutral and contemporary. Maybe his paintings are a little bit more lighter, a little more airy. Maybe a lighter typeface would be a better way to represent John and his paintings. Or perhaps John is more of an abstract painter and he uses a lot of geometry in his work and somehow these typographic forms would be better for him. All of these pieces of typography say the same thing, John Painterman, but they all look very different. They all give us different kinds of additional information. The connotation of the typographic form is the thing that's different. They tell us something about John's character or maybe something about what kind of painter he is, but either way we read both the words and we read the form of the words as well. And as a designer, the more that you can be in control of those words and the form of those words, the better communication you can have and the more you can control that communication. Typographic connotation relies on the fact that we read words, but we also read form. So we've seen how connotation works with typographic form, but let's look at some other typographic moves we can make that also affect connotation. Here on the screen is what we've already seen. Here's the word architecture, and we would read this in three different ways or think about three different kinds of architecture purely due to the typeface choice. In the first one, we might look at it and think about a more classical, balanced, even architecture. The second one, we might look at it and think about a certain time period where the typeface was used a lot, like the 1970s, and think about it as being heavy and blobby kind of architecture. And here in the bottom one, we might think about it as being modular, structural. And if we knew about typefaces, we might even know that this was from a certain time period in a certain place, and that might inform our reading of the form as well. So let's take away the heavily connotative typefaces, and let's replace them with some much more neutral kind of typefaces. So here we've got a set of quite plain sans serifs. I've made them look different just for the sake of this exercise, but we suddenly know a lot less about the architecture. Maybe we can tell a little bit about the weight, about how condensed it is, and maybe whether it's uppercase or lowercase, in this case that the all caps might make us think of a certain kind of maybe stronger architecture than just the lowercase would. But in all in all, we've actually removed information by removing the typographic form. On the other hand, you could argue that what we've gained by removing the typographic form is to remove the vernacular and to have a clean, modern, easier to read kind of typography. So if the typeface itself isn't going to do the work of communicating specificity, then maybe something else has to do it. We have plenty of other tools as designers. We don't just need to make all our voice heard through the typeface. We can use scale and composition, and these things can have an effect to how we read the typography in a similar way to how we'd use the typeface before. For instance here just changing the uppercase T's and leaving the rest of the word lowercase might suggest an idea of shelter in, within the architecture. Here a simple shift in scale might actually introduce the idea of building in the architecture. And the same with stacking the letter forms here might suggest a certain kind of architecture or a certain kind of solidity to the architecture. As a designer, you have to be careful how you use connotation. Sometimes you can use it so that it says the wrong thing and actually starts to mean something you don't want it to. Here, for instance, we can look where just changing the letter spacing to tighten up the letter forms here might create a kind of architecture that feels uneven and crashing and uncomfortable and maybe doesn't feel safe. Here, it might even look as if the architecture is falling over and we might not want to have that as part of our design. Let's do what we did at the start of this demonstration. Keep the same typefaces and change the words. That lets us really see how the typographic communication is working because the context we read it in has changed. So instead of architecture, let's look at tank tops, cupcakes and power tools. Our tank top looks pretty classy. 
Our cupcake, hmm, that looks pretty fluffy and delicious. And our power tools, well, they look pretty solid and functional. If we remove some of the typographic connotation, then our tank top, well, it still looks pretty good. It looks modern and clean and functional. Our cupcakes, we maybe have a little less idea about how they're going to taste. And our power tools, well, they still feel pretty solid in that typeface and that block. The same typographic moves that seem to work for architecture don't seem to work so well for these subjects. Our tank tops, they look pretty much the same. Our cupcakes, I'm not really sure what they're doing or why they're growing like that. But our power tools, well, they still feel pretty solid. If we continue with the last round of typographic moves, while well, our tank tops, now they feel like they might not fit too well. Maybe we're not so interested in those. Our cupcakes, well, now they feel a little bit like they look like the top of a cupcake. So that feels like it's a move that might actually work for this kind of content, this word. And our power tools, well, they still feel pretty solid and pretty useful. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is how much power typography has in relationship to words. It can really change the meaning of the words, the context of them, the connotation of them. And that's something that designers can really use as an asset. If you can control that typographic communication, you can really control the message that you want to give to your audience. We've looked at some of the terminology used with typography, and we've looked at how to choose a typeface, and a little bit about how typographic form communicates. So now we're going to try and put all of that knowledge together and try and build a piece of design using just typography. I'm going to walk you through the process of how to design a typographic monogram for yourself, and then how to use that as part of the design of a business card. This will give you some kind of context for the typography It'll give you a chance to take all the knowledge that you have and apply it to a piece of design. I'm also hoping that by showing you and going through this with you, it'll give you an idea of process and methodology of how to use type as well. So let's take a look at our format. We're going to work with a standard American sized business card, which is three and a half inches by two inches. And that can be horizontal or vertical. So first of all, let's make a list of contents so we know what's actually going to be on our business card. We're going to have our name, email, phone, and a monogram that we're going to make. So let's start out by working on the monogram. And what that is, is it's a design that's going to be based out of your initials from your first and last name. So I'm going to use an M and a W because those are the initials of my first and last name. So the first thing that I might do is start to look at a variety of different typefaces and look at those specific letters in a range of typefaces, partly because it'll help me see a lot of different shapes, a lot of different M's, and a lot of different W's. So when I start doing this, I really have no idea how I'm going to use the M's and the W's. I don't know how they're going to fit together into a monogram. But what I do know is that I maybe want to have some interesting forms. So I'm starting to look and see what the range of forms are. So you can see that here we've got a straight M, a flared M, we've got an italic M with a loop in the middle. Um, there's a nice foot to this italic M. I'm looking at serifs, I'm looking at sans serifs. So I'm getting an idea of the kind of range of letters that might be interesting for me to work with. And in terms of process, this is something that you can look at quite quickly. You can really just set a lot of different letter forms and just look at them and analyze them. And it's a way of forcing yourself to really look at the different shapes and give yourself a range of starting points. So here's a bunch more M's and W's. You can see some are made out of solid shapes using negative and positive. Um, again, there's a nice cross in the middle of, of the W here. There's rounded forms, again, straight forms, flared forms, um, more traditional serifs down here. But they're all different, and I have no idea what I'm going to do yet. I'm just really seeing, well, what's out there? What are all the different letters that have possibilities? And they're, they're all readable as M's and W's. Every letter has a variety of ways that it can be written and, and still be recognizable. So I could keep going and look at even more. Here are some letter forms that we've seen um, in some of the earlier lessons. So I'd, look at, I'd really go for a range here of things that are traditional, from different time periods, things that are perhaps a little more quirky and a little more unusual but sometimes you can take a very a very normal letter form and when you look at it up close you can start to see that there are some strange and interesting things happening in the form 
and you can choose which typefaces you're going to set your letters in for any number of reasons. They can really be just personal preference, things that you like, it can be absolutely subjective, things that you think have interesting forms, and they might not even, they might, none of them might work out, but what's important in this as well is you're getting to know a range of typefaces and you're getting to really look closely at a, a range of letters. So in a way you're educating yourself about typography and about typeface choice by going through an exercise like this. You're forcing yourself to really get to know your own library of type. So now I've got all these different kinds of letter form to work with. I'm going to spend some time to play around with them and just experiment and see what comes out of combining the M's and the W's together with each typeface in a, in a variety of ways. And then we'll look at some of those results. I'm going to start by going back to the first typeface that I set the M and the W in, which is Universe Bold. And these are fairly regular sans serif forms and I'm just going to play around with how the two letters fit together, see what kind of ideas I might come up with. So straight away one of the things I notice is that the M is straight and the W is flared or angled. And I also am fortunate that my name has uh, an M and a W which are almost symmetrical letter forms. So to begin with I start to wonder well, what would happen if I turned the, uh, the M into a W for instance and if I turn the W into an M. And just by a simple move like that, it means that I've suddenly got two letter forms that might interlock in a, in a more easy way. So you can see the, the M and the W form a fairly um, harmonious pattern together. And the same with the straight M and the W. And even little accidents like that, when you're moving things around, you can see negative and positive space. You might start to think about how things might line up um, and what the relationship between the two letter forms might be. So let's just take this one and put it in another spot. So just starting to think about how the letter forms link together and what their relationship is, how they might overlap, sit side by side, I'm just starting to play around with um, with what those letter forms are and how they sit together. And don't worry about legibility or trying to get any meaning into the letter forms and their arrangement. For now, just experiment and have fun. Move things around. Really look at the forms. It's kind of just a way of, of really playing it's, and discovering, really, by moving form around. So rather than have you watch me shuffling around an M and a W, I'm going to go away, make some M's and W's with the typefaces that I chose, and then we'll look at them really quickly just to give you an idea of, again, process, which is in this case just one of iterations and generation, trying to make a, a lot of work and a lot of possibilities, knowing, knowing that they won't all be good, but at least we'll have something to look at and react to. So here's some M's and W's working together, and I'm going to go through them quickly and just point out some of the strategies that are used for making these two letter forms work together. So here you can see we've flipped the W to make an M so now we've got this nice repetitious harmony in the angle of the strokes and the evenness in negative and positive space. That feels quite interesting. Um, here you can see if we just add a little tiny bit of space in between the two letter forms it actually makes it a whole lot legible as an M and a W. Here we're just playing around with scale, taking one of the letter forms, making it smaller, seeing how it might fit into the the uh, counter space of the other letter form. Here trying to do the same thing but have them interact and overlap a little bit more. Down here you can see a similar idea to the strokes of the M and the W here in the rhythm and repetition but with totally different and more solid letter forms. It starts to be a little, little harder to read. Um, and here you can see trying to line up the serifs as a way, as a strategy for making the letters work together. And in this case um, rather than trying to make the two letter forms be harmonious in terms of being straight or flared, here I'm trying to make the two work together and accentuate the difference between the two. My strategy for making these monograms would be to generate as many as possible as quickly as possible just so I can try and see what the range of ideas are that are out there. So here's a, here's a bunch more that we'll look at very quickly. So you can see here different letter forms start to make different shapes. This one, the negative space becomes interesting, almost looks like an intestine. <laughs> Here you can see again the flipped letter forms, 
but with a totally different kind of letter with a modern serif. Um, it has a very, very different feeling. Here, it, here you can see what happens when we use the, um, here it's the straight capitals, here it's the angled capitals. It starts to feel very different. I kind of like this um, very blobby Cooper Black typeface. Even though it isn't, I'm not sure what it's really doing, just, just the forms and again the negative and positive space seem to be very interesting. So let's keep going and look at some more. Here you can see a more traditional italic typeface and how those might connect together. Um, a much less, much less conventional but still really interesting typeface. Some very simple forms and really looking at the how the two letters might align and start to make a new form. You see this very strange X appearing here. Um, trapping the negative space to try and make that have some kind of energy or become something else. And generally just really playing around with a lot of different things and just trying to generate ideas and sometimes they really don't work and that's fine. It's really just about just about volume and having fun. So now we have a group of monograms that we can work with. Let's put them into the context or the form of the business card and add the other typographic elements that we have and start to see how the two are going to interact. So here we are back at our business card waiting to have the information added to it. So let's put in our name, email address, phone number. I'm going to use a fake phone number for this. And first of all, I'd set it in a fairly regular typeface, just so I can have an idea what kind of shape the type makes, ascenders, descenders, just looking at the kind of texture and the, the kind of color of the typography. So I might try setting it in a number of different typefaces, first of all. And because this is the readable, legible, part of the typography, I'd probably want to keep this fairly simple to begin with. So the first thing to think about here is just typeface choice for the information that's going on your card. And you can break it down to the decisions that we've already looked at. So you could start out with looking whether you want a serif or a sans serif, whether it should be heavy or light, um, whether it's you know all caps or upper and lower case. But generally just find something that you like the look and feel of. And you can always try a couple of different typefaces. So let's try some of these out and put them in the context of the business card so we can get an idea what they're really going to look like. So first of all, let's look at our alignment. We can have the type centered, we can have it ranged right, or we can have it ranged left. And then you can think about what position it occupies in the card. So depending whereabouts you put it, is it in the corner? Is it up at the top? It can feel very different. Here where it's centered with a lot of space around it, it feels very even and balanced. And this has a little more tension here between the, neg the negative space up here and the positive element. You can think about the scale of your typography within the card. Should it be very, very small? Should it be really large and dominant? And you can play around with it, see which typefaces work at which different scales. And you can also look at the angle of your typography. We're used to seeing type being um, horizontal, but it can also run vertically, it can run at an angle, or your card itself might be a vertical or a horizontal card. If you now introduce your monogram into the design, you also have the same choices for the monogram. You can think about its position, its scale, and its angle. But one of the more complex things you're going to have to think about is how the elements interact together how is your monogram going to interact with your other pieces of typography? We'll look at composition in more detail in another lesson, but let's take a very brief look at it just for the sake of making these cards. You could think about having a very active composition, one where there's a lot of contrast in scales and where perhaps the type is divided up into separate elements that also have different scale. And you can have a great deal of contrast between the size of the largest element and the size of the smallest element. You could also think really carefully about how your type interacts with the logo type. Here you can see it's breaking the negative space of the monogram. Here, here it's overlapping and here it's sitting quite respectfully around it. Or for a business card you might want to have more of a static composition but still have some scale weight and some contrast between your monogram and the typography underneath. So here you can see they're all centered. There's a lot of even white space around them. And you can clearly, there's a clear hierarchy between 
the monogram and the secondary typography. Or if you wanted to go in a less conventional direction, you could think about having a much more extreme scale contrast. So here you can see the monogram has actually been blown up to the full size of the card and the secondary typography is interacting with it and mimicking the lines that the, the, the letter forms are creating. Perhaps the most important thing to think about and to remember is just to experiment and to enjoy yourself. Pushing type around and playing with it, getting to really know it, that's the best way to learn typography. This week we're going to look at shape and color in graphic design. We've already looked at images and how they work, and now we're going to look at objects and color, but not as tools to make images of things, but more in terms of abstract graphic form. To start, we'll be looking at how abstract shapes communicate through their form, and how they can be used to create marks, icons, and symbols. Not surprisingly, graphic shapes are all around us, most noticeably as logos and icons, but also as major or secondary elements in almost every piece of on-screen or printed design. Quite simply, shapes are everywhere. Whether they're active or passive, communicative or neutral, they form an invisible backbone to most of graphic design. This might seem like a very basic area to investigate, but once again, it's a core skill in learning how to design. Working with basic shapes and color is at the heart of identity and logo design, and it's surprising how frequently you're going to return to these fundamental skills. We'll start by just looking at black and white objects, simple shapes that can help with contrast, add visual interest, or they can be a unifying element as part of a larger system. And we'll be examining both simple and complex forms, and we'll be seeing how negative and positive space works, how figure ground relationships are created. Then we'll look at the basic principles and attributes of color, and examine how a designer can control and direct the color and the mood of their work. Finally, we'll examine repetition, rhythm, and pattern, where you can apply your knowledge about shape and color. In this segment, we're going to look at graphic shapes, how designers use shapes and form. And simple shapes, shapes can be used by designers to help with contrast, to add visual interest. They can be an element that sits alongside typography or imagery and they can really be a unifying element that works together in a larger system. So we're going to start out by really looking at these three basic shapes and these three shapes typify the kind of directional qualities that other shapes might have. So you can see the the circle is represented is the shape is circular, the triangle the direction of it is more diagonal and the square the direction of it is horizontal and vertical. And you can see those directional qualities even more if we convert the shapes to lines. And basically that's that's what makes a shape a shape. It's it's a, a space that's described by a closed path. So here you can see when we make the path open, you can see that the circle is actually just a line that would be completed. The triangle is made out of three strokes, the square is made out of four strokes. But as soon as we close those paths and perhaps add a, a color to the volume of the shape, we really stop seeing line and we really just see shape and form. And even though we're dealing with abstract form here, we always try and read something into that form. We try and make things that we recognize even out of abstract forms. So here you can see just by changing the baseline of those objects we might start to see this as a face. If we change the, uh, the shape of the forms then we really begin to see it as a face. So you can see how we're desperately trying to read these abstract forms as things that we recognize in the real world. And for part of this exercise we're really going to try and just keep them as abstract forms and not try and make pictures out of them but just quickly to illustrate our desperation to try and read into these images you can see what small moves how small moves can make a lot of difference so here's a happy face, a sad face, you move the shape up it perhaps becomes a moustache, you put some circles in there and suddenly it's a pig um, or a bird so you can see how just changing back to a face again you can see how just changing some basic shapes 
you know, there's a lot of power in shapes, whether they're used to represent something that's abstract, whether it's something in the real world, or in this case, whether it's a learned symbol. Um, there's a lot of power in, sh in shapes, and designers use shapes in a lot of different ways. Some of the ideas that we're going to look at concerning shape and form and color are based on the principles from Johannes Itten, who was a teacher at the Bauhaus in the early 1920s. And he developed a basic course or a foundation there that looked at shape and form and color and composition in a way that hadn't really been done before. It was a very modern way of looking at these ideas. And he did it in a way that the, these basic principles applied to fine art and to industrial design to graphic design, to a lot of different practices. And these ideas from the Bauhaus about shape, form, color, and composition, even though they're nearly a hundred years old now, they're still really the foundation of contemporary design practice and contemporary design thinking. The basis for the Bauhaus Foundation was really to understand and to control visual contrast. Now, this can mean a lot of different things, and visual contrast can work in many different ways. So we're going to try and break this apart, first of all, and examine the different kinds of visual contrast that can work with shapes. So the simplest visual contrast might just be the shape itself. So you could have a simple form, such as this circle, made out of a single line. Or you could have a much more complex form, where it's non-geometric and made up of a much more non-symmetrical shape. You could think about a contrast in scale between an object being large or an object being small. Another primary contrast would be how the object feels in space, whether it's essentially a horizontal object or a vertical object. So here you can see two rectangles, one feeling very low and horizontal, and the other high and vertical. Similarly, you could also look at a much flatter shape and think about it being narrow or broad or wide. It's the same height, it's just actually wider. Now these might seem like very, very basic ideas or very basic contrasts between shapes, but I think sometimes they're things that we take for granted, so much so that sometimes we just forget about them and don't even think about them or experiment with them. So now if we take those flat two-dimensional shapes and try and look at them or think about them as three-dimensional forms, we have another contrast to think about. We have their depth to think about. So here you can see one form very shallow, very little depth, the other form with much more depth. So there's another contrast to think about. As well as the physical or mathematical attributes to shapes that can form contrasts, there are also aspects to shapes that affect things like composition and how the viewer really sees the shape. So for instance here, the long skinny rectangle placed at a diagonal creates a sense of direction in the viewer's eye. You tend to follow through that shape so you get a very strong diagonal movement when you look at it, versus a square where it perhaps is much more static, it's sitting on a solid horizon or baseline and because it's a geometric concentric shape it visually pulls you into the center of the square so just in terms of how you visually view these two objects you could describe one as being dynamic or moving and the other as being static and this is going to be very important later on when we look at composition and there can also be contrasts between the same shape. So here we have two squares, but they appear totally different, one being dark and one being lighter. So just the, the color or the tonality of the square can have an effect, can create a visual contrast. So we could also look at the shape itself, one shape being very crisp and the square being um, very vector-based and feeling very computery and the other feeling much more, say, pixel-based and softer. So even though it's the same shape, one becomes hard, one becomes soft. So another visual contrast that you could think about is to think about the relationship between things being light and things being heavy. And here we can see the, 
this is partly shown in the in the shapes themselves that the circle feels a little bit lighter but also because the square is filled in with a black color it feels much heavier also because it's on the bottom of this composition it feels heavier and the circle because it's got a fuzzy outline it's containing a a white shape it definitely feels like it's um a little bit lighter than the square and i feel like i cheated a little bit here by putting the type on the light one at the top and the heavy one at the bottom to accentuate the uh, the weight and the direction of each. But basically these shapes, part of what's making them feel different is the difference between being a shape that's described by a line and a shape that's described by, by volume. And the volume obviously when it's a contrasting color it's going to feel much much heavier, much more solid basically than an object that's being described by a line. In this video we're going to look at the difference between marks, icons and symbols. And we've really been looking at marks so far. We've been looking at graphic shapes. So these are the kind of shapes that are quite familiar from the last video where we've looked at um, circle, square, triangle, we've looked at solid forms, we've looked at linear forms. And these are the kind of marks that graphic designers use a lot as elements in their compositions and with their graphic form. And these can be geometric and straight, they can be much more abstract and loose and or organic even, but they're still graphic marks. And basically graphic marks are devoid of meaning, so they don't really hold any connotation, so all they hold is denotation. So they become the equivalent of, of denotative graphic form, if you like. So in other words, circle, square, triangle equals exactly circle, square, triangle. So when the viewer tries to read these forms, all they can read into them is just what the form is itself. Icons and symbols work in a slightly different way. Both icons and symbols represent other things. So an icon you can see here is generally a pictorial representation of something whereas a symbol often represents uh, something more abstract, an idea or a construct. So here they, you can see that they both have simplified form and that's what they have in common and that's why people sometimes get confused between the two. But basically an icon is pictorial, it represents actual things, it's easy to read whereas a symbol, non-pictorial, represents ideas or products and it has to be learned. In other words, it's, it's coded. You can't look at it and figure it out. You actually have to be told what it means, what it represents in order to figure it out. So while both icons and symbols can be built from the kind of simplified graphic forms that we've been looking at, symbols are perhaps the most interesting to look at because they can have a pure abstract form because they're non-pictorial. They just represent an idea and the representation of that idea can take an abstract form. So for instance if we look at these four symbols and think about how they might be read, what their associated meaning might be, certainly within a US culture, they would read quite differently. They'd have quite different concepts attached to them even though they're actually quite similar forms. So if we read from left to right they would read as being about Christianity, the Red Cross perhaps representing a hospital, the Green Cross a pharmacy, and the Black X representing something being wrong. What this demonstrates is that even with very very simple forms and very rudimentary tools the designer has an incredible control over the meaning of something, over the meaning of an image or a mark. So graphic elements can be really, really powerful, even in their simplest forms. In this video, we're going to take a quick look at what happens when we take our shapes and we put them into an environment. The shapes then have a relationship with that environment, and we call this a figure-ground relationship. And what this really means is an object and background relationship. So if we look here we can see our three familiar shapes of the square, triangle and circle. And the figure here are the shapes themselves, the square, the triangle and the circle. 
and the ground, the background, is a white field. Let's see what happens if we invert that relationship and we make the figures be white and the ground be black. You can see that it has a very different feeling. Because we're looking at this on a computer screen and white light is shining through the screen, suddenly these shapes on the black background, they seem much more vibrant and bright and optically even perhaps seem a little larger. These relationships start to become even more interesting as they get to be more complex. If we add some other black shapes here on top of the white shapes, what they appear to be now are holes in the other shapes and sometimes these are going to push to the foreground and sometimes they're going to recede to the background. In this case the black shapes generally feel as if they are still the background. They are holes that have been cut out of the other shapes. But what starts to happen is that that figure ground relationship has become a little bit more complicated. An idea of depth is introduced. And instead of the character, the object, standing flatly against the background, suddenly there's a little bit more push and pull and we're uncertain which of these objects is closest to us and which is furthest away. And we can make the issue more complicated by using scale. Objects that are larger are generally closer to us in our field of vision and objects that are further away are generally smaller. So even though these elements might be flat because they're graphic forms, they all have the same qualities, we're actually starting to look at them and think about perspective. We look at the large circle, we perceive the large circle as being closer to us, whereas the smaller circle we perceive it as being further away. But we don't actually know that. All of these objects could just be different in scale and all sitting on the same plane. So what I'm doing here as the designer is creating the illusion of depth through the use of figure gram relationships and through scale. How the viewer perceives depth in this simple figure gram relationship can also be affected by some other elements. Here we can see our three simple objects of square, triangle and circle but with different tonal values which means that they have a different amount of contrast to the background the black square having the most contrast and because of that it appears to be the closest to us whereas the other elements seem to be receding into the background because they're closer to that background tonally and one of the reasons that the viewer perceives this kind of depth, these foreground background relationships is really because of how we see in the real world things that are up closer to us tend to be sharper, cleaner, with more denser colors where things that are further away they tend to be slightly lighter and fuzzier. And if we were to arrange these elements so that they were overlapping then we'd get an even greater idea of depth. So the ability to create depth, to create some kind of push and pull between the figure and the ground, this really relies a lot on tonality. It relies a lot on contrast. So depending what the background is and depending what color the object is or what tone the object is, that can really have a lot of effect on the amount of depth, the amount of contrast that we perceive as the viewer. So if we look at these examples on screen here, we can see that with the white background, Clearly, the black shape, the black solid shape, has the most contrast and stands out the most. Whereas as soon as we move to the black background, obviously then the white shape has the most contrast and stands out the most. What's interesting is to look at a 50%, a halfway tint of black as the background and to think about how that might then affect our reading of black and our reading of white as objects on that ground. And again, because we're looking at this on a computer screen, the white is going to come through shining a little bit more brighter and a little bit more powerful. So this tends to have the most contrast, even though in terms of pure percentage value, the two are exactly the same distance from the background tone. And it's quite interesting to look at how those tonal figure ground relationships interact with each other. So if we here, if we look at these four dots ranging from white to black with a 33 and a 
tint in between. If we look at what happens particularly to the dark grey circle when we change the background you can see that your perception of that grey circle is going to change. Here it seems much lighter because it has less contrast and here it seems much darker because it has more contrast with the background. Similarly if we look at the same circles but then put them on a black background that dark grey circle is going to appear to be darker against the white background with more contrast and lighter against the black background with less contrast. As we looked at previously, scale can affect our perception of depth in a figure-gram relationship, but so can tonality as well. And here we can see what happens when we start to put the two of them together. Now suddenly the darkest dot or circle really does appear to be receding, to be much closer to the black background than the large white dot which really feels like it's in the foreground. If we then overlap those circles to further increase this idea of depth, we begin to start to really feel like there's a three-dimensional space in front of us. And we're really tricking ourselves here because deep down we know that this is just a flat graphic form. It's really an illusion of depth that we're creating. And it's interesting to see what happens when we do something as simple as switch the order of the tonality in these shapes. So in, for instance here it really feels like the white shape is coming out towards us where by switching them it really feels like the white shape is in the distance, it's our focal point and it almost feels as if it's a hole through the black plane that we're looking at. So it really positions the viewer in a totally different way. So just that simple shift can have a big difference in how we feel about the figure gram relationship. And if we then take that overlap and invert that and deliberately kind of destroy the illusion of depth that we've created, it suddenly becomes a much more confusing image. We're not quite sure what is coming towards us and what is receding and further away. So you can see how these simple moves can be used to both kind of reinforce these dimensional figure ground relationships, the push and pull of objects, but they can also, if they go wrong, actually kind of confuse things and really not help you in your design. Here's an optical illusion that illustrates how our eyes trick us when we're trying to perceive tone. We really do perceive it contextually, one thing against another. If you look over at the letter A and then look over at the letter B, it appears that that grey strip is a different colour. It appears to be darker over by letter A than it is over by letter B. But in fact, it's exactly the same all the way through. In this video, we're going to look at colour and how designers use colour. And this is a really tricky area to investigate, partly because colour can be both objective and subjective. We tend to read colour and use colour in many different ways for many different things. Our primary response to colour is an emotional response. And I think this comes from our reaction to nature. When we see blues and greens, they might make us think of the sky, the ocean, or even grass, but somehow those are f relatively calming. Whereas if we see red, for instance, that might make us think of blood and danger, for instance. And these kind of colors have been also saturated into our culture. So for instance, a stop sign is in red to gain our attention to play on that emotional response. But on top of that emotional response is a subjective response. And this is really the way that each individual thinks about color. Everybody has colors they like and don't like, certain hues that are their favorites and others that are their least favorites. And this is a subjective response to color. And ultimately, this response doesn't matter. It's the least important way you can respond to color. There's also a more scientific response. And this might be thought of much more as a strategic way to use color as a designer. Really looking at which colors go with which other ones, maybe less about mood and more about specific contrasts and values. Perhaps it would be better to call it a technical response to color. And as soon as we bring any kind of form into the color that might represent something in the real world, even something as simple here as a horizon line, 
we start to connect how we read color and how we think of color to that real world. So for instance here just the horizon line might make us connect the read of this to being green grass and a blue sky. So where does color come from and how can we start thinking about color when there are so many colors to think about? Well one easy way, one starting point might be to look at white light and when that shines through a prism it divides up into the color spectrum and we're all fairly familiar with this color spectrum as being the colors of the rainbow red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. In the spectrum these colors blend together and blur one into the other so even though we think of them as being seven colors there are actually a lot more than that. Scientifically the color is broken up due to difference in the wavelength of the color so red has the longest wavelength at one end of the spectrum and violet the shortest wavelength at the other end of the spectrum. And when we think about color we're mostly thinking about hue. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue. These are actually hues but color has two other important values to it. Hue is probably the most powerful and the most visible attribute of color. The second attribute of color is light to dark. In other words, its value. Now we can think of this as grayscale, like we're looking at here, and that's very easy to see. At one end of the scale is 100% of the color, black, and at the other end is 0% white. But value obviously works with any single color. So here we can see a range of values of red, for instance, ranging from 100% of the red, the darkest color, to white over here with 0% of the red, the lightest color. And you can obviously take any color and look at it as a range of different values. Take any hue and look at it with the values of 100% to 0%. Saturation is the third attribute of color and perhaps the hardest to grasp. The way that I find it the most easy to think about is that if the value and the hue were to stay exactly the same and you were to just say change the saturation you would see that color go from a very dull color for instance over here where it's pretty much a gray with no color in there at all all the way up to a much more saturated pure color over here and if you really want to see the effects of altering levels of hue and saturation and value um, a good idea is maybe just to open up a file in a program like Photoshop where the settings, the colors can be changed to HSL or HSV values and you can just pull the sliders around and really see what happens as you change each of those attributes of color. So far we've looked at the color spectrum but now we're going to look at the color wheel. If you imagine that you took the color spectrum which is basically going from left to right in a strip if you took that and bent it around into a circle so that your red, the start of the color spectrum, matched up all the way around through the color spectrum, matched up at the end to the violet, the far end of the color spectrum, you'd have this as a color wheel instead of a single linear spectrum. In the color wheel, colors that sit next to each other are called analogous colors. And these are basically colors that, if they were in the true spectrum, they'd be gradations from one pure color to another color. But here we're dividing them up into more solids, just to limit the amount of information that we're looking at. And these analogous colors would be very similar to the colors that they're sitting next to. And none of this is very different from looking at the color spectrum as a strip. And what makes the color wheel more interesting is when you start to divide it up and rotate parts of the color wheel. So if you imagine you were to cut a, a central circular strip from the color wheel and then you were to rotate that 180 degrees, you'd get something like this. So what we've done here is taken a segment of each piece of the color wheel and paired it up with the, its exact opposite. So if you look here, we've taken a segment of the red, rotated it 180 degrees, and now it's paired with the green down here, whereas the green has moved up 180 degrees and is paired here. And these pairings of opposite colors, it's quite confusing, but they're actually called complementary colors. And what that means is that 
these two colors combined effectively would almost cancel each other out. If you think about the colors being black and white, they would form together to make a, a neutral 50% gray, for instance. But these complementary colors, they can be really useful as a starting point for thinking about color palettes. And even a simple color wheel like this one that I just made quite quickly can be really useful in terms of just pairing up colors and being able to quite quickly look at how sets of colors would work together, which colors might go well with other ones which might be contrasting complementary. And even by just changing this, you can see here keeping the the cools with the cooler colors, the warms with the warmer colors versus what we were talking about earlier which is having something like um, like this which is much more contrasting pairs of colors. Another thing that I like to do with color wheels is to just set them up so that they work as a series of tints with the same color and again part of what's useful about this is just being able to mix and match different tints to kind of you know rotate them in this case and to see which colors match up with which other ones where things might start to be interesting and start to help you begin to think about color palettes that you might be able to use or to pair two or three different colors together thinking about how they might work not just in terms of hue as we saw in the earlier um, color wheel but also now in terms of value as well and obviously there's plenty of programs on the computer that have color tools where you can really control and manipulate the color wheels and look at various different palettes and the creation of those palettes and also import pre-existing palettes or palettes that have been made by other people for certain moods or for certain uses but for me there's something still quite nice about really just playing with these really basic aspects of value and of hue and just looking at the difference of difference between them and building your own palettes rather than just kind of accepting what already exists. And if you have time, something that is also quite interesting to do is to make this color wheel by hand, not to make it on the computer as I did, but actually to paint it as a physical cardboard wheel. And you learn a lot about pigment and about paint just by purely mixing the paint and applying the paint and it forces you to really look at color quite closely and by looking at it closely that's how you learn about it. As a graphic designer you have to think about color in different contexts and this can actually have quite a big effect on that color and those contexts are mostly to do with looking at things, looking at graphic design on screen or off screen when you're looking at something on screen the light is shining through a monitor and that's very different from looking at something that's printed for instance where what you're actually seeing is the light bouncing back off the paper through the ink so there are two very very different color systems that are associated with this when we look at something on screen we're really looking at color made up of red green and blue or RGB and this is common to pretty much all devices, whether it's phone, television, computer screen. So if we make a Venn diagram of how red, green and blue colors interact with each other, you can see that what happens is when you combine all three, you actually get white, which is very different from how pigments work. You can also see how, for instance, if you mix red and green, you'd get yellow. Again, very different from how pigments work. And this is because RGB is basically additive color. Uh, what this means is you're basically starting out from black and you're adding light colors and when you've added 100% of everything you would end up with white. And if you think about it this makes sense because you're really working with an on-screen medium so you're kind of painting with light if you like. So you're starting out from black and everything that you add has to be made out of light in order to be seen. If we now look at painted color or pigment, one of the first things that you'll notice is the difference between painted color and RGB on screen color is that one of our primary colors is different. So instead of green, we've now got yellow as one of our primary colors. And if we look at a Venn diagram of how these three colors interact, you can see that they interact in a very, very different way when you mix all of these three colors together you get black instead of white. 
So here we have our primary colors of red, blue, and yellow. And you can see that where each single primary color overlaps with one other single primary color, it makes a secondary color. So red and yellow overlap to make orange, red and blue overlapping to make purple, blue and yellow overlapping to make green. And these kind of concepts of making secondary colors out of primaries are very familiar to most of us just from being a child and mixing paint together and seeing what the effects of different pigments mixed together are. Printed color, also known as four color process, works in a slightly different way than the two other systems that we've looked at, RGB and painted color. To begin with, we're working with four inks, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, which is also known as CMYK. CMYK is predominantly used as the way of mixing inks on a four color offset press. So if you were doing a job as a designer and the work was actually being printed instead of being shown on the screen, for instance, you'd need to know how to deal with CMYK and how to get something printed that's going to really look like how you imagined or how you envisioned it or saw it on the screen. And CMYK ink works in the same way as pigment color does. In other words, it's a subtractive color. So you can see here when you add cyan and magenta together, you start to get a purple color, which is very similar to mixing blue and red that we saw when we were mixing pigments. When you mix all three colors together though, cyan, magenta, and yellow, what happens is you should really be able to obtain a, a black, but you can never really get a true dark rich black, and that's where that fourth color comes in. And you can see here that that fourth color, instead of being called B for black, is actually called K. And there's a couple of different hypotheses as to why that is. Uh, normally it's the K stands for key and black in offset printing is used to add detail and often used to print a line that holds all the other color work together and that's sometimes called a key line. So that's one reason why it might be called K. And another reason which I'd like to think is rather a myth is that it's there to differentiate itself from the cyan plate which could also be called blue. So if you had a B for blue and a B for black it would be too confusing. When CMYK is used on a printing press, basically each one of those colors is a separate plate on the press. And each color is put onto those plates in terms of a very, very small dot. And when these dots overlap, in the same way that we can see the colors overlapping here, they can form other colors. So it gives you a full range of color out of just those four plates. And you can see this quite easily for yourself if you actually look at a printed image, say a four color image, a full color image, like this photograph for instance, that's been printed, and if you zoom into it really close, you can actually, you'll be able to see the dot pattern, and you'll be able to see how those different dots are overlapping with each other and how they're making other colors. So you can see here these very small areas, different colors, and there's some white in there, some black in there, yellow, but you can see those very pure colors. So basically everything that you look at that's printed with a CMYK dot is kind of an optical illusion. Again, it's tricking your eyes into thinking that, it's, that there's another color there when in fact it's just dots that are overlapping. The last kind of color we're going to look at is spot color. And this is really a subset of CMYK. And spot colors are used in offset printing. And they're used when you need a very specific color that you maybe can't mix out of the CMYK color set. So sometimes this might be something like a bright orange, or perhaps a fluorescent color, or a metallic. And you'd use a special ink for this, the way you would mix that precise color of ink, and then you would run that as one of the plates on the CMYK offset press. In this segment, we're going to look at how color and shapes can work together to form pattern. Pattern really relies on two things to, in order to work. It relies on rhythm and repetition, and the two are interrelated. So rhythm is often created by the repetition of a shape, creating negative and positive space, or as we've seen with colors, push and pull with different kind of contrasting colors. So even just by repeating the word rhythm here, you can see how some shapes create an enclosed negative space and feel very different than shapes that rely purely on repetition and interlocking forms. So this actually 
the repeated H here begins to actually look like a ladder, like a continuous form, whereas the Y feels more like perhaps a pattern or a series of things connected together. So let's start out by taking a simple shape and playing around with it a little bit and seeing what we can do in terms of color and shape and pattern. So to begin with, let's instead of using a solid shape, let's maybe use the same shape. Let's take this hexagon and we'll use it as the outline so that it's got an inside and an outside so immediately we're having to think about two different colors and we'll be able to get again get some push and pull between negative and positive space so one thing we could think about is really just how how this shape relates to itself what kind of patterns can we make from looking at this shape so if you think about just the shape overlapping um, straight away here you create two chevrons and a diamond so you've immediately started to form other shapes out of the original shape and that's a really interesting part of pattern so you could look at depending just in the relationship between these two elements you can begin to build some kind of some quite interesting quite kind of fun relationships that can be the basis the foundation for what your pattern might be and as soon as you start to have even more um, elements than this if you start to work with let's say we start to work with three elements for instance you can see here now we're building um, various other shapes much more complexity we've got different scales of shapes we've got repetitions of diamonds we've got self-contained shapes more open shapes and just you know when you're starting to work with pattern and shape a good idea is just to just to play around a little bit and this can form the basis of you know building logos identities any of these things as well as actually building proper usable pattern but there's a lot of graphic elements that really rely on just playing around visually with forms and thinking about how they lock together and how they make other shapes other patterns other forms so here we're really just working with a, a linear shape so there's a limited amount of possibilities so we could think about things like alignment that we looked at we could think about repetition for instance and how shapes might make other shapes we could think about scale and how you might take the same shapes and maybe scale them down to make another part of a pattern or of an object and we could also think about rotation as well and think about how that might relate to building some kind of pattern or object. And if you're working on making patterns like this, I would just really think about it in a very, um, a very loose way, a very playful way, because I think it can be a great way to actually learn about um, how to make pattern and how to make form just by doing it, especially in an instance like this where we're we're not really looking at anything that's particularly um, for a particular purpose for a particular client or anything like that and all we're really doing is looking at how shapes fit together and so we're looking visually and looking and learning by watching and doing and that's really what graphic design is and the best way to learn about graphic design and that kind of playful approach also means that it's kind of low risk as well so if we do something that we don't like or we do something that um, that isn't successful it doesn't really matter we can just get rid of it and start all over again so let's get rid of this one and let's start by working on a very simple shape so let's start with just this black square so we're going to use this black square as the basic building block to build a pattern out of so we're gradually going to make it more and more complex but we're starting from a very very simple form and part of why I think this is a useful exercise to make pattern is that it helps you look at shape and color but it also takes you through a process of going from simplicity to complexity and we're not really going to worry about things being mathematically correct here I'm just going to go through this and, and just kind of play and see what happens so straight away if I take the shape and repeat it and rotate it you can see that we start to get another more interesting shape but it's still got geometry it's still um, symmetrical both horizontally and vertically so then if we take that exact same shape and put a scaled down version of it inside the black shape and make it white we've suddenly got um, much more depth to our shape now we've got negative and positive space happening so you can see here we've got a very 
flat form and here we've suddenly got a little bit more depth the white interior is coming towards us visually and now the black shape is pushing back but we've also got this other more visible interesting shape here and we see this much more as a line a thick line now so it gives us a lot more opportunities to work with as an element for our pattern and if we do the same thing again and we take this black shape scale it down put it inside the middle of it you can see now we're starting to really get some depth to our shape and we're starting to have a lot of possibilities for how we might deal with color in this shape for instance so I think these concentric shapes in alternating negative and positive colors seem to be working in quite an interesting way, creating some depth and some vibrancy. I'm going to see what happens if I, if I take these away from being a square a little bit and um, make them appear a little more complex, a little less symmetrical just by rotating them. That seems a little more interesting to me. Then let's see what happens when we start to add a little bit of color to these shapes. So you can see how much the color has an effect on the white space. So here perhaps the black shapes might feel a little bit more visible, but as soon as we put these lighter colors in the background, we're also we're se partly separating out these shapes so that now they're two squares instead of one shape, but also this white is becoming much, much more of a dominant element in the design. So let's just take a look at that again very quickly. So now let's see what happens if we continue with that. We can push the center further back and suddenly we've got a much less harsh feeling color palette and this feels less like a perhaps a mark that might be used for um, a company or something like that and it feels a little bit more like it's becoming a pattern design that could be used as um, part of a, a repeating design. So if we then continue with this idea of since we've got symmetrical elements we can rotate them and try and make our composition a little bit more interesting and then we could think about well now we've got an interesting element let's group that element together and think about putting it into some kind of repetitive pattern and you can see how these things how these pieces these building blocks fit together is going to start to make secondary shapes so now we've got this very interesting dark brown lattice work happening. So I'm just going to repeat these shapes and see, basically make them take up the whole of the screen so we can get an idea how this feels as a complete pattern. So now we're viewing it as a pattern, you can really start to see some of the push and pull of the different elements. Some things coming forward, some things going backwards. And as we've created this pattern, we've actually created some new elements by forming the pattern. So not our original building block anymore, but the pieces that are made from putting our building blocks together. If you like, it's kind of like the cement or mortar between the bricks. So these are really interesting little chevron shapes that have been created that really we weren't, I wasn't thinking about at all. They've just kind of appeared there. And we can maybe put those in a color, accentuate those, try and make them a bit more of a feature of the pattern. And now that we have a more locked in pattern that we're going to work with, we can start to think about color a little bit more, I think. So let's see what happens if we, the black feels, feels a little bit too dominant right now. We could see what happens if we separate this shape out. I think you can see that here you really see the black shape quite clearly. And I think now you're obviously dividing it up into two shapes instead of reading it as one shape. So we can kind of keep going. We can fill in various different colors. And you can see how much not just the, the hue, but the value of the color really has an effect on which things are going to be, which elements are coming towards you, which elements are receding into the background. So here you can see this feels very, very much flatter because there's similar tones, but there's also similar hues in these colors. So this is perhaps maybe not the best color palette to use. So let's see what happens if we have something with a little bit more intensity, a little bit more brightness, perhaps. And then we could also think about maybe making something that is perhaps a little bit less symmetrical, just to take our pattern off kilter a little bit. So another way to get away from that kind of flatness can also be just to have the illusion of something being slightly less um, modular. And in other words, the pattern working in a way you wouldn't expect the pattern to work in. 
So as you're making patterns like this, I mean, you can really play with them forever. It's a sort of endless process. And it's a really great way to look at the variations, the possibilities, because on the computer it's very easy to change everything. So you can continually be looking and, and learning, seeing what happens visually when I change this background color, for instance. Is there suddenly much more depth? Does it feel like there are three or four different layers pushing towards me? So when you do this, it's really important just, just to keep playing. There's no, there's no right or wrong. We're not really looking for a concrete solution. We're really just looking to, to learn about playing. And one good way to do that on the computer is to actually build a, a pattern so that it's complete, and then to take the colors and just play around with them a little bit. So here I'm going to isolate this brown color. And you can see what happens as we start to make it a little bit lighter, a little bit brighter, you can see what a radical difference it has in how the how the pattern feels, how the depth works, how the colors work, and really the changes in what kind of palette you're building. So here we've got something that's much more flatter where these elements are going to stand out more, the yellow is perhaps going to stand out more. And you can see as we punch that color back up it can become much flatter be interesting to see what happens if we even make that background be very very dark and again get these elements to pop out. So there's no real right and wrongs in this case, it's really just experimentation in order to learn. But once you give this pattern some kind of job to do or something to represent, then suddenly there is a bit more of a criteria for you to think about your design and to think about what's working what's not working. And one easy way to, to do this with form, shape, color, and pattern is to look at historical motifs and historical patterns and just try and analyze them a little bit and think about why those patterns look the way they do, what kind of color palettes were perhaps associated with certain time periods or certain movements, even certain countries, certain cultures. And just having that little bit of extra knowledge can really help you um, get a grasp on the tools and be able to control how you want something to feel, what you want the pattern and the color to reference. So far in this course we've broken design down into smaller parts in order to investigate and experience it, to make it understandable and to learn about it. Now we're going to think about how to put some of those component pieces back together again and we're going to use composition to do that. Historically, composition was at the core of the designer's role. An ad agency might have come up with the concept, a photographer have taken the photo, an illustrator made the image, a typesetter laid out the type, and a copywriter written the text. So what did the designer do? Well, the designer arranged everything on the page. It seems like a small thing, but you can make many designs, both good and bad, with the same elements. The arrangement can dramatically affect the visual appeal of a piece of design. It can also make or break the message that the designer is trying to communicate. Think of it like a room full of furniture. How you arrange the room can dramatically affect your experience of the room, how it feels, how it looks, what it tells you about who lives in the room. And it can be the same pieces of furniture. And it can make you feel like the room is very organized or very messy, spatially comfortable, or really annoying and awkward to be in. Composition can make design be direct, logical, and functional, but composition can also make design feel more complex, engaging, and dense. It can be the difference between success and failure of a piece of design. This week we'll look at the basic principles of composition, how to create and control visual contrast, we'll examine and understand how more complex hierarchical relationships work. Finally, we'll be looking at how to create a more complex piece of design, and we'll be using your knowledge from all of the previous weeks in the course. Composition is basically the arrangement and positioning of elements on a surface to form a piece of graphic design. So this could be on screen, it could be in print, but basically it's putting together any of those elements. It could be typography, it could be shapes, it could be images. And composition is a very powerful tool it, to begin with, it can really make the difference between things not making any sense and exactly the same elements coming together and making sense. But it can also 
quite subtly affect how a viewer reads things and what kind of messages they're getting from design. So it's not just about arranging all the elements, it's about doing it with some kind of thoughtful intent as the designer and using composition as a tool really to help you to create messages as well as aesthetics. So let's start out with a blank piece of paper. Imagine we put an element, an object, onto that piece of paper. The chances are that we're going to place that object pretty much in the middle of the paper and that's just our inclination. Maybe it's a reaction to symmetry and geometry but that's kind of an even way to place an image on a piece of paper and probably the most obvious as well and this is called being centered and when you center an object in a composition or a series of objects in a composition it nearly always works okay but it's also very very familiar and can lose a lot of its power so let's imagine we have three different shapes to work with and we're going to try and compose them in this page. If we were to put them on a centered axis it might get a little too clumsy and too awkward so we might have to think of a different way to arrange those elements. So there are a couple of very familiar and very traditional ways of arranging elements. So one being centered, another being something called the rule of thirds and here you divide your page or your screen that you're working on into a series of thirds and where the thirds intersect is actually points of visual interest where you might choose to place elements. So you can see here if we get rid of the grid lines and we look at the placement of shapes onto the intersection of the thirds one at a time you can really see how they're, they're placed at points of visual interest where the relationship between the object and the rectangle that it's sitting in and the white space where the object isn't. Those relationships are quite kind of pleasing to the eye. So these two simple systems, vertical and horizontal symmetry and the rule of thirds, they're really based on a lot of how we see things in nature. Quite often things are symmetrical or things are divided up that they fall into this um, rule of thirds. But there's another system that's also from nature that's perhaps more interesting to look at and that system is called the Golden Rectangle and this is a system that's been very popular in architecture and in design really since the 1400s. And like the other two systems the Golden Rectangle is seen as creating a guideline for composition that is really seen as being harmonious in particular in this case because the ratios of the golden rectangle actually reflect the ratios of the human body. So let's look at how you actually make a golden rectangle. So if you take a square and you cut that square in half and you then look at the center of the square to a corner of the square, can be either of these, if you think about that as the radius of a circle and you were to actually draw that circle what that would give you is another length here and if you then took that length and actually turned it into a rectangle what you would actually have is something that was the proportions of the golden rectangle so you can see that it's always made up of a square and then an additional segment and the ratio between the height and the length and this obviously works horizontally as, as well as vertically but that ratio between the height and the length is always a consistent proportion and that proportion is, is roughly 1 to 1.6 and if you wanted to do a little research about how the golden rectangle is used, the golden section is used in say book design for instance is very interesting to look at because it's a medium that's been around for such a long time you can look at book plates from the 15th, 16th century that use this composition all the way up to books and book designs today that are using this same composition. And one of the interesting things about the golden rectangle is that once you have a square and, and you make a golden rectangle out of it, the portion that's left, when that's divided up into a square, the piece that's left after that is another golden rectangle. So what this means is you can kind of keep going forever dividing each 
golden rectangle up by adding a square to it into, to get another smaller golden rectangle. And if you kept going for this, what you'd actually end up with would be a perfect nautilus shape. And again, this talks about the relationship of the golden ratio to uh, its form and its appearance in nature. So we could place some objects within certain areas that are defined by the golden ratio, for instance, and that might help us with the composition. But we're also going to need to make other moves in our composition. So for instance here you can see just scale by making some of the elements larger can have a, a really large effect, really change the hierarchy. Suddenly the triangle is obviously much more important. Or here we're using direction and space a little bit more. And you can see again the scale where the circle becomes much more important. There's a lot of activity over on the left hand side, a lot more space over on the right hand side. And these kind of compositional ideas they can really be found out by just moving shapes around within a rectangle. But I think one of the easiest ways to really think about them is to actually talk about visual contrast. And what this means is taking some of these aspects of composition and trying to look at them as a, a spectrum, if you like, from very little contrast to a lot of contrast. And the reason why we try and do this is to really gain control of them. So we're going to look at this in a very abstract way and we're just going to use abstract geometric shapes to begin with to, talk, to think about composition. So we're going to divide visual contrasts up into a list of six different categories. Those categories are form or kind of shape, scale, size relationships, weight, so a difference in tonality, space, how a composition might use negative and positive space, direction, horizontal, vertical, diagonal, lines, or how objects point and help you traverse white space, and then texture, the kind of flatness versus the texture or the quality of a certain object. So to begin with, we're going to break these down into single visual contrasts with single forms. So what that means is we're going to take every single aspect of the, those six points and we're going to look at them with just one shape and see what would make a lot of contrast or a little contrast. So to begin with, if we think about form, here's a shape. It's a single form. There's no real contrast there and all we're really looking at is the difference between that form and we're really just trying to accentuate just this one form. There's no scale difference between the forms, there's no tonal difference, there's no directional difference, apart from what might be inherent in the form itself. So we can look at form and talk about differences in form with just single objects. It doesn't have necessarily have to be comparative, side by side. But if we look at the next contrast scale, we really need to see large versus small next to each other because they define one another. So here you can see scale when it's even, so no difference between the two objects versus obviously a much more um, exaggerated scale, one object being larger, one object being smaller. But again we're trying not to allow any other contrast uh, to be visible here. So not a lot of direction, not a lot of spatial or tonal difference or textural difference. So let's look at weight now and try and isolate weight as a contrast. So here you can see we have two shapes that are very even, exactly the same tone. They have the same visual weight, which is obviously related to their scale and their form as well. But you can see just by turning one into an outline and leaving the other solid, the one suddenly has the dark shape has a lot more presence on the page, a lot more contrast, volume, so it appears to have more weight. And obviously we can do this tonally as well. We can look at a 50% shape here and look at the difference between that tonally. And again, it's in terms of contrast, so the shape on the right appears to be visually larger than the shape on the left and visually heavier as well. So now let's look at space as a contrast. And space isn't necessarily a contrast that can be held within a particular form. So we're not really talking about the difference between each of these two objects. 
as implying a contrast in space. What we're really talking about is a, a compositional contrast where here, for instance, by putting those two shapes into one corner, we're creating a lot of white space. So we're really looking at creating a composition here that makes an em puts an emphasis on that white space and makes that white space much more visible. But at the same time, because those the square shapes are echoing the square of our page and are sitting fairly passively in the corner, there's not a lot of direction happening either. And again, there's no there's no tonality, there's no difference in texture or scale. So what we're really trying to do is just to isolate and emphasize one aspect of the visual contrast list in order to focus on it, but also in order to be able to really understand it and control it. And direction works in a similar way. We're not really looking at direction within an individual shape. Obviously a square as, a, as, an, as an even geometric shape pulls you into the center of that shape, whereas a line might actually have a little bit more direction. But we're thinking more about the relationship between the page and the objects that are put on the page. So here, for instance, you can see we're getting a, a much more diagonal relationship out of these squares. We're starting to get a diagonal direction. So our eye is being led from the center of the page out to the corners here. And you can see you can create that tension and you can create direction that actually makes the viewer's eye cross white space. And this is the beginning of understanding how elements work in relationship to backgrounds within compositions, how a viewer's eye moves around a composition and that relationship to hierarchy. So for instance, we might be drawn to one of these black shapes, but then our eye is pulled across to the other shape Texture works a little bit more like some of the earlier contrasts that we were looking at, where texture really relies on the object itself changing rather than its relationship to the page and its position on the page. So for instance, here we can see just a very straightforward black square, whereas the shape to the left has a geometric, you know, a texture to it. And you could exaggerate that even more by perhaps making it be more organic. It could also have um, a less linear quality to define that shape. So here you can see that we still read this as a square, but that texture is really forcing us to not think about it being quite so geometric as before. So we've looked at single visual contrasts with single forms where possible, and now we're going to look at single visual contrasts with multiple forms. So we can see that Pretty much with forms, it doesn't really change that much. There's still the idea of these being different but comparative shapes, different but comparative forms. And if we look at weight, we could see now, rather than having just either end of the spectrum, we have a little bit more of a range. So here we can see from white to gray to black in terms of tonality and visual weight. But where this is perhaps a little more interesting is when we start to look at, again, those compositional elements or aspects that deal much more with the object versus the background rather than comparing to each other. So here, for instance, with space, you can clearly see how these four black squares now really make the negative space, the white cross that you can see, they've really created that space and there's this really interesting tension and relationship between the push and the pull, the foreground and background between the white and the black. In a similar way, if we look at direction, you can see that by now, now we have more shapes to work with, we can really get them to describe the aspect of composition that we're trying to get at. So here, for instance, these five black squares clearly form a very strong diagonal line that talks about direction within the frame. So when we look at scale with more elements, you can see that what's happening is we've got a much greater range now, so we're starting to build more of a rhythm and more of a pattern and repetition. And so this allows us to actually see the range of the scale and see how scale is really working a little bit more easily. It actually makes it more clearer to see. And finally, if we look at texture with more than one element or two elements at a time, we can start to have a, a greater comparison and a greater variety of different kinds of texture that might be possible. 
Now looking at all of these different aspects of composition individually isn't really going to help us be that much better at composition because when you're composing all of those aspects of composition are happening at the same time so what we're going to try and do next is to start to combine some of these aspects of composition and see how they work together. So this is where things start to get a little bit more interesting and a little bit more fun I think. We've looked at single visual contrasts and we've tried to look at them with both single and multiple forms but now we're going to actually look at multiple visual contrasts using multiple forms and this is a more realistic representation of how you might compose and put things on a page so instead of trying to isolate these visual contrasts to understand them we're really going to try and mix and match them a little bit more so let's start out with two very simple ones let's start with mixing scale and form together so here you can see we've got two different forms, two different shapes, two different objects, but they've also got two different scales working as well. So that's quite quite simple but immediately a little bit more visually interesting. And now we can see what happens if we add a little bit of texture to these same objects. So we have scale, form and texture all working together. So you can see now it starts to get even more interesting. So there's some a little bit of dimensionality. There's an there's an extra contrast being happening there with the texture. And sometimes you can think about these contrasts as being visual interest as well. So the the more we add to a certain extent, the more visually interesting the composition is going to be. So if we keep going now and we try and add some direction to our other elements. You can see we've added a, a third element here, the, tri the triangle. And now we've clearly, got, even though we've got differences in scale and differences in form and differences in texture, they're unifying in this very strong diagonal relationship. So let's try and combine two other aspects of contrast and composition. Let's try weight and form. So here we have three different forms, three different objects, shapes, and they have three different tonal values to them. So it's still fairly flat, fairly conventional. Let's see what happens if we try and add a little bit of space as one of our compositional considerations. So here now you can see they've, they're have they not sitting on a consistent line anymore, and they're actually interacting with each other and interacting with the background in a little bit more of an interesting way. So the angle of the triangle could be pointing at the circle. The square here is getting a little bit of tension, visual tension, where it's close to the edge. And you really notice the difference between the tonal value of the three of them and because of the composition your eye tends to travel between the three of them as well. So now let's see what happens if we add a little bit of scale to this as well to try and reduce the flatness that was there. So now you can see the composition suddenly feels much more interesting. There's a lot more depth to it. You're not quite sure whether that depth perception is the push and pull of scale or of tonality and whether this becomes a little bit more pictorial or not. The relationships between the shapes, as soon as you start to sit one shape on top of another, it has a certain realism or a certain gravity to it. So we could try and, and keep going and add one more aspect. So in this case, let's try adding direction and see what happens with that. So now if we put those shapes in a new composition that looks a little bit more like direction, you can see we're back to a less pictorial representation but again we've got a little bit more of a diagonal directional relationship between the three shapes so the square remains very static and heavy partly due to its shape partly due to its weight and also its position in the frame the triangle feels a little more floating and obviously has a, a directional aspect to it that points at the square and then the circle, which is concentric shape that can kind of suck you in visually, like that feels much more like a focal point or a starting point for the composition. So you might look at this and then travel out to the square. So let's see what happens now if we keep going with this and we try and work with all of the different aspects of composition that we have. What you can see is that we've got a lot going on. We've got a lot of direction, we've got some trapped white space, we've 
got scale, texture, tonality. There's a lot of contrasts happening there. So this makes the composition quite active in, in a lot of the areas. So you can see the activity here is in the texture and yet we've got a lot of diagonals here pointing at different things. This line is very strong. Then it's leading you into a, a, a more calm little area of white space where this dot is held. We've got a large dark area as a contrast to that. So you can see that we're making all of the different aspects of composition work, but that can sometimes create a little bit of a cacophony, a, a lot of visual noise. So part of what you could think about is how to now rein in some of those aspects of composition and to actually control them and maybe decide that you want some of them to do a little bit less and decide which ones you really want to do more of the hard work. So I, I might decide here that I think the this black square and the textured circle are cancelling each other out a little bit. So I might decide I want a little bit more space. So I might reduce the scale of that black square and increase the scale of the white triangle. And you can see that it has quite a different effect on how you read the composition. Now you've got a lot more white space to look at in the lower half of the composition. The triangle is now, the white triangle is now a much more prevalent part of the composition as well. So once you've got a lot of complexity and you've got a lot of elements going on, sometimes just one small move can really make a difference. And we could keep going further with this idea of trying to get a little bit more space, a little bit more contrast in the space if you like. So now in this composition we're taking some of those floating elements that are out in the white space, the circle and the square, and actually grouping those together a little bit, layering them on top of each other, so starting to get a little bit of depth that way. And here you can see we're creating some tension in the composition as well between the circle here that's a very powerful, strong, contrasting element with the white triangle on top of it. A lot of the direction is coming from the tri both triangle shapes, and we're using this bar to kind of bounce back that directionality. And the same thing is happening up here in the corner. Our eyes might kind of trickle up here. And this sort of 45 degree shape of the square is going to bounce us back down, same over here, and bounce our eye back into the composition. And sometimes you want that in a, in a composition. You want the viewer's eye to, to keep moving. So part of this is really about controlling hierarchy and part of it is also controlling what the viewer looks at when. And here's one last variation just for fun where we take away a lot of the scale, we take away a lot of the overlapping and you can see that this now feels like a much flatter, a much more graphic composition even though it's um, the same elements really but the, the reduction in scale, the reduction in overlapping really makes this feel very very different than the previous composition which feels almost like it could exist um, in the real world. It feels like it starts to have a little bit of depth and perspective, whereas this feels very much like a, a flat world, a two-dimensional world. But I still think there's a lot happening in the composition here that could be seen as being really interesting. You start to notice some other things. For instance, the relationship between these two circles is now accentuated because they're on a similar central axis, so your eye is encouraged to jump over this white space. You're then also encouraged by this diagonal and the diagonal line that these elements create to have a relationship between this gray circle and the other elements down here. So your eye can kind of move through that composition. And you can also see here is a point of tension where these three points come together and there's some negative space forming shapes as well. And all of these things, uh, it takes a little while to, to get used to them, but as you're actually making compositions of your own, it really helps to talk about them and critique them on your own and try and really figure out how they're working, figure out um, what direction your eye is looking in, what areas of the composition are active, what areas of the composition are passive or static. So we've looked at how to use contrasts for creating compositions using abstract shapes and now I'm going to take some of those same compositions and just switch the abstract shapes, switch those graphic forms out for typographic forms. 
So let's start out by looking at scale and form. So before we'd had a very large circle and a very small square. So if we, we were to replace those with typographic forms, we might get a composition that looked something like this. And the reason why I'm going to very quickly do this with type and switch it out is just to kind of illustrate some of the same concepts and how those concepts in composition work with letter forms as opposed to objects. So in this case we'd be looking at the letters O and the letter H as being different forms. They would be the same typeface but actually the form would be the letters that we're choosing. So if we then start to think about how to add texture that would really be about the kind of typeface that we were choosing. So you can see here that one typeface is a sans serif, the others are very decorative, um, ornamental initial cap. So there's two very, very different feelings to how those typefaces are drawn to kind of the texture of the letter form. So now if we keep going and try and look at scale, form, texture and direction with type you can see we're starting to get a, a composition that feels that it's working in a similar way to how we how we looked with objects. Um, you're getting direction out of certain shapes of letter forms like the A for instance. You know the B has some formal qualities very different from the other letters. And so we we can use what we've learned in our composition class and really use that as a way to experiment with type and look at typographic form as well. So let's take one of the other examples that we looked at. We looked at weight and form together and we looked at three different shapes with three different tones to them. So again we could look at perhaps three different typefaces with three different weights to each letter form. If we then start to look at how those might work in terms of how they're composed within space we can see that Again, we're disrupting legibility at this point and no longer, we're no longer sure where to start reading. But the letter forms now become a little bit more like elements in the composition. So as we add other aspects of composition, we add scale here. And then we add some direction to the composition. You can see that these typographic elements, when they're broken down into single letters, they actually function in a very, very similar way to how the objects were functioning in our other compositions. Where it changes and they function a little bit less is when we start to reach a, a level of complexity where again the form becomes a little bit noisy and a little bit overwhelming. And part of the reason why we're not really used to this with typography, apart from perhaps in ransom notes, is because we're not used to seeing single letters in different typefaces. We're used to seeing words in different typefaces. So at this stage it becomes quite difficult to think about this as typography and it becomes a little bit more like um, lettering, working really with just letters in a composition. So at this stage I'm not really thinking about legibility or readability, how things make sense or if they even say anything. I'm just looking at the letter forms as forms. You could actually counteract this a little bit if you took away that typographic cacophony if we look at this composition for instance and we tried to replicate that this one typographically and we did it with actually a, a family of typefaces so here it's all in in universe for instance suddenly it feels a little bit more harmonious and so perhaps when working with letter forms in this way a better strategy might be to to work with a, a family that has a broad range a lot of different weights and a lot of different condensed and extended versions rather than working with a, a range of different typefaces. So we've looked at how multiple visual contrasts work with type. So now let's have a look at how some of these multiple visual contrasts work with images. I'm going to use some of the images that I just have lying around from our very first image making class. So if we looked at something like scale and form for instance and before we'd looked at a large circle and a small square, if we just transpose those for black and white images, we could put a large picture of an apple and a small picture of a corkscrew there. 
And one of the things that you'll notice about suddenly having objects and having images that can be read rather than more abstract forms is that we immediately build relationships between these objects and what they mean. So it's not just a formal compositional relationship, it also becomes about a, a relationship of meaning. We think that perhaps the corkscrew is going to stick into the apple, or we look at scale relationships in a certain way. So we can't help but read the objects as objects and not just compositional elements anymore. So if we try and add a little bit of direction to this composition, for instance, we can see now we've got a couple of different objects floating in space. And what you can see is much like the shapes, certain shapes will have a little more dynamic attribute to them in terms of composition. So you can see the scissors have quite a lot of direction to them. They're quite pointy, they're quite diagonal. The apple, which is a circle, remains a concentric shape that pulls you into the center. So already you can understand that there's a lot of connections when we're using images. We're revisiting a lot of areas that we've seen when we were using shapes. So we're going to try and add a little bit more exaggerated scale now. And we're also going to add a human form. Um, and part of why I want to do this is to just to look at how we read images, and particularly how we read faces and how we read direction within an image. So for instance, we can look at the corkscrew and we can clearly see how it's pointing, where it's pointing, what its kind of attributes are compositionally. The same with the scissors, we can see that even though there's a cross shape being formed, it's generally pointing right at the face. But with a human figure, we actually view it a little bit differently in compositional terms. We tend to engage with the face, we tend to look at the eyes, and if the eyes happen to be looking anywhere, that can quite often give the image some kind of internal direction, and can be quite a powerful aspect of composition when working with images. So let's try and make this one a little bit more complicated. So let's stick a giant apple on my head. And again, one of the things that this does is it makes us think about relationships. The apple on the head might feel like it's about surrealism. Suddenly we start to build again the relationship between the corkscrew and the apple, that the corkscrew might stick into the apple. Or even because of the scale and the meaning relationship, we look at the glasses and think about whether the apple head could wear the glasses. So again, the objects here are working in a similar way to when we'd worked with geometric abstract shapes, but the meaning is really adding another compositional level, another way that we read composition. So let's see what happens if we change that scale quite dramatically and try and get the objects to read more as purely directional objects and perhaps have a little bit less of a relationship. So here you can see we've just got a clear diagonal being formed by all the shapes and the apple, the one concentric circular shape, is just floating outside of that being fairly self-contained. So you can see you've got a very strong line through all of these three objects and then the apple just sitting out here on its own and the face is fairly kind of passive in the corner now. So in terms of meaning we can see in this composition the objects don't really have a lot of relationship to each other. We're seeing them more as compositional elements. We're not really making a story out of the relationships between the elements. We're just seeing them pretty much as formal elements the way we would looked at our abstract shapes. And this is important because once we stop doing that once we force that relationship, we actually start to tell stories and to make pictures with our images. So here you can see just by adding some more elements and then creating a composition where the corkscrews and the scissors seem to be attacking Applehead, there really becomes a, a, a story there and it becomes a, a picture with some kind of meaning to it. Even though in this case it's quite a surreal, strange meaning, we would really wouldn't really read this image as pure composition anymore, we'd start to read it as having a narrative. So here's a similar image with a drastic scale change. And if we were to try and read this image, read the story in this image, it might be that this person is thinking about these four objects or this person is trying to remember that he has something to do with these four objects. 
It's definitely not a real situation where these objects are actually floating around his head, but it's very different from how we read this situation where we understand it's a surreal composition, but we're still building an emotional relationship between the apple head and the objects attacking him. And part of what we really have to remember and why it's useful to look at this is just to think about images as in composition as having two aspects. One is the regular kind of compositional aspects that we've looked at with objects and the other really is this idea of meaning, narrative and storytelling that's really impossible to avoid. And as human beings we're always trying to connect these objects together. We're trying to make sense of them, either make sense of their place in the world or their relationships or we're trying to make them do something so we can understand them. And I think that's clear when we look at this final image that it's really just a pile of objects but we really really want to read it as a face. We've already looked at how composition works with abstract shapes and with objects, images and with pieces of typography and now we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to look at how some of those ideas about composition uh, how those work in, in a single image. So let's take a look at composition and cropping. So here's a photograph of some of my students from CalArts on an exchange program in Seoul, Korea. So if we were to look at this photograph and try and analyze how its composition works, I think one of the first things that we'd notice is that it has a very, very strong sense of perspective. So there's scale from the larger figures here going through medium size to the smaller figures and that's really giving a, a very strong directional line. But that's not the only strong perspective line in this photograph, it's actually made up of a lot of perspective lines. So if we look we can also see the trees on the left form a line leading into the background, the umbrellas form a line, even the actual sidewalk and the setting of the cement and the tiles form other lines that lead us in the same direction. So you can see there's a lot of things that are forcing us all in the forcing our view all in the same direction. So it's in that way it's actually looks like a complicated image, but it's quite simple. There's one little image there with a bridge at the end that sort of pulls you from right to left once you've entered into that vanishing point in the center of the photograph. So you can see there are a lot of different directions happening in this photograph, but they're all really forcing perspective. Well, they're really all working in the same way. They're all heading towards the same vanishing point. So if we get rid of these perspective arrows, let's try looking at our image in a different way. Another way to look at direction and composition in this image would be to look at it in terms of color. So if we, for instance, picked out some of the green elements here that seem quite distinct, you'd see we'd be able to see where the trees are falling and still falling within those perspective lines. We could see where the grass is falling into the perspective lines. Even these tiny little spots of color, they all seem to play into this idea of the forced perspective in this composition. Another way we could look at it is we could also look at it as a repetition of form. We could look at the rhythm of the human figure within this composition. So if we start to highlight some of those figures, and we'll just fill them in with black rectangles here, you can start to see that there's a visual repetition and a visual rhythm here that's a really important part of the composition. And something that's quite interesting to do here, now that we've marked out the composition or we've certainly marked out a way of looking at this composition, we could actually take the image away. And so what you're left with now is something that is feels much closer to our abstract compositions where we're using geometric shapes, or then obviously now we're using color as well. So let's put the image back in there and get rid of those shapes, and let's look at an, another way we might look at this image. So another way we could look at this image is to look at something like people's faces, for instance. So again, we'll see some rhythm and some repetition in there, but it's also, when we look at a photograph, it's one of the things that we immediately try and engage with, is the gaze or the face of another person. So if we mark those faces out with these blue circles, 
when we do that at scale, you can see again we're getting a repetitive rhythmic pattern, but one that's also still reinforcing that idea of perspective. We could do the same thing with the shapes of the umbrellas, perhaps. We could use those as, again, a scaled repetitive form that's echoing through this image. So if we then take all of the graphic elements that we've been using to describe this composition and overlay them on the photograph, you can see that we've got quite a good graphic representation of that image and of the composition of that image. And again, if we take the image away, you can see how we're starting to make a composition very similar to our abstract forms, maybe a little more pictorial, but definitely something that's much more complex and representative of this photograph. And if we wanted to keep pursuing this idea, we could perhaps fill in some of the other important elements that we can see interacting in the composition here. So if we took all of those and added them together into our composition and took away the photo, we'd end up with something like this, very complicated and almost an abstract rendering of our photograph. And while this is a fun way to learn about composition, and for us to learn about how to deconstruct this photograph, it's not always that useful as a designer. What's actually much more useful is to understand hierarchy within an image and to understand where a viewer's eye goes in an image and when the viewer's eye goes to which part of the image. So let's take a look at that. Let's go back to our original photograph and start again. Understanding visual hierarchy is really important for designers. And we've seen how particularly scale and space in our compositions can help us with that. But if we try and now look at this individual photograph and deconstruct this and try and look at it, how it's functioning and how its hier compositional hierarchy is working, we can see some of the same things are going to come into play, ideas of space and ideas of scale. So I would argue that the primary thing that we look at, the number one thing in the hierarchy, is actually the two people that are at the front, it's partly scale, it's partly position, it's partly a little bit of space around them, but also they're the, the lead planier element. In other words, if we divided this image up into planes, they would be in the first plane, they'd be in our foreground. So let's see where our eye would travel from there. I would argue that our eye would travel in the direction of the perspective. So our hierarchy might go one, two, three, and we'd see the scale reducing, and this would really be reflective of the very powerful perspective in this photograph. I also think you'd be looking at the human figure a lot. So you'd be drawn to the human figure rather than, say, some of the other elements such as a tree or a sign or, a, or some of the architectural elements even. So our final piece in the hierarchy would probably be this last map or graphic that's on the wall on the side of the building, partly because it's one of the few elements that bleeds on the top and on the bottom, the image goes off out of the frame, but it's also quite a contrasting and um, dark part of the image. So this would be a simple analysis of the hierarchy of this image. I think you could also perhaps make the case that the girl standing here is perhaps higher up in the hierarchy and more important partly because of the framing of the space around her but that's being taken away by this perspective so another way to maybe try and analyze this image and see how that's working is to look at where you think your eye goes as a viewer what kind of direction does this photograph have I think we can see that our entry point is probably here and we lead, we lead our way into the other faces but then if we don't follow this perspective line, if we're actually drawn to this other figure, you can see that we, our eye might come over here, and then our eye might lead, follow her eye line over to this graphic. We would travel maybe down a little bit and back with these strong perspective lines back to these figures in the distance. And then either out to the vanishing point, the bright spot of the image, or we might follow the person's gaze here from one person to another person. Now what this kind of mapping doesn't really tell you is the speed at which your eye moves and how much time you spend with each part of the image. 
So it might be that you come into the image here and very rapidly travel along this line and linger for much longer on this figure and then rapidly travel back to this figure and you might then spend more time at this vanishing point or more time looking at this gaze. So sometimes even though there can be parts of an image that seem that they're very important, you've really got to think about what are entry points, how does the eye move around an image, and how long does the eye spend on that image. And as a designer, that's something that you want to control. You want to control how a viewer reads or understands that image. And a big part of that is actually how the image is cropped. So cropping is basically when you take away some space from the left edge, the right edge, or the top or the bottom of an image. And by doing so, you reframe it and you change its composition. And cropping is actually a very powerful tool. Sometimes quite small moves can really alter the composition and alter how you read the composition. So you can see here, just by actually taking away a little bit of space on the right-hand side, we've made this element much more dominant now that it bleeds on three sides. It actually comes to the foreground much more and now it's competing with our figures here that were our entry point before. So this is maybe not a good idea to crop that image. And you can see if we crop the right hand side it makes this image feel even more dominant and it maybe makes our perspective lines here feel a little bit cramped. There's a little bit less room for our eye to move around the image and to also if we looked at our direction at the end we were trying to come back down the image here and now that's gone. So you can really see how cropping can drastically affect how the eye moves around an image. So let's take those crops away and now let's look and see what happens if we take a little bit of the image from the top and the bottom. So you can see if we take some from the top here, it doesn't seem to dramatically affect it that much. If anything, it puts a little bit more emphasis on the perspective of the, of the figures here. If we take some off the bottom, it's quite interesting because now we have much more of a horizontal emphasis to our image. We notice the relationships between the heads a little bit more. This horizontal line becomes more dramatic. It's fighting less against the vertical perspective lines and that becomes quite interesting I think. Also if you see here the figure has been cropped slightly at the bottom and so that leads makes gives this figure a little bit more dominance makes pushes this figure a little bit more into the foreground. And the reason why this cropping is so important for designers is that often you're given images from somebody else from a photographer or um, an illustrator and sometimes you need to make those images work a little bit better and cropping can be quite a useful tool in order to get images to do a little bit of what you want to do and sometimes that's formal or aesthetic and sometimes that can be to do with meaning. So let's go back to our original image and let's see what happens if we, are, if we were to crop this in a much more drastic fashion. I'm just going to keep the frame the same size but Basically, we're going to be enlarging the image and focusing on different areas of it just to see how it changes meaning. So here you can see we've zoomed into the image a little bit and this changes really how we read the image. It's changing the focus of what we're looking at. So now you can see here we've got these figures are much larger. We're maybe more interested in the relationship between these two figures. We can actually see some emotion on people's faces and we're starting to connect that and try and facilitate some meaning out of it. You can also see that our composition has obviously quite dramatically changed as well. If we pan across to the right here, you can see that we start to change the meaning of the image. We're not just changing the composition, but we're changing how we might feel about this image. Suddenly we look at this one group of figures and then a more isolated figure over here, and we might start to think about the activity or the event that's happening in the image and feel empathy for this character or feel that this character is isolated. Another way that we could look at how cropping and zooming in an image works is if we zoom in a little bit further and make a lot of the figures here bleed at the edge of the frame. Part of what that does is it implies that there is perhaps more activity outside of the frame, more people, so suddenly this feels like perhaps there was a there was a lot more people that were participating in this walk than maybe just the figures when we could see space around them. You can see as we've cut into these figures now, there's much more 
dynamic kind of diagonals from the forms of the people and we're actually getting much more of the composition is reliant on the figures and the umbrellas now. All the architecture has gone entirely. And if we make an extreme crop and take all the people out and focus much more on the architecture, you can see how it has a very different feeling. This definitely feels sort of quieter and perhaps more melancholy and um, there becomes a little bit of humor with the jets cap here and the umbrellas but it becomes much more about kind of architecture in the rain versus our cropped image of the people which seems much more like people out on a walk having fun. If we go back over to our figure on the right hand side you can see how by isolating and focusing in on this figure we can get a totally different mood. Now we've really got just one person to look at. We're much more aware of what's happening inside this photograph and I think one of the things that's interesting to me about this crop is just looking at the figure's hand here is quite unusual and a focal point. You've got her face to look at. There's these strong diagonals that are being echoed through here. And so this seems like quite, a, quite an interesting crop. And we could keep going and be somewhat more extreme and crop this image even more. Take the emphasis away from the girl's face. Try and really emphasize the strangeness of the hand, the diagonal of the umbrella, the diagonals of the architecture. So you can see how really it's not just the formal qualities that are changing but also the meaning of the image but also the feeling of the image as well. And designers really want to control all of those three things. So far we've looked at composition in a fairly abstract way. We've really isolated it and looked at it in exercises whether that's with objects or lettering or abstract shapes. And we've done this in order to learn about composition and now we're going to try and put what we've learned back into the context of a real piece of graphic design. So we're really going to try and put it all together using elements that we've worked on and knowledge that we've gained during the last few classes. So I'm going to take some of the images from the first image making classes that we did and I'm going to take some, I'm going to go for a range of images here and I may or may not use all of these but I'm just going to pick six so I'm going to pick some that are purely just line work, some with volume vector based, photographic, more textural printmaking techniques, black and white, some with backgrounds, some that are cut out shapes that I can easily float and I'm not really, I really don't have an idea what I'm going to do with these yet. I'm just making a selection of images that I think are interesting. And I'm going to be using these to make a, a poster for an imaginary band. And the band, I'm going to make up a name for the band as well. So I'm going to use my object from the first week and uh, so the apple and I'm going to add an adjective to that. So my band is going to be called the Rotten Apples and I'm just going to make up a name for the title of their album that we're going to be promoting. So my album is going to be called Bite Me. And I'm also going to use some of the shapes that I had made and had used in my composition exercises earlier as well. So now I've got all the pieces to begin thinking about making a real piece of graphic design. I've got images to use for image making shapes to use as part of my composition, ancillary elements, and also vehicles for working with color and tonality. And I've got some text so I can be able to play with my typography. And I'm going to put all of these things together in the context of an 11 by 17 poster that's going to be promoting the band's album. So it's going to be a poster for Bite Me by the Rotten Apples. So I very quickly made a series of compositions, all 11 by 17 posters, so we can look at some of the issues of composition we've looked at and also look at composition's relationship to aesthetics and style. So this might be the first poster that I might make, very easy, fast, simple, and I'm really working very quickly not overthinking these things. So a very simple typeface, no background color, not a lot of scale change in the type, um, a nice kind of bright vibrant contrasting image and the very centered composition so quite quite simple poster and gradually we're going to try and work with these things and make them more and more complex 
So imagine now we're going to introduce a second element. Um, we're going to crop one of those elements here, have it bleed off the side of the page, add a little color to the type, some scale changes to the typography, and then we're also going to make the viewer now much more aware of the white space that's happening here. We're going to force their eye to travel through the composition like this and to traverse the white space. And if you remember, in our composition segment, we looked at how the intersection of thirds can create visual interest for a viewer. And you can see that this apple here is actually falling at one of those intersections and again being accentuated by having the white space around it. So let's look at some other simple compositional variations. Here you can see we're using much more diagonal lines. We're also using the weight of this image by sitting it at the bottom of the picture plane right on the edge of this frame. It's definitely weighted, it's kind of grounded at the bottom here. So these elements then can float up in space. You can also see that the type has a relationship to this little bit of direction in the image. So let's switch it up a little bit and look at one of our other images. We're still keeping it very simple. We've still got a centered composition, but now we're relying much more on the image itself, the texture of the image, the quality of the image. And we've now introduced a little bit of scale change in the typography, you can see. We've also introduced a difference in color in the typography, and also a difference in the typeface as well. And one of the things I think is interesting about this image is really the, the color and the texture in here, the qualities of the image itself. So let's see what happens if we change the scale and increase that dramatically so we can see a little bit more of the image. So much, in fact, that we're going to let it bleed, let it run off the sides of the page here. And there's also kind of a nice relationship if you think back to uh, when we were looking at color. So you can see here there's greens that are relating to the color of this typography, reds relating to the color of this typography. So it feels like the three elements, even though they're very simple and in a simple composition, they all have a relationship together. So one thing we haven't really talked about in this Fundamentals of Graphic Design class, but that we can bring up a little bit now, is just the relationship between aesthetics and content. So you can see here we've Making, we're making a poster for a band and here's another one where we're using the same content but a much more simpler approach so that might have some effect on what kind of music you think this this band might be making so part of that is just understanding that we're making form here but we're not really considering the context or the idea the concept of that as much we're really just looking at form here for form's sake so if we take a much more simple approach here. We've reduced the image to just an outline. Uh, there's very few elements. It feels much much sparser. Maybe again a different kind of music that's being produced by this group. So let's take that same image that was sparse and now start to add some volume to it. And here we're trying to make the color be a much more important and powerful aspect of the design. So you can see we're still really working with fairly simple composition but now we've got a background color we're trying to get the color to be a more important part of the composition here so as I'm looking at this image there's something quite interesting about the the circle here and this little bit of type makes me think of a, of a label on a piece of fruit so we could we could try actually adding that as a little bit of an idea back into this, still keeping this very minimal style, very few elements happening. So now let's see what happens if we change that a little bit more dramatically. So for this one, for instance, we've put a lot more emphasis on the type. The type has a lot of scale. The type has volume and weight with this color. It's very solid, blobby typeface. And then the apple is actually, the apple itself, very, very light, just a line drawing. And we've still got this element as a sticker and these become kind of counterpoints, the lightness of this to the heaviness of the type. So far we've really been working with fairly simple composition and we've been shifting the focus between typography, color, image and texture. Let's see what happens now if we try and make our composition a little bit more complicated, add more elements and try and, try and deal with all of those things at the same time. 
So here's a totally different poster and now we've got a lot more going on. We've got a two differences in the typography, color in the typography, scale in the typography, we've got a background color and we've got three or four different kinds of image all colliding here. We've got line work, a print with color, photographic image, some texture. We've also got some of our vector based graphic elements and we're trying to put these together into an interesting composition so you can see how the type up here is getting a little bit of space around it, a little bit of emphasis. All of the images are basically melding a little bit into one but there's still some direction in here in our composition these little linear aspects, the circles, the lines happening around here. So this is definitely a, a little bit more complicated than what we'd looked at before. And here's another version, a variation. So you can see we've got a different background color here, some different typography. We're still really looking at the relationships between the linear, the textural. We've got, again, different elements happening here, but way more graphic elements happening. You can see this is starting to have a, a slightly different aesthetic to it than the previous image as well. If we keep going with this one and add more elements, you can see it begins to get a little bit crazy, a little bit more complicated, to the point where we've really got a lot going on and there's kind of a lot of visual noise, a lot of direction happening with the typography, with the shape, framing the type here again different kinds of imagery having things overlap in different ways so our, issue, our problems of composition are, are kind of becoming more complicated and as you work on some of these just as exercises they're really useful because the more elements you put in there the more you have to really think about them and consider them if we go back to our earliest poster that we made there's not that much to consider here because we haven't actually put that many pieces, that many aspects of design into our poster, we don't have many bricks to work with to make an interesting building. Back with this poster you can see we've got a lot to work with and a lot of considerations to make. So it can, can become much more time consuming and a little bit more difficult the more elements that you have. So let's try and make sense of some of those elements now and try and put them into a little bit more of an orderly fashion. As you can see here, we've given some of the elements a little bit more space. We're trying to work a little bit more with hierarchy. And we're also making more clear the directional lines of the composition. So you can see here we're using things like the worm, the line into the negative space here, the line of images clustering together, or even this graphic element contrasting type here in terms of scale but also actually echoing the same angle as well so we're generally trying to make this design feel partly chaotic but also a, a little bit more controlled so if we keep reducing this design down you can see that the individual elements now are a little bit more visible they're also more harmonious our color palette is reduced each of the elements is starting to have a little bit of space around it so they become their own distinct elements so this is starting to feel a little more controlled a little more designed perhaps and again these are really aesthetic decisions you might decide that for a certain kind of music or a certain project you might need a lot of elements and a lot of visual noise a lot going on and for other projects you might need a much more reduced and minimal approach so you can see here as we continue to make this quieter and quieter there's fewer and fewer elements but what that does is it puts more and more emphasis on those few elements so we're really aware of the relationship and the angles between these pieces of type we're really aware of this image just as a, a very light line drawing and we're starting to look down here and really wonder what this kind of shape means because there's only really five things going on so we're going to look quite closely at all five of those. So we can keep removing uh, elements of our composition so here we've literally just got the the two pieces of typography and the most simple Apple image that we could get and a very limited color palette. We've got two blues and a black and those are quite harmonious. The, the light blue could easily be a, a tint of this darker blue and these last few images 
just very very back to our very simple compositions again so we've kind of built up the complexity in this series of posters and then reduced it back down again and here you can see we've got rid of the color background but we've added another image so we're really trying to build a relationship between these two images that might have some kind of meaning and here's the last one that I made where it's really really again quite simple composition we're looking at a very centered composition but now we're looking at a relationship between the color in the typography and the image and I quite like this relationship between the linear apple and the solid apple and a little bit of humor putting an, an emphasis and a focus on the worm coming out of the apple so whenever I do an exercise like this in in composition I tend to generate a lot of things quite quickly and not really care that much about finessing them. You can always make a decision which ones are appropriate, which ones are working, and finesse them later. But what that does give you is a range of works, a range of ideas, a range of aesthetics to look at. So if we look back through some of these things, some of these posters that, that, that we've made quite quickly, even though none of them are, are that great, you can see that they're really giving you a range to decide from and to figure out what kind of designer you want to be and what kind of work you want to make and really getting a, a range of tools so you can decide when you do have a project that requires a, a poster or a piece of graphic design looking a certain way you can really figure out how you want to approach it and, and what kind of design you want to make. Congratulations on completing this Fundamentals of Graphic Design course. I hope the course has helped you in learning about the different components of design practice and given you some hands-on experience of applying those skills. The real goal of this Fundamentals class is to get you to engage with the skills, processes and tools of graphic design and to get you to be excited and enthusiastic about making design and about being a designer. But as the title of the course suggests, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And I hope this course fuels your enthusiasm for learning more about graphic design, for investigating some of the areas we've looked at in a much greater depth, and eventually in a more professional context. And if you are interested in developing your skills further, I think about taking more courses, ones at a higher level that can build upon what you've experienced and learned here. The best way to get better at design is by practice. So my strongest piece of advice as you complete this course is to keep making. You can be designing for a client or for your own fun, but as long as you keep making, you'll keep getting better. So once again, congratulations on completing Fundamentals of Graphic Design. Typography is the practice of manipulating the visual form of language, type, to enrich and to control its meaning. It's a really essential area of skill and knowledge for graphic designers. And that's because typography, as the visual manifestation of language, exists right at the intersection of form making and of communication. Typography encompasses any kind of design that involves type. It can be seen in book and magazine layouts, in posters and flyers, in advertisements, on product packaging, in signage, in motion graphics such as film titles, on the web, in fact the web consists almost entirely of typography, and in the user interfaces of apps and programs. Typography predates modern graphic design by around 500 years. It has enough history, conventions, and esoteric terminology to fill several courses, but at its heart is a relatively finite core of skills and knowledge that can actually be learned fairly easily and which can really go a long way toward improving your ability to work effectively and creatively with type, no matter the application. So in this course, I'm going to introduce you to several dimensions of typography, and also give you opportunities to put the skills you learn into practice through hands-on work with type. Over the next four weeks, we'll look at the qualities of typefaces that determine their character in print. We'll zoom in, analyze the construction of type, and look at how to describe and to measure it. We'll look at the stories behind some of the most influential typefaces, and at the way that history and context imbue typefaces with particular associative meanings. We'll look at how to manipulate the spaces between letters, lines, and blocks of type to create structured and meaningful typographic compositions. 
We'll look at grid systems and typographic hierarchy, and we'll survey the rules and conventions of typesetting that can add professional polish to your work. We'll push beyond conventional typesetting to explore the ways in which type can be manipulated to reinforce, nuance, question, or contradict meaning. And we'll wrap up the course with a peer-assessed assignment in which you'll bring together all your new skills and knowledge to design a fully realized typographic poster. If you've taken Michael Worthington's course, Fundamentals of Graphic Design, some of this may look familiar to you from his unit on typography. There will be some review, but the course will dig a lot deeper, and so I'd really encourage you not to skip any of the lectures. Okay, let's get started. Type is the basic material of typography, but what exactly is type? Well, let's start by sorting out two terms that get confused a lot, font and typeface. This might seem like a nitpicky distinction, but it's a distinction that actually reflects the dual nature of type. On the one hand, type is a tangible thing, a movable kit of pre-designed forms that can be shuffled around to make words. And on the other hand, it's something less tangible a work of design that can be represented and re-represented at many sizes and in many formats. Let's start with the tangible. A font originally referred to one set of metal type. This font is in a California job case, a standard filing system for metal type that has the letters and other typographic elements arranged according to frequency of use, not unlike the way that the keys are arranged on a computer keyboard. So, for instance, you can see that there are a particularly large number of lowercase e's because e is the most common letter in English. Metal type obviously can't be made bigger or smaller or italic or bold. So a font of metal type is just one type design in one style, in one weight, at one size. This is 12-point Bodoni extra bold regular. Movable type like this was first invented in China around 1040 by an inventor named Bi Sheng. It was reinvented 400 years later in Germany in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg. Gutenberg carved his letter forms at actual scale and then cast them in a mixture of metals, mostly lead. He then arranged the cast letters into words and sentences in a lockup, like this one, inked them and pressed them against the paper to make prints. This is the process of letterpress printing. It remained the main technology for setting and reproducing type from its invention in the 1450s up into the 1960s. And even today, a lot of the vocabulary we use to talk about type references letterpress technology. In the 1960s and 70s, metal typesetting was replaced by phototypesetting. A phototype font, like this one, was essentially a slide or film reel of letter forms that was projected in sequence onto photo paper. This is Bookman Medium. Today, a font of type is a .otf or .ttf file stored on your computer. These files contain vector information describing the shapes of the letter forms, and also information about the space between different combinations of letters. So a font is the physical manifestation of type, whether in metal, film, or code. In contrast to a font, typeface describes the visual design of a particular set of letter forms. Typefaces are massive design projects. To create a fully functioning contemporary typeface, a designer must create hundreds and thousands of carefully considered individual drawings. At minimum, typefaces these days include uppercase letters, lowercase letters, numbers, called figures, often in several different styles, fractions and mathematical symbols, punctuation and special characters, accented characters in both upper and lower case, and ligatures, specially drawn combinations of two or more letters. All of these characters must be individually drawn in both regular and italic styles. And both of these styles must be drawn in at least three weights, different degrees of boldness. So typefaces are time-consuming and skill-demanding works of design. And like other works of design, they're protected as intellectual property. In order to use a typeface in a piece of design work, 
you need to have a license to do so. The typefaces that come with our operating system or other software have been licensed for us by the software company. But most other high-quality typefaces must be purchased and downloaded from their designer or distributor in order to be used legally. It can be instructive to look closely at the details of letter forms. But type is usually used at such small scale that these details become invisible. And what really defines the character, the look and feel, the texture of a typeface in actual use is not its details, but some overall qualities of stroke and of proportion. And these qualities are what typographers pay most attention to when they're looking at type. So in this video, we're going to take a look at some of these qualities. The forms of the typographic alphabet emerged from scribes' handwriting in the 15th century. So the lines that form letters are called strokes and are based on calligraphic marks. In some typefaces, you can see this lineage quite clearly. In others, the stroke has been abstracted and rationalized to the point where there is no longer any visible evidence of the human hand. Weight is the thickness of a stroke, and this varies between typefaces and also within type families. Stroke weight contributes to the type's color, how dark or light it appears when set in text. Stroke modulation is how much the thickness of the stroke changes in different parts of the letter. In traditional calligraphy, the brush or pen is held at a constant angle as the letters are drawn, creating a stroke with a lot of modulation. In more mechanical typefaces, modulation is often really low, but our eyes are so accustomed to it that even typefaces with little perceptible modulation are actually subtly modulated. For instance, if we rotate the letter O in the typeface Futura, we see that the stroke is in fact thinner at the top and bottom. In text, typefaces with a more modulated stroke, like the one on the left, appear kind of sparkly on the page, and unmodulated typefaces appear much more even. The modulation of a stroke implies a tilt, or axis, to the letter form. In more calligraphic typefaces, this axis is usually angled, and in more mechanical typefaces, it tends to be vertical. In humanistic typefaces, strokes often end with a little wedge-shaped form called a serif. The presence or absence of serifs divide all typefaces into the categories of serif and sans serif, sans from the French meaning without. And these two styles have quite different textures on the page. Some designers argue that serifs make type easier to read by creating an imaginary line that the type sits on and that guides our eyes along each line of text. And for this reason, serif typefaces are conventionally seen as more appropriate for long bodies of text. Besides qualities of stroke, the overall appearance of a typeface is also determined by its proportions. Some typefaces have narrow and tall, condensed letter forms, while others have squat and wide, extended forms. At small scale, condensed type on the left looks blocky and dense. Extended type looks kind of airy. Another important proportion is what might roughly be described as the size relationship between lowercase and uppercase letters, and this is called the X height of a typeface. The X height is the imaginary line that defines the height of many of the lowercase letters. Typefaces with a large X height, with proportionally larger lowercase letters, like this typeface, look bigger and more even on the page. Typefaces with a small X height, with proportionally smaller lowercase letters, look smaller and more delicate. The typeface with the large X height is on the left in this example. Taken all together, these overall qualities of proportion and of stroke are what really give a typeface its particular appearance at type size. In the last video, we looked at how overall qualities of stroke and of proportion are largely responsible for how a typeface appears in text. But although the details of individual letter forms are usually invisible at small scale, it's still important to look at letters up close and to be able to identify and describe their features. So in this video, we're going to take a look at the anatomy of a letter form. The two fundamental visual elements of a letter form are the stroke, the black part of the letter, and the counter, the white part. 
Because the counter is often bigger than the stroke, some typographers argue that when we read type at small scale, we actually are recognizing the counters of the type rather than the strokes. Roman letters have been around for a long time, so there's a lot of esoteric terminology for describing their different parts. The main vertical part of a stroke is called a stem. The end of a stroke is called a terminal. This rounded kind of terminal is a lacrimal, and this kind is a spur. The rounded counters found in some letters are called bowls. Many of the parts of letters are named after parts of the human body. This is a leg, a shoulder, this part of a G is an ear, the inside counter of an E is an eye, and the center part of an S or other curved letter is a spine. All letter forms are constructed in relationship to a set of invisible lines, or metrics, that define their proportions. The X height, which we've already discussed, defines the height of the main body of lowercase letters. Any part of a lowercase letter form that extends above the X height is called an ascender. The baseline is the line on which the letters sit. Any part of a letter form that extends below the baseline is called a descender. In many typefaces, uppercase letters are actually slightly shorter than ascenders, so their height is defined by a cap height metric. As you can see, curved parts of letters actually extend a little bit above and below the X height and baseline. And this is because from a distance, our eyes see circles as smaller than squares. So curved elements are made larger to compensate. There's much more terminology for describing letter forms, but this will give you enough of a vocabulary to begin to describe and to understand the different features of typefaces. In order to work with type successfully, it's important to know how to measure it and to get a sense of how different type sizes feel in use. You might think type size would be measured by one of the metrics we looked at in the last video, but in fact it's measured by another metric, body. The body of a letter form is an invisible box around it that alludes to the metal block that letters used to be attached to in the days of metal type. Because some typefaces have bigger body sizes than others, two typefaces set in the same point size may appear quite different in size when set in text. The height of a typeface's body is called its point size, and it's measured in points. Points have a direct relationship to inches. There are 72 points in an inch. 12 points make a pica, so there are 6 picas in an inch. Points are abbreviated to PT and picas to P. The notation for 6 picas and 3 points is 6P3. All of this may seem obscure, but it's the standard method of measuring not only type, but the spaces between and around type in a page layout, so it's really important to get a feel for this system. In the days of metal type, letter forms couldn't be scaled dynamically. So fonts were sold in certain standard sizes, chosen for their pleasing relationship to one another. Nowadays, you can set type at any size you like, but these standard sizes still persist as defaults in typesetting software like InDesign because they're a really useful baseline reference point. To get a sense of how these different sizes feel in actual use, it's helpful to divide them up by what functions they often serve in a typographic layout. 120, 96, 72, and 48 point type is quite large and is often used for headlines. 36 and 24 point type is smaller and is often used for subheads. 12, 11, 10, and 9 point type is generally used for text, and for reference, type in a paperback novel is usually set at around 9 points. 8 and 6 point type is small but still legible and is often used for footnotes and other less important information. Besides the absolute measuring units of points and picas, typographers also use a few relative measuring units, mostly to describe horizontal spaces. An M is a horizontal space as wide as the type size is tall, so if you're setting 16 point type, an M space is a space that is 16 points wide. A horizontal space half as wide as an M space is an N space. And there are a bunch of other less common spaces that are some fraction of an M space. 
While it's not essential to have complete mastery of typographic measurements, it is important to have a rough sense of how different type sizes look in practice, especially because most digital typesetting environments don't have a one-to-one -one scale relationship to printed type. Today, there are hundreds and thousands of available typefaces, so the choice of what typeface to use for a project can be overwhelming. There's no magic recipe for choosing type, but in this lecture, we'll look at some of the pragmatic considerations that may inform your choice. Next week, we'll move on to some more nuanced considerations. If you're choosing a typeface to set in text, you may want to start by considering legibility how easy it is to distinguish one letter or word from the next. As I mentioned before, serif typefaces are conventionally seen as easier to read in text than sans serifs, because the serifs help visually define each baseline. If you're setting type at small sizes, say 8 points or below, you may want to look for a typeface with a large X height, like the one on the left here so that the distinguishing features of the letter forms remain relatively big even when the type is set small. If you're choosing a typeface for the screen, X height is even more important, because at small sizes, pixels can blur the details of the type. Typefaces designed especially for the screen, like Georgia, have extra large X heights for this reason. When working for the screen, it's also a good idea to look for a typeface with an open aperture like the one on the top here. This typeface has a wider opening in letters like the lowercase a, c, and e than the typeface on the bottom, so it avoids situations where parts of the letters can start to blur together at small sizes. But when considering legibility, it's also important to keep things in perspective. Legibility is subjective, and the fact is that typefaces with familiar forms are easier to read and those with less familiar forms are harder work. Another practical consideration in choosing type is always availability. Typefaces cost money, some several thousand dollars, and as a designer, you'll probably be working within a budget. If you're designing for the web, availability is even more of a complicated issue. By default, web browsers display type by calling up fonts from the user's computer, and most users are only likely to have a handful of so-called web-safe fonts on their computer. A workaround for designers is to use typefaces hosted externally, either by a free service like Google Fonts, or from a subscription service like Typekit. A final option is to buy a full-blown web license for a typeface, but this can often be really expensive. If you're choosing more than one typeface for a project, you'll want to choose typefaces that go together well. And the trick to combining typefaces successfully is to balance contrast with consistency. Establish contrast by choosing typefaces that are stylistically distinct from one another, like these. Avoid choosing typefaces that are stylistically similar, like these. And remember that even though two typefaces may look quite different at large size, those differences may become invisible in text. To establish a through line of consistency, look for typefaces with similar proportions. Start by comparing the X height of the typefaces. Then compare the shapes of the letters, like the shapes of the O's and of the A's and G's. For a perfect match, consider choosing two typefaces that were designed specifically to go together. This is Scala and Scala Sans, which we'll look at in more detail next week. The pragmatic issues we've looked at here are only some of the considerations involved in choosing a typeface. The rest has to do with the subjective feel of the typeface, as it's often shaped by its history, uses, and associations. And that's what we're going to look at next week. In this lecture, we looked at the pragmatic considerations involved in choosing a typeface. But a typeface's suitability for a particular use 
is determined not only by its functional characteristics, but also by its connotative meaning. No typeface is a neutral transmitter of content. All typefaces carry associations, whether explicit or implicit. Typefaces tell stories, and those stories are often complex and multi-layered. Take, for example, the typeface Fettfraktur. It was designed by a German in the 19th century to reference a handwriting style from the Renaissance. But in the 20th century, it became associated with Nazism, and after the war, it stopped being used for this reason until it was readopted by urban street art styles in Los Angeles in the 2000s. Or take the typeface Neuland, designed by another German in 1923. Neuland was intended to reflect the ideas of the Art Deco style, but in America, it came to be associated extremely problematically with stereotypical depictions of so-called primitive African and African-American aesthetics or Helvetica, a typeface designed in the 1950s with the avowed intention of being completely neutral, but which ironically has become a loaded signifier of American corporate culture and a flashpoint for debate amongst designers. As typographers, it's our job to be aware of and be able to sensitively leverage these stories when we choose and use type to enhance or nuance meaning in our design. To become truly fluent in typographic connotation takes time and experience, but the best place to start is by looking at the history of type. Type has been around since the 1450s and has a much longer history than we can cover here. So in this unit, we're going to focus on six short case studies of influential typefaces. Through these case studies, you'll get a rough outline of the history of type and a sense of how typefaces have been shaped by and have become expressive of different cultural ideas. In our first case study, we're going to look at the story behind an early typeface, today known as Bembo, that was designed in the late 15th century. Before Johannes Gutenberg introduced movable type to Europe, books were handwritten by scribes, many of whom worked in monasteries. These books took a lot of skill and labor to produce. They were rarefied, valuable objects and marks of prestige for their owners. When Gutenberg developed his system of movable type in 1439 and began printing and selling books, it made sense for him to try to simulate the look and feel of these handmade books as closely as possible. So his early typefaces imitated the handwriting style of scribes in Northern Europe. This style was called black letter and it remained popular in parts of Europe into the 20th century. Gutenberg was so intent on simulating human handwriting with his type that he developed dozens of slightly different versions of each letter to try to simulate the irregularities of human handwriting. In the late 1400s, printing technology started moving south from Germany to Italy, and especially to the prosperous port city of Venice. Type designers, or punch cutters as they were called because they carved the letter forms at actual size into the punches used to cast type, started making type that imitated the writing style of Southern European scribes. This writing style was called humanist minuscule, or just Roman script. And as you can see, it's the style of letters that we're most familiar with today. The most influential figure in the Venetian printing scene was Aldus Minutius, a publisher who ran a press called the Aldine Press. Minutius was the first publisher to successfully produce books cheaply and in large quantities for a more mass audience rather than just for elite customers. In around 1495, Minutius commissioned a prominent punch cutter, Francesco Grifo, to create a typeface for his press, and the result was what we now call Bembo. Digital versions of Bembo actually originate from a redrawing of Minutius's design by the American type designer Stanley Morrison in the 1920s. The name is taken from a book of poetry by Pietro Bembo, in which Grifo's typeface was first used. In Minutius's day, books were printed on expensive vellum, animal skin, rather than on paper. In an effort to save money by cramming as much text onto each page as possible, Minutius also commissioned Grifo to draw one of the first italics. Italics were based on another, less formal style of Southern European script. If you carefully compare an italic typeface to a Roman typeface, 
you'll see that there's a lot more difference than just the slanted angle. The shapes of the letters themselves are actually quite different. And in fact, italic type was not initially designed to go together with Roman type. That only happened later. Early Roman-style typefaces from the 15th and 16th century, like Bembo, are often referred to as old-style serif typefaces. This style is characterized by a strong calligraphic flavor. Some common features of old-style typefaces are a tilted axis, bracketed serifs, serifs that have a curved connection to the rest of the stroke, and a small x-type. Because of their age and their association with books, we tend to associate typefaces like Bembo with literature, classicism, and the Middle Ages. In this case study, we're going to look at a typeface designed 300 years after Bembo, in the late 18th century, the late 1700s. It's a design that today is known as Didot. Typefaces like Didot are called Didones, or modern serifs. They're seen as the last stage in a long evolution of traditional Roman book typography, from humanist typefaces that closely imitated handwriting, like Bembo, to rational typefaces that no longer showed any trace of the human hand. So let's take a closer look at these letter forms. Modern serifs have a perfectly vertical axis, very thin, entirely unbracketed serifs, serifs with no curved connection to the stem, and strong modulation, a stroke that is really thin in some places and much thicker in others. The evolution from humanist Renaissance type to these very stark and mechanical forms paralleled and reflected the ideas of the European Age of Enlightenment. In 18th century philosophy, politics, and literature, there was a new interest in empiricism, rationality, and scientific rigor, and type designers were starting to reflect these values in their designs. The first true rationalist typeface was the Roman du Roi, the King's Roman. It was commissioned by Louis XIV in 1692 to be the official typeface of the Royal French Print Office, and it was designed by a committee of designers and engineers rather than by a traditional punch cutter. As you can see, the letter forms were derived from a mathematically precise grid rather than from the organic forms of handwriting. It's also significant that these illustrations of the type are engraved rather than letterpress printed. Engraving and etching were illustration techniques popular at the time that allowed for the printing of very precise, fine lines. And in the 18th century, type designers and printers pushed their craft to try to achieve this fine line aesthetic in letterpress printing. One particularly innovative printer was an Englishman, John Baskerville. He developed innovations in paper and ink making that allowed him to design and print typefaces with much more delicate strokes. In 1757, he designed the typeface Baskerville. Baskerville is known as a transitional serif. It's roughly halfway along the evolution from old style to modern serif. Transitional serifs have a vertical axis, more modulation than an old style serif, but still bracketed serifs. Forty years later, these trends towards rationality and mechanicalness matured in the work of Fermin Didot, a Parisian punch cutter. Today, the most common digital version of Didot's work is a reinterpretation by the 20th century French type designer Adrien Frutiger, and this is the typeface we know today as Didot. Didot is extremely similar to Bodoni, a typeface designed around the same time by Giambattista Bodoni in Italy. Bodoni and Didot were influenced by each other, and both of them were influenced by the work of John Baskerville. Because of their thin, elegant, and minimal forms, Didot and Bodoni were used a lot by American and European fashion publications in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and they're still really closely associated with the world and with the aesthetics of fashion.
At the beginning of the 19th century, traditional Roman book typography had reached a pinnacle of refinement in modern serifs like Didot. But the context in which typography existed was changing. The Industrial Revolution was underway in Western Europe and the United States. People were moving from the country to the cities, taking jobs in factories and offices, buying manufactured goods in department stores, reading newspapers and novels, and typography was the common medium of communication in this new literate urban consumer society. So in this case study, we're going to look at a typeface that came out of this new context, the typeface Clarendon. With the emergence of a literate mass market came all sorts of new uses for type. Instead of just existing in books, type now appeared on posters and flyers, on product packaging, and in advertisements. And these new roles for type demanded letter forms that were larger, bolder, and more eye-catching. Traditional metal type could only get so big before it became too heavy and unwieldy to print with. So it was a real breakthrough when in 1823, an American type manufacturer named Darius Wells developed a process for manufacturing type out of wood. Wood type was a lot lighter than metal type, and it allowed for the design of larger, more complex letter forms. Over the course of the 19th century, type designers and founders, companies that produced type, competed with one another to produce ever more novel and exotic typographic forms. They designed ultra-bold modern serifs called fat faces. They lobbed the serifs off of type altogether to create the first sans serifs. They designed type that looked three-dimensional, and type with patterns, ornaments, and textures incorporated into it. And in the printing of the time, these different type styles were often combined into eclectic compositions designed to shout their message as loudly as possible. One style from this period that has remained popular is what was at the time called Egyptian-style type and is today called slab-serif type. The most successful Egyptian typeface is Clarendon, designed in around 1845 by the English designer Robert Besley. So let's take a closer look. Slab serifs get their name from their thick, block-like serifs. Egyptians, like Clarendon, also have distinctive, ornate-looking terminals on letters like the C, R, and Y in this word, called ball terminals. Slab serifs usually have a vertical axis, and they tend to have a very large X height, which gives them a sturdy, industrial look. So why Egyptian? Well, the 19th century was the age of European imperialism and exploration in Africa and Asia, and there was a popular obsession in Europe with what were perceived as exotic cultures and aesthetics. So the name Egyptian may simply have been an effort to associate the exotic forms of this type style with this romantic fetish for foreignness that was present in Europe at the time. Unsurprisingly, because of their distinctively ornate and exotic forms, and their sturdy industrial construction, slab serifs today conjure up associations with the Victorian era, with industrialism, spectacle, and ornament. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Western world was changing at a disorienting pace. Cities were continuing to expand, railways, airplanes, and automobiles connected people everywhere, telegraphs and telephones allowed for instant communication, economies boomed, and wealthy Western countries aggressively projected their might abroad with newly high-tech militaries. And in 1914, all of this came to a catastrophic head in the outbreak of the First World War. In the world of fine art, movements like Cubism, Expressionism, and later Futurism and Constructivism responded to these changes by rejecting and deconstructing traditional modes of representation and reconfiguring the building blocks of color and form to try to express the spirit of the modern age. In the 1920s, designers applied this new approach to type design. And the result were typefaces that made a really radical break from the 400-year evolution of typographic forms so far. 
The most successful of these typefaces was Futura, designed in 1927 by the German type designer Paul Renner. In the 1920s, the practice we know today as graphic design was in its early nascency. Early practitioners of graphic design, like the Hungarian painter and photographer Moholy Naj, were constructivists. They advocated a rational, functionalist approach to design, which aimed to strip typography of its historical mannerisms and decorative elements, and to use the fundamental properties of form, color, and structure to effectively communicate. This is a page from Painting, Photography, and Film, a book Maholinaj wrote and designed in 1923, and this layout demonstrates Maholinaj's vision for graphic design. In 1928, another influential German designer, Jan Schiekold, summarized the principles of constructivist design as applied to typography in this book, The New Typography. Amongst other things, Schiekold advocated for the use of sans-serif type rather than traditional serif type. He argued that sans-serifs were more functional and less decorative than serifs, and were therefore more appropriate to the modern age. Working at the same time as Maholinaj and Chikold, the type designer Paul Renner sought to apply the ideas of constructivism to type design. He deconstructed traditional letter forms into simple, geometric shapes, and the result, in 1927, was Futura. Futura developed out of a process of experimentation. Renner began with really radical and strictly geometric forms. But as he developed the typeface, he made compromises with the visual conventions of traditional type. For instance, he pinched curved strokes where they intersected vertical strokes to avoid creating dark areas at the intersections. Typefaces like Futura that use minimal geometric forms are called geometric sans serifs. These typefaces generally have an apparently circular O, an almost entirely unmodulated stroke, and letter forms that have been simplified to dispense with many of the traditional features, such as the tail of the T or the hooked top part of the traditional lowercase a. Because of its minimal, almost childish forms, we today associate Futura with simplicity, transparency, and sometimes naivete, but also with the particular context from which it emerged early European modernism. This is the Bauhaus school in Dessau where Maholinaj taught and which is often seen as the cradle of European modernism. After the Second World War in the 1950s, European graphic designers, especially Swiss designers associated with the Basel School of Design, continued to build on the ideas of early modernist designers like Maholinaj and Chikolt. This new school of designers called their approach Neue Graphik, New Graphic Design, and they publicized their ideas in this journal of the same name. The design of the journal showcased their approach. It tried to present its content in as clear, objective, and neutral a way as possible, without ornament or aesthetic flourishes, and using visual principles of hierarchy and spatial organization to make sense of its content. Sans serif type was a big part of the clean aesthetic language of Neue Graphique, but the sans serif typefaces around at the time were pretty crude. They had come out of that period of wild typographic experimentation in the late 19th century, and they hadn't developed much since then. The sans serif typeface favored by the Swiss school designers the one that got closest to the clean look that they were after, was Accidents Grotesque, a German typeface from the 1890s. Sans serif typefaces like Accidents are called Grotesque Sans Serifs. Grotesque Sans Serifs have letters shaped and proportioned really similarly to modern serifs. This is Bodoni at the top for reference. They have a large X height and a fairly unmodulated stroke. Early grotesques, like accidents, are often a little bit crude and uneven looking in their details. They're what designers like to call quirky. So by the end of the 50s, the market was ripe for a new, cleaner sans serif typeface that would work with the increasingly popular Swiss style of graphic design. 
and in 1957, that typeface arrived in the form of Helvetica. Helvetica is a neo-grotesque, or rationalist, sans serif. It's pretty similar to accidents, but its forms are cleaner and more mechanical looking. In the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, the ideas of the Swiss School of Graphic Design became the guiding principles of corporate graphic design around the world. And Helvetica became the ultimate embodiment of this movement. Today, Helvetica still dominates the corporate typographic landscape. It's literally all around us. It's also become a default typeface for signage. And in the digital age, a default in many of the user interfaces we spend so much time staring at. Because of its close connection to the Swiss style of modernist graphic design, Helvetica is also a rather divisive typeface. In 2007, the documentary filmmaker Gary Hustwit set out to make a film about Helvetica and found himself at the center of a debate amongst designers. On the one hand, Helvetica has been embraced by modernist designers as the most perfect expression of the kind of neutral, objective design that they advocate. And on the other hand, it has been reviled by postmodernist graphic designers as embodying a kind of brain-numbing, glossy, corporate sameness. Whatever your opinion, it's clear that Helvetica has become the ultimate default in typography. In the 1980s and 90s, techniques for setting and reproducing type underwent dramatic change. With personal computers, graphic designers no longer had to spec type for typesetting by a third-party typesetter. Now they could own, create, distribute, and manipulate type directly on the screens of their computers. These technical advances coincided with changing attitudes. Many designers were rejecting what they saw as the oppressive sameness of modernist design and were looking with new interest at historical and vernacular typography. And what resulted from the combination of new technical possibilities and new thinking was an explosion of typographic forms. This is part of the typeface catalog of émigré fonts, an early pioneer in digital type. The computer also changed the way type was distributed, allowing for a new crop of small, independent type foundries to begin creating and distributing type. Today, there are more foundries and typefaces than ever. New typefaces today tend to draw from many different sources of historical and contemporary inspiration, while also trying to respond to the particular requirements of contemporary media. In this final case study, we're going to look at one successful contemporary typeface, Scala Sans, designed in 1992 by the Dutch type designer Martin Mayor. Scala Sans falls into a category of type we haven't looked at yet. It's a sans serif, but it has a slightly tilted axis, like an old-style serif typeface. And the shapes and proportions of the letters are also reminiscent of an old-style typeface. The bowl of the A and the I of the E are really small, for instance, and the G has two loops. This style of typeface, sans serif but with many of the qualities of an old-style serif, is called a humanist sans serif. One of the first and best-known humanist sans-serif typefaces was Gill Sans, designed in the 1920s by the British designer Eric Gill. Gill was associated with the arts and crafts movement at the start of the 20th century, and his aim was to reconcile the classic features of old-style serif type with the clean aesthetics of sans-serifs. So Scala Sans references an old-style sans-serif that in turn references older serifs, it also adds the contemporary twist of actually having an old-style serif counterpart, the typeface Scala, designed by Mayor two years earlier in 1990. Scala and Scala Sans have quite different strokes and stylistic flourishes, but the two typefaces share a common structure, or skeleton. Typefaces of different styles that are designed to go together are called superfamilies, and have become increasingly common as type designers seek to meet the needs of contemporary typography. So like many contemporary typefaces, Scala Sans has many influences, both historical and contemporary. And for this reason, its connotations are layered and nuanced. 
It has the warmth of a humanist typeface, but the mechanical look of a rationalist sans serif. Its proportions are classical, but its stylistic features are contemporary. And this mixture of references and associations is really characteristic of contemporary type design. Over the last two weeks, we've taken an up-close look at type. We've looked at both the formal qualities of typefaces and at the meanings and associations they carry with them. This week, we're going to turn our attention to the principles, conventions, and best practices that govern how designers work with type and space. Setting type is a fairly traditional, convention-bound area of graphic design, and it's really important to know how to do it by the book. But know that we will revisit and question some of what we talk about here in the last week of this course. Traditionally, the fundamental objective of setting type has been to give the type a visual form, both in its details and in its overall composition, that supports and elucidates the meaning of the text. There are a number of ways we can achieve this as designers. We can carefully control the spaces in and around letters, lines, and blocks of text so that it's really easy and unconfusing for our eyes to navigate the type. We can visually reflect the organizational logic of the text by using space semantically, by grouping things that go together, for instance, and separating things that don't. We can create hierarchy, visually reflecting what content is most essential so that a reader can easily appraise themselves of the most important points of information. And we can apply the traditional conventions and rules of typesetting, to make type as smooth, refined, and semantically correct as possible. There's a lot to cover here, but unlike other more abstract aspects of design, it's all really learnable stuff, and it can have a really dramatic effect on the refinement of your work. Typography is as much about shaping the space between and around letters, words, and blocks of text as it is about shaping type itself. In typography, there are terms for different kinds of spaces, and there are principles that govern how these spaces should relate to one another. So let's take a closer look at typographic space. The spacing of letters relative to one another in a typeface is called letter spacing. Type designers program letter spacing directly into the font file, and generally they aim to make the spaces between letters balanced with the spaces within letters. Adding or subtracting space between the letters in a word, sentence, or paragraph in typesetting is called tracking. If you're setting type at small sizes, like 9 points or below, adding a little bit of tracking, say 10 or 20 units, can help make the letters more clearly legible. But at large sizes, too much tracking will make a word start to visually disintegrate, because the letters aren't close enough to one another to stick together as a word. In fact, if you're setting a large title, you may want to set negative tracking to bring the letters even closer together than their native letter spacing. One place where extra tracking is always appropriate is in setting all uppercase type. Because uppercase letters usually appear next to lowercase letters, they're designed with the tighter spacing of the lowercase. So when you set them with one another, you need to add tracking, a good 20 to 50 units. Adjusting the spacing between two particular letters, regardless of the overall tracking, is called kerning. Kerning is sometimes necessary when you have two letters that fit together awkwardly. In this word, because of the shapes of the uppercase A and the V, there is some distracting extra space between these two letters. So we'll kern them to be closer together. Typefaces these days are pre-programmed with kerning for problematic letter combinations, so manually kerning is rarely necessary. The space between lines of type in a paragraph, the space from one baseline to the next, is called leading. The name comes from the strips of lead that used to be placed between lines of type in letterpress printing. A particular setting of type is described as a combination of type size and leading. A common setting for text in books, for instance, is 9-point type with 12 points of leading. 
This is described as typeset 9 over 12, and it's written like this. There's no easy rule to determine proper letting, but the principle is to set the lines of type far enough away from one another that our eyes can clearly distinguish between them, but still close enough together that we see the paragraph of type as a single block and not as a collection of disconnected floating lines. In this typesetting, there's too little letting. It's hard for our eyes to follow along a line without getting it confused with the one above or below. And in this paragraph, there's probably too much letting. The lines are really distinct from one another, but the paragraph is no longer holding together as one visually cohesive chunk. The X height of the typeface you're setting affects the letting. Because typefaces with big X heights look visually larger than typefaces with small X heights, they need more letting. Here, both typefaces are set 9 over 12, but the typeface on the right, with a smaller X height, feels like it has more letting. Another factor in this matrix of spatial relationships is line length. Line length is measured by the average number of letters that fit on a line. A good line length is long enough that your eye doesn't have to keep starting new lines every few words, but short enough that when you come to the end of one line, you're close enough to the start of the next to be able to find it easily. 66 characters per line is often seen as a sweet spot for line length, but up to 80 characters still works, and down to 40 for narrower columns of text also works. So how does line length affect letting? Well, if your lines are longer, you may need more space between them in order to help the reader's eyes follow along them. A final variable is text alignment. When text is aligned on the left side and not on the right, it's referred to as left aligned. The advantage of setting type this way is that it allows the typeface's native letter spacing and word spacing to be preserved unaltered. The disadvantage is that it creates an uneven edge along one side of the text called a rag. And in a future video, we'll look at how this rag can be manipulated to make it as visually pleasing as possible. An alternative to left-aligned text is justified text, text that has been aligned on both the left and right sides. The advantage of setting type like this is that it creates even edges on both sides. But the disadvantage is that word spacing and or tracking have to be altered in order to make longer lines shorter and shorter lines longer. And this breaks up the lines of text, creating vertical channels through the paragraph, and has to be compensated for by increasing letting. So as you can see, the variables that define typographic space, tracking, letting, line length, and alignment, all affect one another. So as a typographer, it's important to be really aware of all of these spatial relationships when you're working with type. In the last video, we looked at the spaces within a piece of set type. In this video, we're going to zoom out a bit and look at the spaces between and around pieces of set type within a composition. A piece of typography is both form, a visual element with shape, texture, figure and ground and direction, and language, an expression of thought with grammar, syntax, and rhythm. As typographers arranging type and space, we have to consider both the way that space affects composition and the way that it affects meaning. We have to train our eyes both to see space and to read space. Let's start with the reading part. The spatial principle that most directly affects the meaning of text is the principle of proximity. We tend to read things that are closer together as related, and things that are further apart as less related. Here, it's unclear how we're supposed to read the second line of text, 1850 to 1900, because it's positioned ambiguously halfway between the title and the text. If we nudge it up a bit, we now read it as related to the title, as a subtitle. So we read that this article is about typography between the years 1850 and 1900. If we move the same line down, it now reads as related to the paragraph below it, as a section header. So now we read that this article is about typography in general, and that this first section of the article is about the years 1850 to 1900. When you're positioning type like this, it's a good idea to use distances that relate to your letting. 
For example, you might make this distance two times the letting and this distance five times the letting. It's really difficult to overstate the importance of this kind of close attention to spacing. It's often the difference between clear typography and confusing typography. This timeline of typefaces, for instance, is really confusing because it's not clear what information is related to what. By changing the vertical spacing, we can fix a lot of the problem. Playing with the horizontal spacing, we can further improve it. And now it's clear, for instance, that both Helvetica and Universe were designed in the year 1957. We also use space, either horizontal or vertical, to signal syntactical divisions in text, like paragraph breaks. And the traditional way to do this is with an indent. The depth of an indent is often set to 1m, the size of the type, or to the size of the letting. Indents are used to mark the division between two paragraphs of text, so the first paragraph of a body of text with nothing in front of it should not be indented. You can also signal paragraph breaks with a white line, a vertical space the size of the letting. But you should never use both a white line and an indent, because both mean the same thing. Zooming out, the same principles of proximity apply to the arrangement of typographic elements in a composition, such as a page spread. Here, the small paragraph on the left reads as related to the larger one, as a note, perhaps, about something that's mentioned in the larger paragraph. Here, positioned further away, it reads as less related. In this arrangement, the paragraphs of text read as a single connected narrative, because they're flowed one after the next. Whereas here, they look like there may be four entries on four different topics. In these examples, I'm representing type as a series of lines. The old term for this is greeking. It's used in sketching out layouts, but it also helps us switch modes from reading the type to seeing it as abstract form. In this mode, we can apply some of the fundamental principles of formal composition to our layout. We can create contrast. For instance, we can make some type small, light, and tracked out, and other type large, bold, and tightly tracked. We can consider compositional direction. This composition, for instance, has a horizontal emphasis, whereas this one feels more vertical. And finally, we can consider the relationship between positive space and negative space. Here, the negative space is just a frame surrounding the typography, which feels kind of static. But here, I've moved things around so that the negative space is a more interesting, more energetic shape. As you can see, it's not easy to create a typographic composition that both reads well and looks good. But it's this challenge that makes composing type really rewarding and interesting. One way you can make a typographic composition look refined is to define a structure for the space of the page or screen, and then to align elements in the composition to this structure. And in typography, this structure is called a grid. People have been using grids of one kind or another since the earliest days of printing and before. In traditional Chinese manuscripts, for instance, text is arranged in columns of equal width, and each character takes up a perfectly square space within its column. In medieval Europe, the pages of books were sometimes laid out with margins that were defined by the golden ratio, a special mathematical proportion. Scribes and later typesetters often used systems of lines to measure out these margins. And notice that this system creates margins that are of different widths at the top, bottom, left, and right of the page, and this creates a composition with a dynamic rather than a static feel. The proportion of the golden ratio, roughly 1.618, continued to inform typographic composition in the 20th century. Jan Chikol, the German typographer who advocated for sans-serif type in the 1920s, studied medieval manuscripts and often applied the golden ratio to his compositions. In this poster from 1938, for instance, Chikol arranged elements in relationship to a structure based on that ratio. 
In the mid-20th century, designers of the Neue Graphik movement in Switzerland refined the use of grids to create highly organized visual structures. Here's a poster by Joseph Muller Brockman from 1955. And here's a page spread from Neue Graphik, the publication. Defining and using a grid can help you create compositions that feel visually refined. Grids are particularly useful in publications where they can help each spread feel like it belongs with the next. So let's look at the elements of a classic page grid. Margins define the borders of the main printed area of the page. If you're setting up margins for a book, it's important to remember that the inside margin corresponds to the spine, so depending on how the publication will be bound, it's a good idea to make that margin pretty generous. Some layouts use a hang line, a point on the page where, for instance, text in new chapters might begin. Large format publications often use multiple columns so that line length can be kept reasonable. And often those columns are in turn subdivided so that the designer has the flexibility to create text blocks of different widths, some spanning several columns. The space between columns is called a gutter, and often the width of the gutter is set to the size of the type's letting. Finally, a baseline grid can be used to make sure that the lines of text in adjacent columns or on succeeding pages line up with one another, and the interval of these lines will be defined by the leading of the type. Today, grids are almost everywhere that typography is. On the web, they're often actually built into the CSS. A popular website grid like the one used by this site on grid systems is 960 pixels wide, with 6, 12, or 16 columns across. Grids are a really useful tool. Still, if they're used incorrectly or just too much, they can limit and constrain your compositions. So I'd recommend always starting compositions without a grid. And then, once you've figured out what you want to do, go back and reverse engineer a grid that will help you refine alignments and make distances consistent. And always remember that there are plenty of instances where a grid may not be necessary or even appropriate at all. So far, we've looked at how to use space to organize and structure typography. In this video, we'll look at how visual hierarchy can further clarify and structure our type. A hundred years ago, the front page of a newspaper looked like this. Today, it looks more like this. Both layouts are cluttered, but the contemporary newspaper is much easier and more inviting to read. And that's mostly because this newspaper does a better job of establishing typographic hierarchy. In the old newspaper, all of the information on the page looks similar. The only way to read this paper is to start at the top and work your way down, not very convenient if you just want to get a quick sense of the day's events. By contrast, in the contemporary newspaper, different kinds of information look different from one another, with some kinds of information more visually prominent than others. So we can glance at this paper and read just the headlines, or we can glance at an article and quickly find the page number reference. So typographic hierarchy is the strategy of making different kinds of content look different, and reflecting the relative importance of different content with styling. The key to effective typographic hierarchy is to make each type style look clearly distinct from the last, even when working within a limited palette of typefaces. And we can do this by deploying the stylistic variables of typeface, style, size, weight, color, and setting. As an example, let's style these two paragraphs the one on the left as important text, and the one on the right as less important text. We'll start by changing type size, making the type on the left larger and the type on the right smaller. Then we'll change style. We'll make the right-hand paragraph italic. We'll change color, making the less important paragraph lighter. And then we'll change the typeface weight. Let's make the type on the right bold so it's a little more visible. To further differentiate the two styles, we'll change the letting. We'll make the paragraph on the left looser and the paragraph on the right tighter. And finally, we'll differentiate the typeface itself. 
will make the type on the right a sans serif. Now we have two styles that are immediately recognizable as different from one another, and also read as of different levels of importance, while still appearing somewhat cohesive because of the typeface pairing. If I apply this strategy to the example of the typeface timeline from a few videos ago, you'll see that I can add a further level of clarity. Now, because all the designer's names are styled in a distinct way, for instance, I can quickly pick out that category of information from the other content. As with spacing, it's hard to exaggerate the importance of well-executed hierarchy in creating typography that is inviting and can easily be accessed and parsed by a reader. Now that we've looked at the visual principles that govern typesetting and typographic composition, we're going to switch our attention to the conventions, the rules, of proper typesetting. Like the spatial and organizational principles we've looked at so far, these conventions straddle aesthetics and syntax. They're part form, part grammar. We'll start by looking at line breaks. Ideally, each line should break in a place that doesn't interrupt its rhythm. If a word needs to be broken with a hyphen, it should be broken between syllables, and it should never be broken into a chunk smaller than three letters long. One or two letter words shouldn't be left hanging at the end of a line, because visually our eyes will tend to disassociate them from the rest of the text, so they should be dropped down to the next line. Similarly, single words or parts of words shouldn't be left on their own at the bottom of a paragraph. You can fix this issue by playing with the line breaks in the preceding lines. Nor should single lines of a paragraph be left stranded on their own. The first line of a paragraph alone at the bottom of a page is called an orphan. The last line of a paragraph alone at the top of a page is a widow. As you'll remember, the right, uneven side of a block of left-aligned text is called a rag. It's uneven by nature, but it's most pleasing visually when it's uneven in an even way, like a comb. A rag that is too even is distracting because it's almost straight, but not quite. And a rag that is too uneven is distracting because it makes distinctive shapes. In InDesign, you can try to achieve a good rag by tweaking the hyphenation settings and line length, but usually you'll end up, as designers say, doing the rag manually creating line breaks with soft returns and hyphens. If you're setting justified text, the same rules regarding line breaks apply. In fact, justified text is even trickier to line break because of the danger of creating rivers of white space. Besides breaking words to create line breaks, hyphens are also used in compound words like left wing or pre-owned. Other kinds of dashes serve other functions. N dashes are longer than hyphens. They're one N long, which is half an M. And they're used to signal a range and appear anywhere you might use the word to. For example, July to August, or six to seven feet. M dashes are longer still, one M long. These dashes are used like commas to set a phrase apart in text. M dashes are also used to attribute a quote to a speaker. Incorrect use of dashes is one of those common typographic errors designers love to point out. Another is the confusion of foot and inch marks with quotation marks. As you can see, they're actually quite different. Foot and inch marks are wedge-shaped. Single and double quotation marks are curved and come in left-right pairs. In InDesign, there's an option to turn on smart quotes, which automatically puts the correct marks around quotations. Most contemporary text typefaces have four different kinds of numbers, or figures. The figures we're most used to seeing are lining figures. Like uppercase letters, lining figures start at the baseline and end at the cap height metric. A more traditional form of figures are old style figures. Like lowercase letters, these figures have ascenders and descenders. It's easy to remember when to use which kind of figures. Lining figures should be used whenever uppercase letters are used, such as in titles, and old-style figures wherever lowercase letters are used, like in text. Figures also often come in both proportional and tabular versions. 
Proportional figures are space like any other character, with some characters taking up more space and others less. By contrast, tabular figures are monospaced, meaning that each figure takes up the same horizontal space as the next. Tabular figures are useful in charts and mathematical equations, where you need the figures to line up vertically. Just as figures come in a version for text and a version for titling, so too do capital letters. Capital letters meant for setting in text are called small caps. They have the shape of normal capitals, but their height is close to the x height of the lowercase. You use small caps anywhere all capitals appear in text, such as in acronyms. The exception is people's initials, which always appear in uppercase capitals. Another set of characters designed to give text a smooth appearance are ligatures, two letter forms that are linked together as one character. Most typefaces include these basic ligatures, but some also include others. All of these conventions may seem esoteric, but when combined with the spatial and organizational principles we've discussed in the last few videos, they'll add a final degree of professional polish to your typography. The approach we took to typography last week was largely denotative. Our objective was to create typography that presented its content as clearly and efficiently as possible. But as we saw a couple weeks ago when we looked at the connotative meaning of typefaces, it's really impossible to use type without adding a layer of suggested meaning. And it's the job of the designer to be aware of and in control of this additional meaning. In fact, the most compelling typography often happens when the designer takes bold steps to activate the expressive potential of type, to use typographic treatment to reinforce, nuance, or challenge the content of the text. So this week, we're going to explore the possibilities of expressive typography. Unlike in traditional typesetting, there are no best practices governing expressive type. Instead, this kind of typography emerges from a process of experimentation, and its success is measured by its effectiveness in conveying a certain meaning. The possibilities for how to shape type to express meaning are really endless. At the most basic level, we can manipulate the variables of type, face, weight, size, style, and setting to suggest meaning. More dramatically, we can use typographic composition to suggest movement, action, or atmosphere. Finally, we can take the type as visual material, radically manipulating or abstracting the actual forms and texture of the letters to create dramatic, meaningful effect. Since the 1980s and 90s, the graphic design program at CalArts has been well known for an emphasis on experimental and expressive forms of typography. So we're going to wrap up this unit by peeking into the CalArts poster archive and looking at student work that demonstrates the breadth of approaches to designing with type. That peak will give you some inspiration as you tackle the final peer-assessed assignment in this course, a fully-fledged typographic poster with both expressive and denotative elements. Over the last two weeks, we've seen how typeface choice, composition, and typesetting not only determine the aesthetics of a piece of typography, but also shape its meaning in subtle ways. In this video, we're going to go a step further and look at how the tools of typesetting can be used to dramatically express meaning through type. In traditional typography, the objective has usually been to present the text in as elegant, legible, and efficient a way as possible. Typographic styles have historically reflected the conventions of the time period more than they have the content of the text. But since the start of the 20th century, artists and designers have experimented with ways of using typography expressively. In 1916, for instance, the French surrealist poet Guillaume Apollinaire published this concrete poem. The poem is about rain, and its typographic form expresses this as much as its content does. This book, from around the same time, by the Italian futurist Filippo Marinetti, sets out to capture a visceral sense of war through dramatic typographic compositions. 
and in this book, a mid-century typographic interpretation of a play by Eugene Ionesco. Typographic compositions express the tone and pace of the dialogue, progressing from subdued to frenetic. While expressive typography was sometimes at odds with the functionalist outlook of mid-20th century graphic design, it made a comeback in the 1980s and 90s. This is a poster for a theater company by the American designer Paula Scher. Today, the consensus amongst designers is that there's a time and a place for typography like this. It might be appropriate for a poster or book cover, but it's probably not appropriate for a science textbook. There are infinite ways to shape the meaning of text through typographic treatment. At the most basic level, we can manipulate meaning by using the variables of typeface, size, style, color, and arrangement, the same variables we use to create hierarchy. By way of example, I'm going to style the title of this film, an action movie about fast cars. I'll start by changing the typeface to something squarer and more industrial something that connotes machines. Then I'll change the weight to something super bold so that it feels tough and aggressive. I'll change the type to all caps to look even more aggressive. And I'll make it italic to look like it's leaning forward to connote speed. To convey more of a sense of horizontal movement, I'll break the title into two lines and offset them horizontally. This looks pretty good, but maybe it feels too conventional. So I'll try to differentiate the two words in the title. I'll make fast smaller and lighter and track it out, so it feels even more nimble and speedy. Now Furious looks too prominent, so I'll try to restore some balance by making it a little lighter, and I'll make the ampersand smaller so it gets less emphasis. Of course, if I were setting the title to a different film, or TV show in this case, I'd be trying to convey a different set of meanings. This show is about a traditional wealthy family in Britain at the start of the 20th century, so I'll choose a traditional British typeface, Baskerville. I'll set it in all caps, in this case because that looks more formal. And I'll choose a center-aligned stacked arrangement because that's a traditional way to set title type. I'll tweak it a little to create more visual interest. I'll make Downton slightly bolder and larger, and Abbey slightly smaller and lighter. In reality, there are few subjects that clearly suggest a particular type treatment like these do. In most cases, as the designer, you'll need to make a decision about what ideas or concepts you want to pull from the content and express through the type treatment. And this is really a form of authorship. Zooming out from a single title to a full composition, we can revisit the idea of compositional gesture from last week but now with an eye toward making the gesture expressive. We can create a composition that suggests horizontal movement, like in this poster about canal boats, conjuring up the slow movement of the boats along the water. Or a composition that feels vertical, like in this poster for a conference in Shanghai, a city known for its skyscrapers. We can make a composition that's a vortex. Here, in this poster from the 1920s, the vortex gesture expresses the dizzy feeling of being in the bustle of a modern city. Or a composition that is random and scattered, perhaps suggesting chaos or something organic like these flies. Or in the opposite extreme, we can create a gridded and orderly composition, like Armin Hoffman, the mid-century Swiss designer, has done in this poster about formal principles. There's no formula here for exactly what compositional gesture or what typographic style will best express a particular meaning, but that doesn't mean that designers are off the hook. Typography is always about communication, and a piece of expressive type is only successful if it is able to clearly convey its intended message to an audience. In the last video, we looked at the way that the conventions of typesetting and composition can be put to the service of expressing meaning. But we can also go beyond conventional typesetting altogether and approach type not as text to be typeset, but as formal material to be composed, manipulated, or rendered in any number of ways. In this video, I'm going to give you a taste of what's possible 
by showing you a bunch of examples of atraditional and experimental typography. Sometimes breaking a rule of typesetting in a controlled way can be poetic. In this book cover, for instance, the designers have created uneven spaces in the title, arranging the words in a way that draws attention to the symmetry between a man and a woman. In this cover, for a book on architecture, the title is broken up with stretched dashes, turning it into a shape reminiscent of an architectural structure. And in this cover, for a book on the British sculptor Antony Gormley, the letters of the title are stacked vertically, referencing the formal characteristics of Gormley's vertical steel sculptures. Beyond breaking rules like this, designers can also manipulate the forms of the letters themselves. Armin Hoffman often manipulated or arranged type to create compelling abstract forms in his posters. In the 1960s, designers like the Spanish-American Victor Moscoso used really abstracted type in their event posters, demanding that readers spend time actively decoding their messages. And this visual strategy mirrored the dense and opaque style of the psychedelic music that these posters were advertising. These days, we can directly manipulate the vector lines of type in design software. These posters by the Norwegian-American design studio Nonformat use type that has been manipulated to create a sense of energy and flux. The technology of reproduction can also inspire typographic experimentation. In the 1990s, the American art director David Carson created a distinctive typographic style for Ray Gun magazine by cutting up type and layering it with a Xerox machine. The rough, scrappy aesthetic captured the feel of the grunge music documented in the magazine. Modern screen-based media can be a little rough around the edges, too, and in contemporary art and design, there's a fascination with digital glitches. These are typographic illustrations for Wired magazine by the British typographer Craig Ward. But of course, type has its origins in human handwriting, and many typographers have returned to the hand as a way to infuse type with human expression. The Swiss designer Nicholas Troxler, for instance, is well known for his posters for jazz music events, many of which use hand lettering to capture the loose, improvisational character of the jazz music. In contrast to Troxler, the typographic work of the Dutch artist and designer Hansje van Hallem is painstakingly detailed and ornate, while still feeling organic. And here at CalArts, the American artist and designer Ed Fella is known for his eccentric hand-drawn interpretations of American vernacular typography. Today, we designers have so many tools at hand, digital and analog, that we can make type out of just about anything. Paul Elliman, a British designer and artist, makes typefaces out of found objects. Craig Ward uses a mixture of photography and digital software to create exotic type treatments that dramatize their subject matter. The Dutch poster designer Michiel Sherman creates spectacular abstracted typography using digital software. In a lot of this kind of work, type moves from being a flat mark on the page to being a tangible thing, and some designers have pushed this to its limit, taking type off the page altogether and into three-dimensional space. This is a series of typographic experiments by the Austrian-American designer Stefan Sagmeister. The conceptual artist Jenny Holzer brings type into space in a different way, by projecting it at large scale onto its surroundings. In her work, there's often a fascinating dialogue between the typography and its physical environment. Not all of these examples will be relevant to your work, but I hope that they will show you the breadth of what's possible with type and encourage you to think beyond the conventions of classical typography. In the final peer-assessed assignment in this course, you'll be asked to design a fully-fledged typographic poster. So in this final video, we're going to look at some examples of typographic posters and talk about how the concerns of typography, from typeface selection to composition to hierarchy to typesetting, can be creatively resolved to produce a compelling piece of design. 
These examples are all hand screen printed student posters taken from the CalArts poster archive. So they'll also give you a taste of CalArts' tradition of experimental typography. This poster for a performance of Maori Polynesian music has a very straightforward composition, but the type treatment, outlined in colored letters from the typeface organda, gives the poster interest and also subtly references traditional Polynesian visual art. This poster for a lecture by the Korean artist Biam Kim is dominated by the large Hongul characters of the artist's name. The designer has used these characters to divide up and define the space of the poster, creating a four-square grid that the rest of the type can live inside. And this use of large display type to define an overall composition can be a really useful trick when designing a poster. In this example, the title type, made of custom-drawn dimensional letters, makes a diagonal staircase-like gesture across the composition. One challenge you may encounter is how to create secondary type, like the date and time information here, that go well with the title type without just duplicating the title treatment. Here, the designer has tracked out the secondary type, creating a subtle staircase-like effect amongst the letters that relates neatly to the title. This poster for a visiting dance company has a really strong spiraling gesture. Again, the title type establishes the overall structure of the composition. Pay attention here to how the smaller type works with and reinforces the gesture. Company and a history are set on a curved baseline. The date and time are set on an angle. And the subsidiary information is arranged in a paragraph whose overall shape suggests movement. Each of these treatments is unique, but all of them reinforce the compositional gesture. Also notice how clearly the typographic hierarchy is defined here, proceeding from the most important information, the title, down to the least important, the ticket pricing. In contrast to the fluid gesture of the last poster, this poster has a rigid, gridded structure that's echoed by the title type treatment, another custom typeface that's very rectilinear and mechanical looking. Here again, the secondary type is set in a pretty conventional way, but its arrangement reinforces the compositional gesture of the poster. Here, the title typography pushes into the realm of abstraction. The letters are fragmented, duplicated and offset, outlined and scattered around. To aid with legibility, the title and subtitle reappear in a more conventional setting in the lower left of the poster. Duplicating the title like this is a perfectly acceptable move when legibility is a concern. In this final example, a poster for a lecture on political theory, the designers have created an organic handmade aesthetic. The compositional gesture is scattered and chaotic. The title type is made of linoleum cut letters and the secondary type is handwritten. But even within this chaotic aesthetic, hierarchy is clearly established by the varying size and handwriting style of the text. When you design your poster, your particular subject matter and the constraints of the brief will shape what design decisions are appropriate in your case. But these examples will hopefully give you a sense of what to think about as you start to get to work. Most importantly, have fun and don't be afraid to experiment. Hello, and welcome to Introduction to Image Making. I'm Gail Swanlin, a graphic designer and faculty at California Institute of the Arts. The emphasis of this course is process, and I want to encourage you to sincerely devote serious time and intellectual energy to making. As you know, the time you put in is just yours for your own intellectual and creative life. Why would you want to take this course? One reason might be to spark new ways of making images, or to meet with serious makers and show them what you've been working on, to give and receive knowledgeable and constructive input, or perhaps just to make something to look at for purely poetic and aesthetic reasons. Or it may be such that you just don't know, or maybe won't for a long, long time. But one evening, you'll be looking up at the moon and you'll know. Any of these aspirations and reasons are perfect. 
This is a graphic design course. So the images you'll make are intended to live in a graphic design context. That means with words. That combination is what gives graphic design its beauty and power. That really doesn't mean that any of your images might also live in an art or illustration context too, but we'll mostly talk about how these things are being made and composed in a graphic design -y way. The first two weeks are intended to be exploratory and experimental, and we'll be devoting our time to making images in a variety of ways. The focus will be on working in a generative way rather than seeking an end result. Meaning and communication won't be the primary focus, although, to be honest, every image does communicate or convey connotation, associations, and expressiveness. Making, and making a lot of images in a variety of different ways, is what we'll pursue. Everyone has a natural, intuitive way of putting things together. Each of us has a personal way of making things work. And in week three, we'll invite the images to deliberately and intentionally carry meaning and communication through relational moves like juxtaposition, hierarchy, and context. The work of week four will be wrangling the spreads into a book using the images you've made. During this course, we'll make and look at images intended to instigate or tell a story, evoke, experiment, record, explain, and in doing so, try out a variety of medias and ways of composing your images. But most of all, you'll just want to jump in and start making images. Practice is a kind of sincere devotion. Suppose for a moment that it's a way of leaving messages for your future self. Consider the act of drumming, the rhythm and the patterns, the sticks in the hand and the strike, breathing and listening and concentration. This kind of discipline creates muscle memory. But even more so, this internal sensitivity and familiarity with the craft opens up and sparks invention and improvisation. Any kind of regular practice makes way for discoveries, and subtlety and imaginative nuance will follow. In this course, consider how you might make creative activity and close observation part of your own daily rhythm. For instance, I have a daily practice of sketching while having a cup of coffee first thing in the morning. You could do something like that, or keep a field notebook to record observations in a visual way, to make quick sketches of things you see, or paste in things you find or collect, or jot down ideas. It's also really great to draw from life whenever you have a moment, to sit and observe and commit a line and interpretation to paper. Start your own drawing league or take a drawing class. Spend time intently observing. Go outside whenever possible. Our eyeballs record what we see, or believe we see, soaking up what is before us in a flash, delivering an image to our brains. Measurable, quantifiable features like color, shape, size, and position are sorted out at lightning speed, seemingly without us giving much thought to this astonishing maneuver. Simultaneously, we interpret an image based on a colossal bulk of personal experiences, generally agreed upon ideas, expertise, and incredibly specific knowledge. An image might look like its real-life counterpart or not. It may communicate or convey information, or stand in for or symbolize thoughts and ideas. It may resonate in a personal way or is intended to influence thought, sentiment, and mood, behaviors, and beliefs, like, for instance, propaganda. Images may even bring about chemical reactions in the viewer's brain. In our hypersaturated commercial imagescape, overexposure provokes little or nothing. Or the image may be decorative or consist wholly of embellishment. And if little light falls on the image, do we still perceive the colors, the luminescence reflecting to our eyes in the same way? We formulate an initial response to an image, to the subject itself, or we might infer something expressive from the way the image is made, its intonation, style, or intensity. Images may be recognizably three-dimensional, or abstracted, flattened, distorted, or just a shorthand notation. We read meaning, or rather, form a perception, based on context or an image's relationship to other elements, its relative size, placement, or importance. 
Our reeds are not stable nor fixed, and once we release an image into the world, we cannot control how it is perceived. In graphic design, text and images are brought together, and the graphic designer adjusts the relationship among the elements to release new perception and meaning. Truly, the convergence of words and pictures changes everything. Images may be used straightforwardly to illustrate or interpret text, to deliver information, to make the words clearer or not, to confound and disorient, or vice versa. Placing text and image together creates associations. It can deliver messages or influence, promote, or give rise to that poetic moment that makes life worth living, or undertake a multitude of other functions. Roland Barthes writes, Formerly, the image illustrated the text, made it clearer. Today, the text loads the image, burdening it with a culture, a moral, an imagination. This is important. Graphic design is powerful. You are tasked with using your power wisely. As you know, this is a graphic design course. So yes, while a lot of our activity will be devoted to making and creating images, the ultimate intent of this course is for you to invite the images to perform in a graphic design context. To that end, we'll be composing spreads, juxtaposing and deliberately organizing your images into layouts, and making a book. When we start composing your images on pages and two-page spreads, that is the precise moment where graphic design magic occurs. Because as soon as you place an image on a page or in proximity to one or many other images, you're creating a relationship that contributes to intentional meaning mood, and context. Consider then the possibilities for complex narrative and communication when you have multiple two-page spreads bound together in a book. What sort of read or meaning is released when you turn the pages from one to the next? In other words, the resulting book is a container that will show off your great images in a finished format. And since this is, above all, a graphic design project, Images are deliberately contextualized and juxtaposed to create relationships, narratives, and conversations between images through proximity, pacing, and sequence. Within your book, you will create surprise and mood, give the assembled images a holistic arc, and create formal compositions using visual contrast. The result of your assignment and experiments may generate something completely unknowable now or in the future. And that's the goal. There's just no other way to make things and try out new, impossible, or inventive processes without just making and generating a lot. This week, I'm encouraging you to just jump in and start making. Through making, you become more familiar with your subject. If you selected an animal as your subject, study and note what features make it distinct and recognizable. Look at its gait, how it eats and drinks and rests. Consider a range of ways to represent the animal. What would be the most minimal gesture or detail or defining characteristic that could suggest the whole without literally showing it? Attempt a range of styles from simple to complex, representational to abstracted. Make some black and white images or use color. Try out brushy or scratchy, loose and then tightly rendered. Experiment with collaging or ready-mades. Some images may be made relatively quickly, while others may require setup time or might be more labor intensive. The point of experimenting with a range of making things is to open up possibilities and generate a lot of images. As an image maker, make representations that belie your own expectations. Set up situations that intentionally inspire you to see things from a different or unusual perspective. Try out a variety of things that make marks and adopt a range of techniques while continuing to work with materials you are familiar with, too. Be adventurous and don't fret so much about making a finished image all the time. Spend some time redoing and refining select images. And most of all, keep making.
Denotation and connotation are twin terms used when talking about meaning. Denotation refers to the direct or explicit meaning of a word or sign or image. The term connotation is defined as a perceived association or a secondary meaning in addition to its primary meaning. We're accustomed to reading and interpreting images, and our impressions are influenced by our own personal experiences, subcultures, pop cultures, political convictions, conventions, emotions, and so forth. And so, you might say that this drawing of a giraffe is very restrained and neutral, and its primary meaning is giraffe. Without reading too much into the image, we can list what makes up the drawing. A controlled etched line, black and white, a complete side view, with each limb and tail visible. The figure offers an optimal perspective for identifying giraffes, and that it is that it's isolated from the background suggests that it might be a natural history drawing printed in a book intended for study. The drawing is close to realistic, and while it's a restrained representation of a giraffe, the unique calligraphic hand of the artist is unmistakable. And if you were a scholar of such drawings, you would recognize this particular artist's work. And the attitude of the pose, the way the giraffe stands, its tongue out and tail swishing, suggests vitality. Here are several other giraffe drawings showing the same side view and done in a variety of materials and mediums and in a range of representational styles. The expressive quality and mood of each drawing is very distinct, and we could do a straightforward read on each. But to go further, let's look again at the style of the natural history giraffe drawing and its explanatory stage pose. These qualities conjure or connote secondary perceptions and associations. Based on personal experience, you might associate this drawing with dusty natural history museum dioramas of taxidermied specimens. But if we juxtapose another element with a giraffe, like a lectern, the giraffe is anthropomorphized. It's ready to give a lecture. Perhaps the giraffe is an advocate for other giraffes and speaking about loss of habitat. The lectern connotes a certain kind of authority, or not. And if we place the image in another context, is the giraffe visiting a museum, or an exhibit, or is it the art exhibit? As communicators, to varying degrees, we direct how meaning and secondary interpretations are conveyed. But like words, it's a creative leap that can be elusive and open to interpretation. That's where having a group of trusty colleagues who can read and critique your work is very valuable. Who can really say what is real? But a photographic image might come closest to resembling some sort of reality. Of course, this isn't entirely accurate or true, but just for now, let's agree to say that a photo is an image that records what we see. The photo reveals a specific representation, like maybe a distinctly individual giraffe with one blue eye and one brown. Let's look at the photograph of the giraffe head, and it looks like a giraffe. It's a specific, unique individual. It's a representation of a giraffe. Okay, I know it's not really a photograph. It's a modified digital image, but that's another story. In his book, Understanding Comics, Scott McCloud speaks about a range of representation. And here I've made my own version using my chosen subject, the giraffe, so you can see what I'm talking about. I know this seems kind of obvious, but when an image is stylized by being drawn or manipulated in some way, it shifts from being one kind of specific representation, like a photo of a unique individual, to becoming more iconic or universal or abstracted. And in that, there is a giant range of kinds of representation, from most real to most abstracted. So let's look at the chart and start off with the photographic image of the giraffe. The next image is a little more stylized. It's a posterized, high-contrast version of the first photo. It's still a representation of a giraffe, but it isn't exactly what you'd call reality. Then there's a brushy drawing that still looks pretty giraffe-y, but is beginning to be more of an interpretation of a giraffe. Further simplifying, next is a loose-ish line drawing, followed by a more stylized vector drawing. Then, a drawing where some of the features of giraffeness are made up of simple geometric forms. And then, even though it's just a couple of lines and some dots, we might still read this last drawing as a giraffe head. 
At the far right of the chart, the name or the word for giraffe is about as abstract as can be, although we really could go further. The letters of the word do not look at all like a giraffe, but we have an agreement that these letters, strung together in this specific order, represents an idea of a giraffe. It's a written word, seven letter forms, and we know how to say the word because we were taught to do so. The meaning is retained, but it's language and vocabulary rather than a pictorial representation that resembles a giraffe. If you are interested in learning more about representation, look up some of the readings in the resources section, because this is a really fascinating area of study, especially for graphic designers. But for this workshop, we'll be taking a look at this more in terms of expanding your range of image making. Everything is relational. In graphic design, as compelling as it is to make the images, placing them in a context is a powerful and expressive means for directing our interpretation or read. Arranging images in an intentional relationship creates a dynamic that can, to varying degrees, convey or release meaning, narrative, and connotation. The very particular way a designer arranges or juxtaposes images like a kind of visual grammatical structure or poetry, is based on a million things distinct and unique to each person. So the way that any one person proposes is very individual and improvisational. Only you can put something together the way you do. This week, we'll take a look at some specific terminology so we have a shared vocabulary for talking about your images and how they are composed. We'll also look at some compositional strategies for arranging your images on the pages. Visual hierarchy is one of the most powerful forces in composition. It's how you give visual structure and impact to your compositions by arranging the elements to give emphasis or priority, or, in other words, to designate the order of importance for the elements within the context of your composition. Creating visual hierarchy is one way of directing how something is to be read or interpreted. In graphic design, there are so many ways you can establish hierarchy like positioning an element in the center or up front in the foreground, making it the largest or brightest or more, most conspicuous, or by isolating the element or pointing at it with other elements. That doesn't mean that centering, making one element the largest or brightest or up front or isolating it or arranging it in an unexpected or absurd way are the best or only ways to create hierarchy in a composition. In this example of drafts, we can almost number the order of relative importance given to each element or group of elements. And of course, arranging or assigning hierarchy isn't entirely fixed and immovable. It's open to debate. Like words and images, hierarchy is relational and open to interpretation. There are many ways to consider and analyze a composition, as you'll see when we look at a few examples. So let's review a few terms typically used to talk about formal composition in order to have a shared vocabulary for discussions. Using scale, you can create hierarchy and dynamic energy in a composition. You've probably seen photos where comparative scale is indicated by adding something familiar that we might have a good idea of its size in the world. And the most straightforward way to use scale is to increase or decrease the size of one element. That definitely gives prominence, but not always. Sometimes the tiniest thing may draw the most attention. For example, in this silkscreen poster by Christina Rodriguez and Crystal Yi, a dramatic visual contrast and hierarchy is established by scale. We might be able to assume from visual clues that the big butterfly in the foreground probably isn't monstrously huge, but we don't really know for sure until we compare it to a few more elements in the composition. Considering this poster in terms of hierarchy, the butterfly certainly is the largest element in the composition and has a hit of bright yellow, so perhaps it inhabits the number one spot. But once you make out the small figure with its long shadow, 
that person seems to hold as much hierarchical weight and influence, if not more than the butterfly. Of course, this is all open to question, and that kind of contrast and tension is what makes the activity of composing so captivating. In the three-color silkscreen poster by Tiffany Tran and Andalee Lin, everything in the composition is pretty much equal in scale and arranged very evenly in a three-across grid. Chicken is nearly equal to the size of the beetle. Beetle is the same scale as plant, pinecone, and eric. In terms of hierarchy, Andalee and Tiffany intend for all the elements, images and text, to be interpreted as holding the same or equal importance. That said, the bright red square does give a little extra flourish of prominence to the beetle. It's up for debate whether one could say the relatively more generous white space around the bike lends to that image some dramatic intensity. All the images are compelling, and one could make a number of cases for the order of each element's place in the visual hierarchy, even though the scale of the individual images is approximately the same. This historical example, a poster by Joseph Mueller Brockman, is a classic example of scale. Here the scale of the motorcycle wheel is increased dramatically to emphasize the threat to the little boy running across the space in the distance. The scale of the wheel, measured against the size of the little boy, connotes the threat of speeding traffic and emphasizes the message of the poster, traffic safety. Space is another one of those elusive words that carry a multitude of meanings. In a composition, it can refer to the perception or illusion of dimensional space created by perspective or layering. One element may simply be in front of another, or the scale difference suggests that one of the objects is in the foreground and the other is further back. For example, we'll look again at the Seeing and Awakening film poster this time focusing on space as depth and dimension. You'll notice it's difficult to isolate space and scale because using scale is one of the ways the illusion of depth is established. So, we could say the butterfly is closest to us because it's the largest in the foreground. Then we surmise from various visual clues, mostly scale and overlapping, how far away other things might seem to be. The relative size difference between the butterfly in the foreground and the comparatively tiny figure walking through a moody landscape in the midground gives an illusion of depth, of dimensional space. Depth is further emphasized by the flying seagulls that appear to be even more distant. And of course, in reality, we're not peering into the distance. We're looking at a poster, a flat sheet of paper. We can also talk about the space in terms of the relationship of the elements to the edges of the paper or the screen. And do the elements touch, overlap, bleed off, or are they cropped by the edge? What this means is depending on how the elements are placed in relation to each other or the edge of the paper, you can create a conversation between images, or in other words, create a field of dynamic tension in the composition. Let's look again at the chicken, beetle, and bicycle poster, which uses space in a very different way than the seeing and awakening poster does. This time we'll examine the word space in another sense, in terms of proximity, and the active role of white space that lies between the forms plays. So when we looked at this poster before, we noticed that the designers arranged the elements in this composition on an evenly spaced symmetrical grid with a lot of space between the images. There is little or no illusional depth or space. The composition sits flat on a very flat plane. It's as if each element has a magnetic field around it holding it in place. Objects do not touch, but are held in charged tension surrounded by the white space. It's interesting to note that if the space around each element was precisely equal, the composition would feel static. But the way that the designers varied the amount of white space makes this composition dynamic, even if it's very quietly dynamic. And then, in this poster for the Children's Film Festival, smaller line drawings make up a background. The elements are packed in very closely and create an all-over pattern. There's no overlapping or big scale differences. This has the effect of flattening any illusion of dimensional space. The transparent silhouette in the foreground overlays the drawings and appears to sit lightly on the same plane. 
Space works in yet another way in this composition, which is a photographic image of a construction made for the CalArts Music School Jazz CD package. Everything in the photo is real paper, doing everything that paper does best, like being cut into shapes, edges curling and strips folding and taped into shapes, and pieces overlapping. All the components are assembled in real space and then lit. We know this, since the objects do cast shadows. The camera captured the setup from a very particular point of view, and while we can't be entirely sure how big the setup is, we do get a great sense of the tactile quality of the paper and how the elements are arranged in space. Figure ground is a term that refers to a figure or form and the dynamic relationship it forms with the background, which in graphic design is probably more commonly known as white space or negative space. White space is an enormously significant force to consider when you're creating compositions. When you're working on a page, consider the unoccupied areas around the object as playing as active a role as the elements do. In other words, it's not passive, and it's tempting to fill up the spaces with stuff, but give the white space or negative space a job to do. It's an undeniably impactful component of your composition. For example, in this page from a book by Calvin Rye, let's clump all the images and text blocks together and consider them as the form in this composition. The strip of negative space below the car is highly charged and dramatic. It implies that the car is levitating or flying through the air. The rectangle of space created above the car, between the text blocks, is compelling just because it is now a space full of potential, dramatic, formal, or who knows. It's just a really great space and an active, dynamic part of the composition. I'd venture to say that that space is kind of mysterious. It's an exciting moment in the composition, and in reality, there's nothing there. Let's look at another example of dynamic figure ground interplay. In this silkscreen poster, the figure, a photo and drawing of Edie Sedgwick's face and head, is intentionally left incomplete and ambiguous. We could possibly read this as a bright light on her face, so bright that part of her face becomes indistinguishable and part of the background. A film strip sequence of images and three lines of tight blower lips suggest a definable contour and a dimensional form, even though there is no information about the side of her face in the image. Really, this is a fascinating feat of completion that occurs, where we infer the whole of the figure from an incomplete but evocative negative space. Creating a narrative involves a story conjured by the information that is presented. There are so many kinds of narratives, linear or temporal stories, abstract or metaphoric, or simply descriptions of the moment, action to action. Time and motion can be represented in images as a linear format, like a comic strip, or simultaneously. Absurd or startling juxtapositions suggest narratives and assumptions. There is a mysterious moment that happens between two or more images or frames, like in comics or film. This space is far from empty or silent or inactive. Instead, it's terrifically dynamic and poetic. Even though the narrative isn't explicitly defined or depicted, our imaginative participation creates closure between images. We fill in that gap, creating narrative. Graphic designers use narrative, setting up expectations through the composition, juxtaposition, and context. Some narratives in graphic design are created not so much in what we'd call a story, but instead the term narrative is more accurate, since the word can encompass a sequence created in the design structure, like a recurring element or an image that advances the story when the page is turned. Let's take a look at Becky Song's design for the CalArts Music School Jazz CD. Becky made the image and designed the three-panel booklet for this project. When the brochure is folded to fit in the CD case, only her narrative image on the cover shows. Once the booklet is removed from the case and open, two narrative scenes are revealed. On the back of the booklet, note that the way the booklet folds to fit the case makes it such that the cover is now the far right-hand panel, and the cover image is incorporated into the scene that spans the entire spread. The transition from the cover, 
to unfolding and revealing the continuation of the story is a great way to create narrative, kind of like a narrative within a narrative. The story on the inside is clearly part of the same story that was begun on the cover, but you might say it's from a different chapter. Now that you've made some images, you can begin to arrange your works into compositions. And here's where graphic design becomes magical. I've opened up a two-page spread and placed two giraffes. One is a stylized skeleton, and the other is a photographic collage inside a simple outline. I'm going to arrange this composition in a few ways, working with some of the visual contrasts we've been looking at. Right off, we can say this is a symmetrical composition. The figures are fairly equal in size and take up about the same amount of space, and that makes a stable and kind of static composition. That doesn't mean good or bad, it just is what it is. Let's work with scale first. To begin with, I'm going to change the scale of one of the giraffes. This scale shift creates a more dynamic relationship. The white space around both figures is larger now and more active made even more so by the dramatic size contrast between the two figures. If I change the orientation and scale of this figure, you can see how making one of the forms a lot larger, and how when it takes up more space, that changes the relationship of the figure to the white space, and to the other figure, and to the edges of the composition, and so on. Everything is relational. If I move this smaller figure, even closer to the larger one, their proximity activates the white space between them in another way. I like to think it creates a nervous energy or creates a conversation between the forms, whereas the more generous white space creates a certain kind of steadiness. Not really, of course, but you can see the expressive qualities you can create by adjusting the figure-ground relationship. As I'm moving things around and changing the scale of elements, I'm always aware of how that affects the figure-ground relationship. One of my goals is to make the white space active and strong. The space around the forms is as important as the forms. It's like the air or water the forms need. Okay, let's go back to our original two draft symmetrical composition. Let's change the size of this one again. And I'm going to place another giraffe. It's about the same size as the first one, and this time I want to work with space as a visual contrast. So maybe I'll scale this image, I'll make it mid-size, and I'm going to move it over to the left. The scale difference between the elements creates an illusion of space. It's almost as if the giraffes are standing in a landscape, especially if the smallest figure is moved to the top corner, kind of like that guy is small because he's in the distance. I'm going to add a geometric shape, and let's see how that changes the composition. Okay, so now the giraffe skeleton has a pedestal to stand on. See how he seems to be closer now, not in the distance. Let's see what happens when I make it wider and overlap that figure. The spatial relationship has changed again. Now the smallest figure is in front, the other figure is seemingly pushed behind the orange form, and the first figure is still in the foreground. Now, if I place a sofa in the composition, that juxtaposition creates a narrative. Or you can say that I've changed the context by juxtaposing the three ruminants with a piece of furniture commonly found in a home. Now it seems that the giraffes are in a room, perhaps. Or who knows? But in any case, sofa plus drafts just generate some sort of absurd narrative. As you're working on these compositions, try out some of the visual contrasts we've been looking at. Experiment with scale and space, rhythm and pattern, creating hierarchy, and seeing what happens to the relationship of the figure to the white space as you move things around, or juxtapose other elements. Think through making. And if you've been making them, Consult your thumbnail sketches.
Why would you want to make a book? Well, as a designer, we are often called upon to organize work into some sort of container or way of putting the work into the world. This could be a book or a website or film titles or really anything that a designer touches. The book is also a way to finish your work, to assemble, frame, and present a complete idea or reflection. Rather than having a stack of images, you're making an object with intent. A book has a job to do. It is a portable object, a way of sequencing images into a narrative. In this last week, let's pull everything all together and make a book with some of the spreads you made in the previous week. This entails considering your book as an object in itself, its bookishness, and not just a series of images. As you assemble your book, you may want to give some thought to how you want to sequence the pages. What do you want to have happen over the arc of the book, from the first page to the last? How you lead off with the first page, and what will close or end? There are plenty of decisions to make at this stage, but don't be afraid. Take some risks and enjoy the process. Okay, so last week we experimented with creating single compositions across two-page spreads. This week I want to show you how these spreads could work in a book, and what design decisions you may have to make when putting together your book. A book is a living thing that exists in physical space with pages that are open and turned in real time. It's made of sheets of paper with four edges and four corners folded and bound together. To review, a spread is made up of two separate pages but those two pages are seen simultaneously as individual pages and together as one composition. And then, each two-page composition is part of the whole of the book, where all the layouts are sympathetic to and affected by each other. So we might use the same compositional strategies we used while building our single-page spreads. We now have the interesting complication of the relationship of the sequence of pages to each other, plus the closure of the front and back covers. I've made some rough thumbnail sketches to help me think about pacing and also work out some compositions I might want to test. I'm working in InDesign, and as a designer working on the screen, you have to bend your mind around the working environment and how the actual book will be laid out for printing. I'm going to be moving these images around, on this spread and to other spreads, adding, subtracting, overlapping, and changing scale as I compose the whole book. Consider how a visual thought, for instance, a narrative or pattern, might begin on one spread and continue to the next, or that visual idea may be revisited on a later spread. For instance, if I want to suggest the passage of time or a narrative by moving this giraffe to the edge of the page and continuing it to the next spread, it's sort of as if the giraffe walked from the first spread to the next. Maybe I'll leave this layout just as is. You might set it up so that one spread may have many images while another has a few, or one, or none. Variations like this will become integral in creating a sense of pacing and overall rhythm in the book. I'm going to draw a geometric shape to give weight, density, and contrast. And this shape has another job too. It stands in for the body of the giraffe. As you work on your book, this kind of compositional strategy might come into play in other ways, on other spreads. This way of thinking about composing develops as you work, so you just have to keep trying things out. And at some point, when you're putting your book together, consider how you'd like to open your book, or how you will close it. Keep in mind that the first page and the last have no facing pages. Page 1 might offer an opportunity to add a title or set the stage for what we'll see when we turn the page. And then, there's the last page. Hi, we're here in this pink room with Jen, who's going to be our hand model today. And we're going to have a conversation about these books that I brought in to show you. These are examples of some books that I thought were interesting and that would relate somewhat to the project you're working on when you're making a book for for your image making images. We're just going to kind of go through them. So this book we have here is called Lazy Mom, Lazy Wow. It's by Phyllis Ma and Josie Keefe. And we're going to first talk about the cover. But even before we do that, let's talk about how a book is an interactive object. It's something that you can turn in space and in time. 
So you can see the front cover and the back cover. You can't see everything that's in a book at the same time, but you can see it as you page through. So it's, a, it's truly an old-fashioned kind of pre-app thing. If we're looking just at the front cover, you'll see that there's a, maybe a slice of watermelon that has an orange slice on top and then another orange slice on top with some a kiwi fruit, and it seems to be sitting on top of tinfoil. Not sure what that means yet, but it seems to be about fruit. And as we get into the book, we'll, we'll discover maybe what this means or what the author's trying to tell us through her image making. So this one isn't exactly like your book because it's all photographic. And in your books, you're doing a range of experiments and explorations with different materials and ways of making things in different styles and so forth. We're not going for something that's good or beautiful, so we're not going to be looking at these books in terms of those kinds of preconceived ideas. I might say that something's nice, but that doesn't mean that it's good or best or better. It's really just a way of pointing something out that I find interesting. Jen's going to open this book up all the way, the way librarians tell you to not open a book. But it's kind of nice to be able to see the front cover and the back cover together. On the back cover, if we just talk about what we see, so there's two things, two objects sitting or floating on a white background. I think they're sitting because they seem to have shadows. Mm -hmm. One looks like a watermelon and it looks like it's whole, or at least we can see the part that's facing us is whole. And then there's another object that might be a lemon or a squash or something, it's yellow. The watermelon has stripes. It's a nice relationship that's set up between the back cover and the front cover because they're talking to each other. They're, they're all fruit. They're all round. On the back, it's spherical, and on the front, they're slices. So there seems to be some kind of narrative happening in terms of the back is their whole fruits, and on the front, they've been sliced and arranged. On the back, they are arranged. You can see that there's a lot of white space between the melon and the yellow thing. So there's a scale shift. That's one of your visual contrasts that you're working with. And then there's this, it's not really a narrative in terms of once upon a time and the end, but there's something happening that's maybe more musical or lyrical with there's two shapes on the back and maybe there are one, two, and the front is the three. I'm just speculating, but I'm, I'm doing kind of a, a funny read on this just because we can and I'm not sure exactly what the author was trying to tell us, but there are these things that you, you begin to see. And I think these are really interesting things. Okay, so let's turn to the first page. That's where the, where the title is. And let's keep going. So you can see these are photo setups. This might be something that you want to try too. This just setting some things up on a table. There's a lot of small elements, a lot of round things, mostly food, some plants. The background colors keep changing. It's a nice way that she's begun to set up this book so there's a lot of little things. Mm. And then when you get to the next page, suddenly we're, we have just two images of two things. And I think what's interesting with this too is how the color backgrounds work. So on the left-hand page, there's kind of a lavender grayish background. And then on the right, there's it looks like a gradient of green to some kind of dirty orange. And what you might expect is that the, the seam between the two colors would end or would meet at the fold, but they don't. So it's kind of a nice surprise that it lops over onto the other page. What's also interesting on this is that the edge on the right, you can see a shadow, so it gives an illusion of space. It's also like, you might expect that the edge of the paper would go all the way to the edge of the page, but it doesn't. So those are other nice kinds of things. I also think that little pin in the top is a nice detail, and it's, it sets up a, a scale shift between the the pineapple and the little tiny dot. The nice visual contrast. And then this one, the little detail 
things on the edge. Yeah, they they kind of line up on a um, invisible line that kind of swoops in from one edge and goes to the other. That's a. I just noticed something. Yeah, is this, I think this is a mirror. Here's the straw and the crumpled bill, and then this is upside down up here in oh, this corner. Nice. Yeah, it's a really nice solution. Yeah. That's an interesting way to make more images. Let's go to the next page. Wow, so suddenly it's close up and full bleed, so the image full bleed means that it goes off all, all of the edges. The photo's actually bigger than the page and it's been cropped to this size. And we're a lot closer up. And there's a nice continuity of the color from the previous page. And then we're back to two images, but they meet at the center spread, at the center of the book, unlike the other one. Nice visual contrast between the colors. And then two images again, but there's a little bit more complexity in these than the, than the previous pages. Again, nice color continuity that pulls you through. Mm -hmm. I like this formal relationship between this crack in the cigarette and this crack in the carrot as well. <laughs> I would say that pickle is holding, even though the pickle might be the smallest thing there, it's kind of holding the, the primary spot in your hierarchy. Like you see that as number one, and then maybe you see the red thing, whatever that is, number two. So it's an interesting thing to look at too when you're beginning to compose your, your own pages. And there's the back cover again. So it's kind of nice how it how it starts and how it finishes. So here we're a little bit more close up and then it closes with more fruit and it seems to feel like there's kind of a the end with, the, with that last image of the two fruits. Okay, so this book that we're gonna show you is one of our favorites. It's called Night Moves by Katerina Pierini. And I think if I Go to the colophon. There's more information. It's published by Sming Sming Books. And the note says, all photographs were taken by Katerina Perini between 2008 and 2017 using various motion-activated infrared trail cameras placed along the central coast of California. Great. So we wanted to show you this book because it's wildly different than the one that we just looked at. It's a lot more quiet and mysterious. It sets an entirely different tone, and you'll see that that's done through the composition and through the visual contrast. The front cover is, it looks like, it takes you a while to figure out what it is, which I think is kind of nice. It's a little bit mysterious. It's really soft and silvery. It sets a really nice tone of quietness and contemplative. You have to really study to figure out what it is. If we look at the back cover too, it's kind of hard to see. It, I think the indistinctness is also part of this project. So the fact that it doesn't instantly tell you what it is, is part of the charm and what's so captivating about it. If you look closely, you can see that it's the back of the, it's the rest of the mountain lion. It's like its neck and back. And then on the front cover, there are two glowing eyes, which we'll see when we turn in. That, that That's a strategy and a structure that gets used over and again. So the first page is just the back of the cover, and you can see that this the cover was printed on silver paper. And then there's a sheet of black paper, which functions as a pause, or maybe it signifies darkness. It's, it's hard to tell, but it, it, it really is something that stops you. It's not just an image. It's really a deliberate move to change the tone and to change the way that you experience this book. It's almost musical in that way. It's like it's a rest or a stop or like here's, here's the opening of the book. 
I mean, we've talked before about how do you start something and how do you announce that this is the beginning of the book. This is a this is um, this is a nice strategy. And then we go to the title page, and you can see that typographically, night and moves have been separated, and they almost echo what's happening on the cover with the with the glowing eyes. So it's another it's not a literal or completely identical way of talking about the front cover, but it it does have that kind of repetition, and it sets up a nice rhythm in that way. So the first image, these are, these are really deliberately and quietly placed. There's just one image. There's a big area of white space around it. And you can see how powerful that white space is. It's really about pulling you in to look at the single image, to contemplate it, to actually stop and spend some time looking. Here the image is moved to the center. Again, the big white margins around it are really elegant and quiet. There's this, it really makes it feel like you're alone. Again, we have two images here, so it's, it's another echo back to the front cover and the way that the title is separated. And then here's the surprise. Suddenly it's a full bleed image. So the image is larger than the page. It, it spans two pages and it goes off the edge. And it's kind of interesting how the cat isn't just in the middle. It's really going off to the edge. So it's a lot more activated. And then the eyeballs glowing are kind of that detail-y, what would you call that? Oh, the reflections yeah. in the infrared camera, mm -hmm. but it adds it adds a little certain kind of sparkle or mm. interest, or, yeah. or a focal point. Focal point, right? Mm. Yeah. It also looks like the the spots on the. This must be a uh, bobcat, not a mountain yeah. lion. Short tail. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you think it means to just have a single image? I mean, how could you read that? For me? Yeah. I don't know. I think visually it's a really nice contrast. Also in the sense of like how from spread to spread, you know, the images are kind of moving across the page. Or they're just, it's just playing with things, like how, how things are laid out on the page is a really interesting thing for me. That's how I'm reading it. Right. I'm going back. These are the first pages we already looked at. But I kind of like how they dance around. And then also in contrast to that full bleed image. Yeah, that's really nice. For me, it's something interesting too, in the sense of like where, because it's a camera that's set up at night and it's that the animals are not aware that they're being photographed, there's a sense of voyeurism that's really interesting. Like almost like we're like getting like this kind of cropped view, what's happening. Um, and it's also interesting because it's a, I don't know what the actual image looked like, but that the, as it's arranged on the page, that the animal is centered within the frame of this photograph and that the image itself is cropped to the animal, which is interesting. There might be in the actual photograph a lot more black space, but here the artist has decided to crop all of the night sky out or all of the darkness and just focused on the animal here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's... That's a really interesting read. These also have the feeling of being one click of the camera, because I'm assuming that the cats trip the camera mm. on the trail. Mm -hmm. Very spontaneous. Right. Oh, again, a nice full bleed and a close-up. That's so, a total photo bomb. Right. <laughs> I like this relationship between the two cats. Like yeah. they're almost in conversation with each other. Like this one is talking to this guy. Yeah, I think that, that those are really nice compositional things to work with too. Like how you create those kinds of conversations and relationships and narratives and, and ways of 
thinking about two images juxtaposed near each other. It's different than if you just had one image. That's great. Yeah. Uh, that's just looking into that void, into right. that black space. And that velvety black is so nice. Mm -hmm. I have to say, like, kind of, well, because these are my hands, <laughs> but it's the um, kind of relationship to what the students are working on in the class, like where they're creating something that's going to be viewed on screen. But there's something to say about where we're touching these pages and they're clearly photocopies, but it's like a pretty nice photocopy in comparison, like this black, what that feels like to your fingers compared to this black, which is an actual black piece of paper. It's just an interesting contrast. Right. as a tactile object. It's really yeah. interesting. I think that's a really good point because materiality changes how you experience something so much, mm -hmm. too. You're right. It's interesting how the images move through the, through the pages, too. Mm -hmm. and they're not always in the same spot. Mm -hmm. But it also doesn't feel crazy. It feels really quiet in the way that they've been placed. Mm -hmm, I agree. That's the end. Yeah, and it really feels like an end. Even though it's the same way it opened, it feels like it has closure and it feels like it went somewhere. Even though the story isn't, again, like once upon a time to the end, it, it feels like this is, this is how you close a book. I mean, there's something really nice about that photo. It's hard to see, but the cat is walking away from the camera and kind of looking back. So it's kind of a nice image to have as closure. Yeah, great point. So we have a zine here, and I pulled it out of a bunch of zines, or there was a, like 10 zines that were kind of like this, and I, I picked this one out. I think it's by artist Laura Owens, although it's not really identified so clearly inside. Yeah, there's definitely no title page we were checking. Yeah. Right. But it's, it's a really compelling, interesting piece, and I, I thought that it'd be fun to show it to you. I mean, one of the things that caught my eye first was not only that splotch of paint, but the unusual binding. Mm. So it's those um, staples that you can put in a notebook or something. Yeah, they're really great, all these yeah. little loops. So the objectness of this is, is kind of exciting, too. And I like that the cover says, hey. <laughs> Shall we page through it? Yeah, let's page through. So it seems to be a collection of clippings from newspapers. And some are images and some are longer text. Some are in black and white, and then there's, what would you call that, monochromatic? Yeah, or yeah, or it's like a single color printing, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's a nice green. Yeah. And here we have a, the, the center spread kind of shows us everything that's in the scene. Yeah, there's that gasoline in right. the photo with paint smudges on top of it. And ah, there's the red paint smudge from oh, the cover. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> it's all coming together. <laughs> this is an interesting juxtaposition here. So on the right, we have a, a commercial drawing of a cigarette pack from some other era. And then on the left, there's a kind of mysterious photo that looks like it might be smoke or some kind of atmospheric thing happening or sparks or something. But anyway, the, the juxtaposition of the cigarettes next to that image gives it a certain kind of meaning or a read or directs the, the meaning in a particular way that you think that it might have something to do with smoke or cigarettes or something like that. That yellow is nice. Yeah. It's On like white, so it works really well. Yeah. Not a high contrast, but it's a nice surprise. Mm -hmm. 
That's a really interesting surprise. <laughs> I haven't seen that one before, and it feels so just out of place with the rest of the vintage images. Right, yeah. But interesting nonetheless. It's kind of nice, like, having kind of, you know, these areas of black and white text, but then it seems like each of the co colors, more or less, like from primary and secondary colors get representation on a page, like a blue. I don't know if there's a red, actually, but we have a green. I know there's a yellow. We saw it. There it is. Right. And then I'm just thinking about this last one being the purple one. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a nice structural thing that happens through the book, and then, and then it's subverted by a full color image. Like it's been the single colors, and then, mm -hmm. and then it's not. Yeah, maybe that's the red one. Yeah, that's nice. Hi, we have uh, another book here to take a look at. This one is a hardcover, so obviously not, not exactly what you're making. Um, but something to dream about, of course. And this is Laura Owen's new work from a while ago. Oh, actually, I can check the date. Yeah, Laura Owen's new work, cool typographic treason here. It's her name. 2001. We're here to talk about this book. There's a lot of really interesting things happening in this one, especially just starting with the cover, that if you flip it around to the back. Can I open it up flat? Yeah. It might be a little challenging. This is so there you can see it's a, the monkey's tail wraps around to the back and also holds the type, which is kind of, um, oh, yeah. yeah, that's kind of cool. And I like that it's a mixture of different materials. So it's like this water, the monkey's painted in watercolor, but he's holding onto this branch made of collaged paper. It was painted paper that then has been collaged. And Laura's name here is this little, right here in his mouth, this little paper cutout with her name painted on it. It's pretty great. It's hard to see on camera. Cool. Yeah. What do you want to talk about first? Yeah, well, let's uh, um, let's open it up. Okay. So here, these are the end papers. In the book we had with the mountain lions, the night moves, that had the silver paper and the black paper. Here it's a printed paper of a, I think it's like a tapestry or a mm. some kind of textile sample. Yeah, it's a it looks to me it looks like a photograph of a embroidered textile. Right. And some, sometimes these are marbled papers or whatever, um, but it's something to think about when you when you're making your book if you want to have something like that because it it really does set that pause or an announcement. Um, yeah, and then here's another. This is a great lead-in. So we have one blank page and then we have these two B's with lots of white space around them, and it's almost an animated story where like the B's going to lead you in to this, the title page. There's a lot of activity and um, suggestion of space because the leaves on the left are really big and then they get tiny. There's a lot of, um, like Jen was talking about with the typography, there's a lot of interaction with the typography and the image. So sometimes bugs sit on the type. Telephone. Yeah. Table. table of contents. Right. So these are all traditional parts of a book. Do you want me to skip to some of the bookmark yeah, pages? Yeah, let's do that. So we wanted to take a look at this page on the left um, as an example of juxtaposing. Maybe you, you have two images and you want to juxtapose them together. And this one creates kind of an a narrative in, of sorts. So there's a framed, a frame, and then she put an image inside that frame, and then on the bottom there's some kind of vegetation or plants or looks like is that like a lady ladybird in there, or it just might a red be, or thing. Just a little red flower. Yeah. 
So it creates, the, the page creates this kind of space for the work to sit in that's kind of literal in some ways, like it's, it looks like a wall with a painting on it at perhaps eye level, and then there's stuff growing out of the bottom, like, it, like you would expect in some ways. But it's also really whimsical and um, kind of magical in a way too. Yeah, like it's almost like a view within a view. Right. And I like it's kind of that view within a view thing happening again. Like this is, here's this image. And I don't know if this is one of Laura's paintings or what, but it looks like this is an excerpt of this one. See, here's the, this leaf shape is here in this painting and this part of the branch. What I like about it, it's, it's kind of playing with the composition a little bit, like how this collage leaf shape, which sits on a blue background in the painting, it's um, sitting on the white space along the, is that what I say, the gutter of the mm -hmm. book. Yeah. Um, and that Laura's played with the design a little bit so that this leaf shape now sits on the white of the page. And in this space of this painting, it's really interesting in terms of how it's playing with different relationships um, within the book itself. I like how she put a little turtle on top of her yeah. painting, too. <laughs> Cute little turtle. Yeah. And I don't know if you can see, I'm not going to make it look, but there's like a little ant that's like on the bottom of one of them. Hmm. It's really interesting. Also, this kind of implied sense of depth, like with this plant sitting in front of this painting, which is really flat in this side. But this, you know, this thing sitting in front of these other pasted up or kind of, it's faux pasted up. So these are little drawn thumbtacks and drawn pieces of tape. But here the sense of depth is so palpable because I can see since it's zoomed up or zoomed in close. This is like a piece of felt. And these are collaged bits of paper and fabric. And there's so much texture here on the painting too really amazing yeah I'm, I'm glad that you brought up that plant in front of the image too because that gives it like you were saying a sense of depth or um, it also um, functions here as like a texture shift so the drawn flowers contrast with the more watercolory mm. um, flat flat mm. parts yeah, I really like that too. Yeah. It's like it's really loose drawing, but it feels and it feels really fresh. Yeah. Shall I go to the next one? Sure, book? let's go to the next one. This is interesting. Kind of similar, like you know, painting here or the whole version is represented on the right hand side, but then a close up here on the other on the left side. Right, yeah. I think that's what's really nice about it, and that there's a casualness to the to the layout with the table in front of the painting. Mm -hmm. um, again, setting up that uh, an illusion of space, even though it's flat in real reality. Mm -hmm. And again, I like the little worms little crawling along. <laughs> yeah, and they create a little narrative the way that they move across the page. Oh, right. Do they yeah. continue? Those spider webs are pretty great too. Yeah, there's another little worm over there. Oh, over here. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Cool. Next one? Yep. This one's interesting because it's been drawn, the two pages have been drawn to look like a room or to give the illusion of space. Um, so there's walls and the floor, and then all the little paintings inside the room, like it's a gallery of some sort. Mm. So it has it has a narrative. It has a particular kind of context that she's set up with the pages. I think it's really interesting that it's the that the two pages are acting like a stage or um, a place for something to happen. That's really specific, like a room. Mm. 
Yeah, I like thinking about, or in the sense that we're looking at this representation of an interior space with this like implied perspective, like with the how the inside walls are angling away from us. So we have a sense of depth or implied depth in the drawing. And you can it's hard to see, but in the gutter of the book there is a line, drawn line in there that's indicating that this is the corner of a room. But it's kind of interesting seeing this inside a book, like how that perspective seems even more forced or it's this actual space that might be coming out at us. Yeah. I like that there's a little outlet too under that. Right here? <laughs> in case you need to plug in. Yeah. Very helpful. Right. Oh, there's that monkey again. Yeah. Or a I'm different one. Different friend. I think it's a it's a different monkey, but I, what I like about this is that the guitar is leaning up against the edge of the the edge of the page. Mm. There's that that's that's that sense of the architecture of the book again. Right. I think or this how the page normally, or I think in some of the other books that we've looked at, where the image bleeds off the page, and the page the page is really just like this. Um, page is just this substrate for an image, but here it appears like Laura is actually playing with the edge of a page as a corner right. of a room. It's really interesting. Yeah. I like this too, the relationship. So here we've got a spider web up here in this corner, um, and then the string that's holding up this painting, <laughs> this fake string that's hung over this, fake, this little drawn um, Sorry, nail, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the string extends down into a little spider. Spider web. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like the sense of space is there's a lot of play, it's a lot of playfulness here. Right. And each page sets up a kind of um, scene of some sort. Mm -hmm. And then there's the themes that reoccur throughout the whole book too which helps tie it together. That's cool. And then similar ways of showing things. So it's not always the same, but there's a relationship between the way that things are displayed mm -hmm. or collaged or co composed. I don't know if this was one you were planning to talk about, but I like the sense like the painting here is in full, but then the details, we're looking at details from the painting, but they're masked by the, this white space. So we're only seeing these perforations through the white space onto the image itself behind it. That's right. really interesting too. Yeah. And then all, then all these other little details painted on top, like spiders hanging down, <laughs> insects crawling around these holes. So that in a way, they're, are they holes looking onto an image, or are these objects with things growing off them and hanging off them? It's really interesting, just playing with you know abstract senses of space. And cool bike. Got this one from the bike. Cool. So here we have a Bruno Minari book, obviously called A Tale of Three Little Birds. And we brought this in mostly because it's a really interesting format, but there's also a lot of other things we can talk about in terms of composition in, in this book. The front cover has three birds. Mm -hmm. They're not all little. They're actually kind of big compared to the <laughs> space. This is one of our bigger books here, too. Um, and I wanted to point out, I mean, we've looked at front the relationship between front and back for a long time, but this one is not very exciting, which is, but sometimes... That's what happens. The back is just very standard. Some information from the colophon is on the back, but otherwise it's very plain and there's not really much of a formal or visual relationship between the two. No. It's totally fine, but not that exciting. No. But the inside's really exciting. The inside is very exciting. So what are we looking at here, Gail? So this is a really interesting structure for a book. It's like physically, um, it's 
put together with many small books and perforations and lots of ways of reading it. There's a small little book. Oh, and this is actually glued down. Yeah. So it's almost you're forced to start here. Sorry, I just jumped ahead. I already started exploring the books. I know, well, it's really <laughs> intriguing. It's very inviting. Yeah. And I love that, this perforation here is really interesting. It's really interesting how he works with color and scale and even within the small books compared to the big book and how the little birds function. And then what's revealed by the, by the holes. Mm -hmm. This is great. This, really, this bird's head sticking out. And that red dot's still here and still, you know, we're still able to see. Right. Actually, I think we had something similar when this bird was slightly obscured. And then just a little tiny book in the back. For the smallest bird. This bird's the same size as the snail. Oh, here. <laughs> Maybe that other, the chi bird is like really far away. Mm. Well, it's an interesting relationship. You know, we were talking about how the, the, the front and back cover relationship was pretty dull. But when we were looking at this as a physical object, it's actually, it might be hard to see on camera, but what the book is, it's actually this cardboard, or not cardboard, but this um, it's a cover made of a fairly thick paper stock material, but it's one item. So when you're opening up and looking at the inside of the book, this is actually one whole image. You can see the yellow bird is sitting on this branch that continues onto the back here. So we're able to see all the birds at once, but then their individual stories are embedded inside of these little books that you're somehow forced to page through sequentially because of the way the book is designed. Mm -hmm. And the colors are amazing. I love the way, the way they're illustrated. And just simple spot colors, but very, we're gonna use the word beautiful again. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just really well done. Yeah. Yeah, as an object, it's really intriguing and compelling and and powerful, and it's it's paced really beautifully too. So when you have when you come to this spread, how it's all white inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that there's no brown here right now, or that color has been somewhat eliminated, but we've added this green. It's kind of interesting, like, sort of when we're looking at this book and thinking about, like, representations of time. I mean, it's maybe I'm thinking about that, like, how there's, you know, this outer scene with the cover of the three birds depicted on it, like where they are I'm in my mind, and this might be, my, this is just my read of it, but I feel like these birds are part of a, some kind of present. And um, the author is saying, I'll ask them to tell you their stories, and they're kind of going digging into their past, and they're kind of hidden in these, like, really, these little sequential books. Um, but it doesn't feel strange to me at all that they're represented on, um, in this com compositionally at the same time. I really feel like uh, these are two different narratives almost happening at the same time, that the birds are here telling their stories to us. It's kind of an interesting s strategy. Yeah, that simultaneity, is, that's really fascinating.
<laughs> cool. We're kind of at the, um, the finished stage for your book, and um, I'm going to show you a couple ways to bind today. There's a um, if you're really interested in binding, we'll put this book in the resources. And there's tons of videos online for looking at really fancy binding. But I'm going to show you a couple really quick ones because our, our books aren't that big. But hopefully you've made hundreds of images, so um, your book is really, really thick. But mine's only 16 pages long. Anyway, these supplies I got are um, easily available at an art store or online. So the first kind of binding I'm going to show you is called saddle stitching. And you've seen this a million times, so that's just um, all the pages that are stapled together. This is a saddle stitcher that you can buy in an office store. Um, there's super professional ones, but this is um, really easy to use. So what you do is, when you're ready to make your book, um, you just put your book open in the saddle. So this is a saddle. And staple it. And using blue staples here. Um, so quick and easy. The other kind of binding I'm going to show you is called the um, pamphlet stitch. And when I was printing out my image spreads, um, I printed them out in printer spreads like we talked about. So um, I had to make a quick little dummy for myself. So this is just four sheets of paper that represent my four spreads. I actually have eight spreads because it's two-sided, but four pieces of paper. So I just folded a little scrap in half, and then I number the pages. So. So eight and nine are my center spread. So this this gives me a really quick idea of what printer spreads are. So page one backs up with page sixteen and so forth. So two and fifteen are together. So when I did my um, final InDesign file, um, I set it up so it would make printer spreads. So this is my cover, and this is the back cover, and so forth. There's some places where I have, as you saw in my demo, some things that go over, that will go over from one spread to the other. That's um, jumping over the fold or jumping over the gutter. So this becomes really important to make sure I get things lined up with the right things. So most people use a bone folder. I'm using a tool that's used for sculpting clay because I'm against bone implements. So what I do is just fold everything as carefully as I can in half. And then I take my folder thing and just give it a really sharp crease. You can do that with a spoon or whatever. Then I open up my booklet again. And I'm going to show you my super fancy way of measuring where I'm going to put the holes for the thread. Um, I just take it's my sheet is the same size as this. Um, I take a sheet, I fold it in half, and then I fold these, fold in. And this is just a really um, quick way of making a measuring tool without it having to measure. So now I know where um, I'm going to put the three holes in my book. So I have an awl here. You can use a nail or um, something very thin, like a needle. Um, I'm just going to make some holes so I know where I'm going to go. And then I'm laying my measuring sheet in 
to the fold of the book. And then when you're making these holes, you don't want to make them too big. Um, but you definitely want something that you can stick the needle through. And you want to keep the everything as flat on the plane as you can and get right into the center of the spine of the book. So I made a hole there. Hole there. Okay. So now I have three holes in the spine. And I have some book binding thread. You can use regular thread, but the book binding thread's a little nicer because it's waxed. Um, you can get this in colors at your art store. Um, typically you'll find it like this. It's kind of a bland color, but some, I got this online, easy to find. So you want about that much thread. And what you're gonna do is start, depending on where you want your knot, I want my knot in the middle you can make it on the other side, but I'm going to do it this way. So I start in the middle and I go out. I go back in. Um, and I go back up to the top and go out again. And back in. And then I just usually tie a knot, clip it off. I don't care if you could clip these really close or you can leave them um, long and just acknowledge the bookishness of it. There you are, bound. Then the next step is that you want to trim your book. So I have crop marks, exacto. I like to trim it after I've done the binding, just in case um, I've made some of the pages a little uneven. And this is one way to really make it neat. History of Design. I'm Louise Sandhouse. And I'm Lorraine Wild. Together we are faculty in the Graphic Design program at CalArts. And like some of our peers, we are designers interested in researching and writing about the history of this discipline. At CalArts, where we both teach, design history is a core part of the graphic design curriculum. Looking at the past helps us designers describe and articulate what is happening in our own work. This course is not a survey course. We can't fit the entire history of design into four weeks. Instead, I'll be presenting sections from the history of design course that I teach at CalArts, focusing on key movements or periods in design history from the last 150 years. Louise will be your guide through the course, offering further insight and interpretation. You will be seeing a lot of images, but together we'll make connections between them. By the end of this course, you will gain insight on how designers work then and now and why things look the way they do. You will also have a better understanding of how to describe those visual cues and references in your own design work to relate the work of the present to ideas of the past. industrialization, or before goods were mass produced in factories, things had to be made by hand. They were expensive to produce and to buy. This meant that only the wealthy could afford the kinds of beautiful goods that everyone owns today, from clothing to devices to furniture. But if things were made a different way, 
What should they look like? Or what style should they have? How would people know about what was available and where and why to buy these new objects of desire? Industrialization gave rise to consumerism and its counterparts, shopping and advertising. This need to sell products is all about combining words and images in powerful ways, what we know today as advertising and graphic design. This week, we're going to look at a few examples of goods produced in the period following industrialization and some early advertising strategies to entice consumers to buy them. I'm starting with this image of a factory in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. This picture is from the 1880s and it's a factory that made chairs. This represented something really different because before industrialization, chairs were made by a local carpenter or furniture maker in a town or village or city and people knew where the chairs came from. But now, since mass production and mass communication, all those kind of advances that were brought on by the Industrial Revolution that increased the way, the, the way that things were made in the world and increased their availability. You also had, of course, the use of machines to make things. Again, that old village craftsman was probably using hand tools, and now a factory used power-driven lathes and different kinds of mechanical tools in order to make things that then went out in the market. However, the interesting thing when you look at design during this period is sometimes those new techniques, which really were you know, the introduction of mass production into the modern world, were used to actually produce things that looked just like the old things. For instance, this is a catalog page from that chair company in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And you see a group of four chairs here, some with arms, one with a rocker. You can tell that they're using interchangeable parts that have been made in the factory, like the way the backs of all those chairs are the same. And yet the design is kind of a vernacular design. By that we mean a design that is kind of handed down through the ages. It's a design that everybody recognizes. It really is no different than the, in fact, it's derived from the kind of design that would have been produced by the village woodworker making furniture before industrialization. Now, there were some interesting deviations from this, and that is what is considered really modern by historians of the period. These are the parts for something called the Thonet chair. Now, the Thonet chair was a simple wooden chair made by a company in Austria that used new power tools and a steam process for creating bent tubular wood that's been steam pressed into kind of curvilinear forms. This chair that Thone designed was sold in the millions. You get a sense of the interchangeability of the forms. So again, the factory's producing parts. They're thinking about them modularly but they're actually making chairs that now have a kind of new, interesting form. Now, it falls into an aesthetic that we call Art Nouveau of a kind of exaggerated curvilinear design, in this case, really enabled by this kind of new steam pressing. So literally, you have two factories producing chairs in the same way, but the Thonet factory was actually thinking about innovating the design as a response to the mechanization of the process. So in other words, the form follows the way it was made. You might have heard of an old phrase called form follows function, meaning that the form kind of tells you something about the way that a design is created. And this is a really good example, and it's one reason why when you look at standard design histories of even architecture that start in the 19th century, they often look at the chairs made by this company as a perfect example of the machine and designers acting with technology symbiotically. The truth was 
during the latter half of the 19th century, a lot of people blamed bad design on the machine. They thought that it was mechanization that had created a lot of new, meaningless products that were kind of shoddy in their making. But if you look carefully, you realize that it's not the fault purely of the machine and technology, but instead it's about how all of those things, the designers, the businessmen who are commissioning the design, and the technology itself kind of interact to answer the market. You've probably seen old movies like Gone with the Wind, where the women, sort of middle of the 19th century, women are wearing these huge dresses. And you look at them and you think, why are people wearing these dresses that look like giant balloons? Well, if you look back at the history of women's fashion, in the pre-mechanized age, to have a dress that was this large, used that much material, and was ornamented, it meant that you had a seamstress who was making it for you know the client who was most likely an aristocrat. But during mechanization, first of all, you had this increase of trade so that silks and cottons were getting to textile manufacturers in England or in the American South. The prices of cloth had dropped, so suddenly middle classes could afford to have dresses that used more material. And even things like pre-made ribbons and floral ornament and things could be sent to these local dressmakers who literally were kind of getting a pre-made form of a dress and then maybe customizing it with ribbon for the client. So when you see these dresses, they're not totally driven by Victorian modesty. I mean, I think that's often the interpretation of these dresses, but they literally are a symbol of a marketplace that now had a lot more material available to a lot more people to consume. There are even jokes about it, like this is a, an old cartoon out of a British magazine from around the same time, and it's kind of an evil cartoon about couples bending over at the beach to pick up mussels out of the sand. People literally made fun of these outfits, and they especially made fun of people who wouldn't previously been able to afford this kind of symbol of excessive consumerism now could afford it. As products become more democratic, there's a lot of interesting commentary about whether this is good. You have the expansion of all kinds of product lines where it's not only that there is more stuff available to more people, but that an aesthetic of a lot of excessive both scale and ornament comes along with these new synthetic ways of making things for the consumer market. I'm going to show you a bunch of furniture from the latter part of the 19th century. This is a Renaissance revival armoire, and it's made by a company in New York called the Herder Brothers. The Herder Brothers was kind of a fashionable furniture company that produced furniture not handcrafted for individual clients. This was furniture that was made to put in a showroom for people to come in and buy. Now, the interesting thing about this cabinet, if you look at it carefully, is it feels like you're looking at architectural ornament. In a way, it's, this cabinet is split up into three parts. Each part is held up by columns, and even the top of the cabinet looks like a cornice over a building. It's what furniture historians call Renaissance revival. What that means is the designers were looking at architecture from the Renaissance, and in a way, kind of miniaturizing it and bringing it down to the scale of the cabinet. Why was this going on? Because during this period, when design and the production of objects for the marketplace is expanding, the idea of giving things particular styles, and in this period, historical style became the thing that was the easiest in a way, I think, to sell or explain to people, became a kind of common practice. And you have a lot of things that fall into two large categories. One are objects that imitate Gothic architecture, like this cathedral that I'm showing you on the left, or things that imitate 
classical architecture, like this temple on the right. Why were they quoted so often during that time? In a way, they become symbols of two big important parts of the culture. Like the Gothic, because of its relationship to churches, is often thought of as being the thing that has to do with personal spirituality, ideas of the home, a kind of quieter, more contemplative environment. The classical is obviously where the ideas of Western democracy come from Greece and Rome, so the classical style has this resonance, this very outward-facing public declaration of the legitimacy of our political system through referencing those kinds of forms. Now, it might seem far-fetched to us in the 21st century that people would be able to look at these styles and read them for those qualities, but they were really common during that time, and they were even attached to kind of notions of gender. For instance, this is a cradle for a baby, and it's done in what's called Gothic revival, so that if you look at it, you see these miniaturized vignettes that have to do with astrological symbols, but they're treated almost like religious icons in a wooden frame that looks like it could be in a church. And again, the idea of kind of protecting the home with things that are Gothic would have been a kind of legible language. Now here's a mantelpiece clock that looks like a miniaturized classical temple. You see the clockworks in the middle and it's in this case, and this is like a bad eBay photo, so it's got spider webs on it, but you see it's literally encased in a small building. The company that made this clock probably offered you the exact same clock surrounded by different styles of cases. Again, this is a good example of the commercial use of style as a language to appeal to the consumer. This is just another example of a typical commercial clock at the time. The clock is a factory works, made in the factory. The cases are made in the factory. This one with its kind of dark marble, again, kind of looks vaguely Gothic and was probably thought of as a rather grand clock for a home. One of the odd things about the language of style is that sometimes designers, maybe they were overenthusiastic about the use of style, but you have another trend in mid-19th century design to mash a lot of different styles together. And part of that was, again, because the use of machinery and mechanized techniques to produce objects meant that it just became cheaper and faster to make things for the commercial market. And so you see people expending a lot of time, it seems, festooning objects with all kinds of symbolism. And the truth is, it appeared as if the designers were babbling. But often, this was blamed as the fault of the machine. But it really is not an anti-technology stance, but it did kind of highlight the relationship between the designer of these objects and the technology used to make the objects and the way that they ended up being sold. I should say at this point that one of the interesting things during this period is we don't really know who the designers were in a lot of factory-made objects. Designers weren't recognized the way they are today as having individual artistic or kind of design knowledge or design intelligence. You know, we know who the lead designer at Apple is, is Sir Johnny Ives, but we don't know who the designers of many of these objects, although we do know in many cases who owned the factory or who the manufacturer was. So the issue of the language of design that gets attached to this is kind of interesting because you're not always sure who is speaking. But the one thing that is often said about this period of the kind of middle Victoriana is that the audience was speaking in a way by the kind of choices they were making and the things that they were interested in. So when you see this overly grand bedroom set, this thing looks again like this almost architectural style. Like if you imagine these things in a room, you realize that it's as if you're building a room inside a room. 
you realize that the audience was really enthusiastic about the connection of the new way that they were living with somehow being validated by history. Even doll furniture, it's a little hard to tell that we're looking at dollhouse furniture, but this is like an 1870s set of furniture, and it's all chairs and sofa where everything is kind of bulbous and bulging and overly quilted and overly ornamented, and it speaks to the way that these sort of mixed message styles were integrated into 19th century design language. The other thing, as people became consumers in this new, different way, it's the same period where you have the invention of the department store. This is an old engraving of one of the first big department stores to be built in Philadelphia called Wanamaker's. And department stores became places of entertainment. So something that we're really acquainted with now, which is the idea of being entertained by the process of shopping, actually date all the way back to this period. This is a interior of a department store in New York City, the Siegel Cooper department store, which featured internal fountains, and it was one of the first places that had electric lights installed in it, and you were meant to walk around in awe, not only of the products, but of the shopping process itself. And even things like cash registers became encrusted in different kinds of ornament and graphic symbols because of this fantasy that gets attached to consuming at a grander scale and in a different way than other generations had before. 19th century typography exhibits a lot of the same characteristics of the commercial products that I've just shown you. And in fact, the thing that is the most recognizable about 19th century typography is really attached to the issue of being able to communicate to people in a new commercial context. This is a theater poster of the period where the things that are important, like the location of the theater, the name of the productions, handsome husband, he would be an actor, Olympic devils, get your attention because of this ultra bold typography. During this period, still, this is before you could put large-scale illustrations onto posters. So in a way, the only way to kind of grab attention in the kind of new, busy city environments was to exaggerate the type. And so you have typographers in Western Europe, in the United States, working on the expansion or exaggeration of book typefaces into typefaces that would work on public posters. These posters, for instance, this is for an, a lecture. It's a broadside announcing an astronomy lecture. And again, you see this lovely use of really large fonts to punctuate the poster. Your attention is really drawn by these fonts. So you have the beginnings of the exaggeration of letter forms, often exaggerating the thicks and the thins. For instance, this piece, or the other thing is, typical to this Victorian period, even the idea of taking the surface of the font and ornamenting it. So this German poster from the 1880s shows letter forms that literally have floral and architectural ornaments drawn on top of the font. It's also the period where some of the earliest commercial typography actually needs to stuff a lot of information onto the surface of poster. And the very first experiments with sans serif fonts date all the way back to the early 19th century and were specifically designed to be able to efficiently cram a lot of information into the interstitial parts of posters in order to allow for those big exaggerated words created by font design to happen as well. You have all kinds of formal experiments, like turning letter forms into 3D, like this font from the 1830s, or exaggerating peculiar elements. Again, many times the formal exaggerations will be given a kind of identity like this font which was called Tuscan, although it's really hard to identify why it might have been 
referred to in that manner, so that it kind of falls in line again with this interest in the sort of stylization and the exaggerated use of ornament as a way to contribute to visual clutter and be part of it as well. This is an American font, 1849, and this one, another American font. You probably look at these and think circus lettering, and the truth is these kinds of fonts, again, were used for public announcements and for all kinds of, you know, entertainments or announcing new publications or all kinds of commercial and cultural uses. And the fonts themselves were really popular, they were really valued, and they did this job to, you know, attract the attention of, of an audience on the street in a really powerful way. Here is an interesting example of just how the typography had to do the work to get the attention of an audience where the illustration couldn't. Like this is actually a poster announcing the availability in Ashland, Ohio of the McCormick's Reaper. You know, this was a really important new piece of equipment that farmers were interested in. But you can see there's this pale little woodcut of the reaper, and by the way, there was probably only one woodcut made of this reaper, and you can find announcements and posters from other places as well that, that use the same woodcut because it was really expensive to have an illustrator make a woodcut or an engraving at that time. So you have this little illustration in the middle. It's really the type gets your attention, and it has to do kind of a heavy lifting this is a really interesting circus poster from the 1860s announcing all the different features in that circus where each line has got a different kind of 3D lettering or shadowed lettering. This poster is unusual in that it actually uses two colors, so they spent some money to make it. But again, you can see that the promise of the excitement of the event is completely conveyed by this sort of incredibly lively typography. But even to this day, this kind of design where it's just plain, striking, heavy lettering on a colored background is actually a throwback all the way to the 19th century where the public announcements were conveyed typographically. Another thing that is from the kind of growth of the commercial world in the 19th century that graphic designers work with a lot is the idea of branding. Branding, although it was never called that, came out of the way that commercial products were both made and then sold and consumed. This slide that I'm showing you has actually 130 years of different logos, all based on the same logo of the Procter & Gamble Soap Company. Now, why did Procter & Gamble need a symbol? Because when they started the company, they started shipping their soap to other places. In shipment, a crate would have to be marked, or a box would have to be marked. And so companies started coming up with symbols that acted as both their identifying marks and which kind of were, were the one thing that would tell, say, a person who ran a grocery store somewhere far away that indeed this soap had come from Procter & Gamble. This takes the place of a situation where consumers would again have known who was their local soap maker. So you didn't need those kinds of identifying marks when products were made locally and sold locally. The whole issue of identifying products has to do with mass distribution. The contemporary era has trouble sometimes with 19th century imagery, some of the marks that haven't changed. For instance, Procter & Gamble, who used the man in the moon and what they claimed was the 13 stars of the um, first states of the American Republic, was misinterpreted in the 20th century as being a satanic symbol. But Procter & Gamble has in one way or another held on to the symbol as part of their inheritance, which goes back to the kind of claim that they had on identifying their products. Early advertising is 
really an interesting example of the limitations of both the way that things could be visualized and the limitations of newspaper announcements. These are two ads for one of the product areas, at least in the United States, that got the most attention and energy in terms of developing advertising for, which was the whole area of patent medicines. Patent medicines are kind of what we would think of today as being over the counter, but instead of coming from large pharmaceutical companies, a lot of patent medicine actually was locally produced, although then, you know, the more entrepreneurial people would try to sell them through newspaper ads and support the selling of their products to drugstores. What I'm showing you here are two kind of ordinary ads, but they're typical in that they really just kind of describe what the product is without really trying to attach a strong graphic identity to it. This is an infamous product label. Lydia Pinkham produced a kind of local something like cough medicine. It's called her herb medicine. And the Lydia Pinkham company was one that really grew from being a local company to one that had national distribution. The company used her face as the symbol of the product. And it's kind of, in a weird way, another example of how 19th century advertising imagery tried to comfort the audience with some sense of a connection to an individual that was like in the older, smaller, non-mass communication world. If you look at histories of advertising, you would discover that Lydia Pinkham Company actually did an experiment. They suspended advertising for a while because they were having a dispute with newspapers over how they were being charged for their national advertising. And their sales actually did dip severely. And although this product still exists today, what it did do was it kind of put them in jeopardy and they realized that advertising actually worked. And again, if you look at histories of advertising who cover the Lydia Pinkham company story, what you'll discover is that it was one instance where the power of advertising was conclusive, you know, that it was clear that people needed it. And it only aided and abetted the growth of advertising and a consciousness over the look, the messaging, and the kind of visual attention that advertising needed to have to compete. Again, we even see today you can go to the drugstore and buy Smith Brothers cherry cough drops, but that appearance of their faces on the box and the assurance that two individuals were responsible for this product that you could buy anywhere, and which actually, if you look carefully, it says trademark, had to do with both protecting their product legally from being copied and also was there to kind of give the audience a sense of security that the product was, was good and that they could vouch for it. Other people managed to parlay their reputations that were gained through advertising even into other directions. This is a picture of a large industrialized shoe factory in Massachusetts at the turn of the century called the W.L. Douglas Shoe Company. On all of his ads for W.L. Douglas, the uh, man who owned the company was always depicted. And in this ad with a picture of a happy family going shoe shopping, there's even his signature turned into the logo for the company, as you see right under the illustration. And he eventually ran for governor of Massachusetts and was elected, surely in part because he was already a celebrity from the appearance of his face over and over again in popular product advertising of the time. This is an ad for a brand of house paint called Ironclad. Ironclad was a nickname of a famous ship in a Civil War battle. And even though this is 30 years later, the idea of tough paint that will withstand moisture could be conveyed referring to a kind of celebrity boat. These connections were made in early advertising. And if we think about the way that we are constantly seeing celebrities in our 
visual environment today, you see that our inheritance is directly connected to this period. A thing that advertisers learned and that designers and illustrators serviced was the idea of the repetition of advertising, that you could get the audience's attention through clever repetition. This is maybe a little too repetitive and wonderfully surreal, an ad for a brand of baking powder where the package was a picture of the package of baking powder, which has a picture of the package of baking powder kind of moving back into infinity on the product. You see humor, like these rat traps, which actually have a label that says out of sight rat trap, where the advertising is applied directly to the product. And then it's also the period where the idea of an imaginary person who can brand a product comes into play. Now this is a little later, this is 1898, as you can tell from this beautifully colored illustration. This is probably what was called a chromolithograph, where color is used to sell products. And the Unita Biscuit Boy was a famous logo for the National Biscuit Company, which we now know as Nabisco. And the idea, again, of connecting a person, even if they're a fake person, to a product to give it some kind of humanity and personality to make up for the fact that everybody knew it was made in a giant factory somewhere and then shipped across the country is kind of connected. So the idea of appealing to the consumer even with clever messaging around emotional or charming subjects gets attached to the selling of commercial products. Some things are allegedly derived from the owner of the product, like the Ford logo, which is still used in one form or another, is a stylized calligraphic rendering of Ford's handwriting. Other things like the Coca-Cola logo, which were trademarked really early, is this kind of beautiful calligraphic rendering of the idea of something that's smooth and pleasurable. And you see it coming out of the period where images were maybe not as useful as strong lettering was, but they kept using it because of its visual power. To show you what advertising couldn't do, here again is an example of an ad. This is from a company that sold lawnmowers and it shows you pictures of lawnmowers and exactly how they worked. And the copy just describes what the lawnmowers, how they were made and what they did. You could say that this ad, it has no consumer appeal. This ad is an early ad and it's from before the period where advertising agencies realized that they could start to sell creative services, that they could start to bring ideas to the sell selling of commercial objects that were more than just coordinating an illustration with a descriptive piece of text. Sometimes those early ads, it's not that they're not interesting, like this is an, an ad for a sewing machine company. It just tells you that it's where your, the sewing machines that they're selling are made. I think it's very humorous that it tells you that the front of the factory is 560 feet long. You're supposed to be impressed and look again at the sewing machine because of the grandeur of the place where it was made. But again, as advertisers start to be creative, one of the things you see is the integration of an ordinary illustration, like this typewriter ad, has an engraving, an engraved picture of the typewriter that just shows what the thing looks like. But above it, in quote marks, it says, bristling with novelties. And that's text that obviously has been treated by the designer as a slogan. And it's meant to get your attention in a way, still making up for the fact that the picture is actually kind of ordinary. You know, again, if you look at that ad, there's a lot of information on it. It's organized typographically. The different kinds of fonts are organized in a hierarchy for the reader to understand the message. But here you could really say that it is the words that are doing the work. Another good example, this is a really early ad for the Kodak camera. You know, the Kodak camera was one of the first American cameras made so that anybody could afford it. 
and it was made to be incredibly simple. It took no professional skill to run it. So here you have a description, the Kodak camera. It describes in the text what it can do, and it just shows you with this engraving of two, <laughs> two hands holding the object what it looks like. So that's the earliest version. But here, in a slightly later version, there you see another version of the same image, but suddenly you have, under the Kodak camera, in quote marks, a slogan, you press the button, we do the rest. And you see the words attempting to aid your appreciation of that product that they're trying to sell you, and then typographically it's integrated into the text of the ad. This is an ad from a famous series of soap ads for a product called Sapolio from the 1890s where there's a description and an argument about why the soap is good that runs in the middle of the ad, but both on the top and the bottom are a kind of sequence of almost kids' book illustrations of fanciful figures holding the product and a poem or song lyrics about something called Spotless Town. The Sapolio ads were famous for this series of jingles that were integrated into the printed ads so that if you didn't want to read the dry description of what the product did, you still had this kind of entertainment attached. And it also, this ad again has a more sophisticated imagery because it appears at a point in newspapers where illustrations can be engraved and where the possibilities of integrating text and image have increased. When chromolithography comes along, you do have the power where the imagery or the illustration is being put to work to do things beyond the power of words. So this ad for something called the domestic sewing machine has this elaborate illustration of a groom showing his bride her lovely new wedding gift of the sewing machine. Of course, it's also putting her to work. And maybe if you were looking at this ad at the time, you might have not have noticed that the sewing machine actually was about domestic work and not about the glamour of a party at a wedding. This is an earlier promotional photograph for the famous Singer sewing machine showing a woman using it which also shows an interesting thing about the Singer sewing machine, which was that it came in a crate that could also double as the sewing machine table. But this kind of imagery is much more photographic, much more documentary. It's really a photograph set up to inform the possible owner of a sewing machine what to expect rather than to seduce the possible owner of a sewing machine like that wedding advertisement into the idea of buying the product. There's a lot of advertising from around the turn of the century that exhibits a type of print advertising that exists to this day. But when you look at it as a graphic designer, what you should notice is the relationship of text to image and what is doing the work, or how these things integrate with each other. Everything I'm about to show you next are the products of ad agencies that were offering clients what are now called creative services. Copywriters, illustrators, photographers. And what you see in the older ads are miniature stories with a lot of text, actually a lot more than we generally see in advertising today which describe the product, and then visualizations, like this General Electric ad for electric fans that shows two people looking over a city, the picture of the fan is on the left side of the image, and the text says, down where nature cannot send her cooling breezes, science sends the electric fan. So it's meant to think of if you were up high on a balcony, you might feel the wind. And so it's a very descriptive image but then not trusting that the customer might get the idea just from the image, there's also a long story. It's really interesting during this time, the fact that ads often have a thousand words of copy or more in them. It's almost as if there was still a distrust that images really told the story. Like this is an ad for tobacco where six 
kind of minor celebrities are used to describe how tobacco helps them through their day, helps them, as the headline says, maintain their efficiency. But really, the story is in the text and not in the imagery. Here's a crazy story describing how embarrassing it can be if you forget your deodorant with this kind of murky picture, which would be hard to interpret without this kind of long story attached to it describing the subject. And finally, another point to be raised about advertising during this time and these long narratives attached to it is that they are often pointed at people who got their information from commercial publications, from magazines, and who might not understand what the use of the product was. So often these long stories describe why you need the product, how to use it, how it could save you money, or in this case, a set of ads selling books on etiquette, how it's going to save you from embarrassing yourself because you don't know which fork to use at the table. Last week, we observed that mass production, consumption, and what we know today as branding emerged in the 19th century thanks to industrialization. Moving into the 20th century, creative people began to look at how mechanization could influence how things looked, as well as how they were made. The Bauhaus, a name you've probably heard, was a school located in Germany for a short period of time between the First and Second World Wars. The Bauhaus proposed a whole new way of thinking about art, visual forms, and media, as well as a new way of teaching how to make these things. New concepts about visual form were applied to all sorts of media, from pottery and textiles, to film and architecture, as well as graphic design. The Bauhaus responded to a new century, modern, simple, abstract forms for modern times. Bauhaus faculty and students dedicated their work to a future where design would play an expanded role by creating a new aesthetic for consumer goods made by machine and for communication conveyed by mass media. I want to start with this painting that was made by Oscar Schlemmer, who was on the faculty of the Bauhaus. And the painting is called The Bauhaus Stairway. And it depicts students going up the stairway at the Bauhaus in Dessau. And the thing that's incredible about this painting is that it really captures something about the Bauhaus, that it was a place that felt it was kind of inventing the 20th century. The Bauhaus was a school which only lasted from 1919 to 1933, so only 14 years. And it had two locations. It started out in Weimar, Germany, and it moved to, the, to Dessau. And in some ways, it's a very important school if you're an art student in the United States because the ideas that were put together at the Bauhaus really influenced the way that art was taught here. And it, it actually, the way it was taught everywhere in the 20th century. So these students who look like kind of perfect, almost robotically perfect, beautiful, sleek avatars of some kind of future. In fact, one of the students appears to be levitating in the upper left-hand corner of the painting. Um, as they're going up the stairs, they're illuminated by light, and it's an incredibly utopian scene, which really captures the high ideal of the Bauhaus, which was to somehow integrate art and industry, those two major forces in the culture, which designers had been struggling with and essentially trying to figure out how the 20th century would be defined by the, all of the shifts that had occurred in the century before, but to finally capture them and to find form for them and to express the, what 
the 20th century was supposed to be. I want to contrast that with this actual picture of a group of, of students, actually all of them women, because they were in the weaving department, going up the stairway at the Bauhaus. And I think there are wonderful things about this picture that connect to that painting in terms of the students and their enthusiasm and the energy that's conveyed in this picture. You would never guess from the painting that uh, women were actually forced into the weaving department <laughs> because it was deemed a more appropriate place for women to put their artistic energies into. But despite that, it's still, I think, both documents capture the high ideals of the school. This is the logo from the first iteration of the Bauhaus in Weimar, where they serve geometries of a set of straight lines and squares are used to create the letters that go around the crest of the school. It says Stadtliche Bauhaus Weimar, which means something like State School of Bauhaus. It was in part sponsored by the Weimar government, the local province that the Bauhaus existed in. And the intention of the school was to educate students for the 20th century for the idea that the kinds of skills that were going to be needed to enhance the use of and the expansion of design into architecture and into industrial design and pro product design, communications, that all of those things were integrated into an idea that art and architecture and design were on equal footing and were of equal importance. So another thing that the Bauhaus tried to do, or another way of explaining it, is that they felt that the craft of the 20th century would be design, and that the kind of translation of all various ideas about, about modern art experiences could be integrated into a new way of educating students. When you look at the very early-ish publications by the Bauhaus, one of the things that's interesting, and maybe not what most people expect to see, is a tremendous amount of very energetic hand-lettered announcements, like this cover of a portfolio of prints that were produced by various people connected with the Bauhaus. And the lettering is by Lionel Feininger. And it's, again, it's very handcrafted, but it's clearly modern. It's kind of built out of the kinds of lines and forms that were connected with expressionism and other kind of graphic languages at the time. And it aligns with the kinds of woodcuts that Feininger, one of the early faculty, were connected with. And all of these graphic things represent a sort of energy and, again, a kind of sort of utopian hopes that the school would open up a new era of connection between the culture on one side and the way that artists fit into a society that was so framed by, by production, by mass production and mass communication. So this is a diagram of how the school was organized. Uh, Walter Gropius, who was the director, created this kind of donut of a diagram. And in the very center of it is bow, which means architecture. So the idea that architecture encompassed all of the practices or was the thing that integrated all of the practices kind of is what puts the school firmly into the realm of being a place where design is given so much focus. But I want to start by looking at the outer circle, which basically says elementary studies in form, and then also material studies. Now, what was that? If you think about the way that you are taught in uh, maybe the first year of design or art school, to this day, in many schools, although not CalArts, <laughs> you get what's called foundation year, which is a year where you study basic composition, you might experiment in different materials that you've never used before, and you kind of work to think about both ideas and forms together, and the way you know the materials or the way you might work with them are all connected. 
that actually was invented at the Bauhaus. And what it replaced was traditional art education where basically the way you learned to be an artist was drawing, 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 and more drawing. That was a kind of older style that built your design education through draftsmanship. And then if you wanted to become a specialist in something, maybe you were apprenticed to a woodworker to learn to be, be a sculptor in wood. You work through experience. Or you might have learned a craft, like you might have learned how to become a ceramicist. But the Bauhaus treated all materials as equal things and really focused on design and focused on the place of those different practices in this overall kind of world of, of art and design. So from that outer level, how you enter into learning how to become the artist slash designer of the 20th century, it's through these, this kind of beginning of, of a foundation year. And then you move on to learning or specializing in a material. In this case, as you go through the circle, some of it is glass, some of it is fabric. And so there was a bit of everything in the middle. And as you stayed on as a student, you picked one of those areas where you were essentially in an apprenticeship relationship with one of the Bauhaus faculty who were specialists in that area. And then students came together and collaborated in some of the architecture projects, the interiors projects, all kinds of performances and other group activities. So although it, everything I'm saying may sound really familiar to you, even some high schools have kind of Bauhaus-oriented curriculum now to this day, it really gets invented at the Bauhaus and put into plan. I have many images that I'm about to show you of Bauhaus student projects. These are projects, so they're not like great masterpieces of design, but they show you the kinds of things that people did in that first year. Like this study of lines and solid forms and a composition, which then gets rendered both positive and negatively, or this study of the nature of different lines. I mean, these things are just classroom exercises, but the notion of learning through a kind of process of handling different kinds of materials was what was the new idea here. Or even this really rough color exercise is a way of showing that color would be isolated and kind of looked at almost scientifically, but then you would do it with materials and it, the point wasn't to make a beautifully designed thing, but to learn the nature of color and the nature of the way that one could work with it to apply it at a, at a later phase. Another really interesting aspect of the early Bauhaus student work is that you see the kind of creativity of students being um, set free, especially in the material studies classes, so that the process of making things was clearly part of the premise of the course, to learn to be comfortable with working with different kinds of material and to think compositionally in even the kind of wackiest group projects, like this picture of an installation of different material studies projects. You can even see that it appears that a lot of the work was made out of things that were scavenged or, you know, are sort of looks like people maybe even um, were picking things out of the garbage to make their student work with. The early years of the Bauhaus around Weimar, the economy in Germany was still terrible after World War I, and a lot of the student projects appear to be, have been made with uh, little or no money. But you see this kind of incredible creativity around the use of things that are already out there. And in a way, it fits in with other experiments that were going on by artists during the period. For instance, if you look at Pablo Picasso, you'll see him taking newspaper cuttings of headlines and putting them into paintings. Dada artists were using found material. And at the Bauhaus, that kind of idea, that avant-garde idea of accepting the world as it is and working with it becomes part of, literally, of the curriculum through these kinds of studies 
that are based on the use of really simple, almost found materials. Some things are more clearly organized, like this plaster relief, which is a, another compositional study that by painting it all white has made the form come out clearly as the thing that is being looked at. But then on the other hand, a project like this one where a student scavenged pieces of metal and makes a sort of sculptural composition against a piece of wood clearly highlights the different natures of those two radically different materials and says something about developing an eye on how to get an idea out of the design of actual material itself. Not everybody loved the Bauhaus, at least in its early years. This is actually a postcard sent by Theo van Doesburg, who was a Dutch architect and all-around artistic troublemaker, who thought that the Bauhaus was, in a way, too open-ended and created and not really delivering on its dream to integrate art and design as fully as it should. In fact, I think it was things like Oscar Schlemmer's dance performances that perhaps made Van Doesburg think that there, it, there were too many fun and games. Although this famous picture of a group of Dadaists and constructivists visiting the Bauhaus in 1922 looks like they were able to have fun at the Bauhaus also and have some kind of influence over the direction of the school. That, that influence was to, again, underline the fact that architecture was meant to be the focus of the school. And there were many interesting projects that came out of that work and which affect graphic design in terms of the way that design was thought of, even across all these different practices. Like this project by Gropius of a, something called a construction kit, which clearly shows this kind of modular and rationalized way of thinking about abstract composition with the idea of it ending in an architectural form. These kinds of very straightforward and simplified uses of both modularity and, and a sort of simple abstract way of composing spaces can be seen in a lot of the early design from the Bauhaus during this time. And even in things that are heavily crafted, like this wooden chair by Breuer, or this applique project by a student, or this rug by Johannes Itten, which makes this gorgeous pattern out of a simple design of straightforward lines, either running parallel or crisscross, to create a pattern out of primary colors and gray. This picture of Gropius's office, I believe this is a recreation of his office, shows a, a variety of different designs by student and faculty meant to come together and show this integration of the idea of great formal creativity. And this issue of the more experimental work and utopian directed work at the Bauhaus versus the things that could actually be realized practically was a kind of constant tension during the short life of the school. The simple form of this poster by Herbert Beyer, who first was a Bauhaus student and then a faculty, shows how radical the push was to simplify form and to address this issue of connecting design aspects of the Bauhaus to other modern design going on in Europe especially Germany and Russia and places where the constructivist style had sort of set an agenda of simplified form. The Bauhaus kind of takes it, I think, and gives it even greater visual power. This is a picture of the Bauhaus building in construction in Dessau. And the thing that's so interesting about this building is that you might think at first you were looking at a factory. And again, that desire to essentially train artists of the 20th century in spaces that were industrial spoke to this desire to make that connection. And it's kind of interesting in a way that the taste, I think, of even contemporary artists of working in spaces that maybe were factory lofts and things like that, to have a beautiful industrial space that you have your studio in. And it connects back to the way the Bauhaus conceived of the appropriate place of art production in the 20th century. 
Another really important aspect of those kinds of formal studies and which has to do with the language developed by students in their work at the Bauhaus can be seen in a book that Paul Clay wrote about his teaching methods called the Pedagogical Sketchbook. And in the Pedagogical Sketchbook, he demonstrates the idea that the simplest of forms, like on this page that I'm showing you, that line that looks like an S lying on its side, he calls it an active line on a walk moving freely without a goal, a walk for walk's sake. And then he talks about how by adding things to it, like a curly Q line interacting with that S, or straight lines emanating from that S, how you get a completely different nature of understanding that form. He saw that kind of formal language as literally a way of developing a language that would replace not words, but which could indicate ideas, almost a symbolic language. And you see it in the work that he made during that period where the simplest indications of form with straight lines and circles, like this great drawing from his Bauhaus period called the Twittering Machine, indicates a kind of whole universe of these funny creatures making noise through this totally simplified formal language. And that simplicity and that boiling down of form into the, the contrasts between negative space and positive space, between line and solids, between the indication of movement versus the indication of stillness. All of this works toward creating that almost cliched vocabulary in our minds now of what the Bauhaus looked like and how it really influenced 20th, the 20th century. I mean, the humorous thing is you can, to this day, go into you know a museum store and find Bauhaus-influenced products, and they still look like things that we recognize as being modern. In part, it's because of this simplicity of form, the way that the, the formal language was boiled down to the simplest of shapes. This is a, another, um, it's actually the cover of a document of a studio run by Oscar Schlemmer. And I, this is attributed to Schlemmer, but the way that the word utopia is rendered by hand as a sort of set of, form, of letter forms made through these kind of simple lines and solids and the use of really clear, straightforward color is again another example of the simplicity and strength of this form. Actually, Schlemmer used the same kinds of forms to design amazingly inventive costumes for dance productions that he staged at the Bauhaus and in other places. One of the famous ones was called the Triadic Ballet. These are just the poster and some quick costume pictures um, from the ballet. But you see the sort of expansion of that simplified set of forms into three dimensions and then aided and abetted by this incredible wit and imagination about the kind of creation of new forms of beings out of this formal language. Although I think one of the most interesting is this famous image of him performing something called the pole dance, whereby just simply adding these kind of straightforward extended poles to the lines of his body, he turns his own body into something that looks like an abstract drawing. Another important faculty at the Bauhaus was Joseph Albers. This is a picture of him sitting in a bent tubular steel chair designed by Marcel Breuer. Albers took over parts of the Bauhaus that had to do with graphic design, although again, his own work ranges from media as wide as drawing and painting to incorporating things like this stained glass sculpture where sort of chicken wire and a grid of metal create a structure to do this beautiful color study in colored glass. This promotional photograph for the Breuer chair using a student wearing a Schlemmer mask again links that idea of a kind of both a humor but a serious look at what the future might bring that is essentially part of the Bauhaus brand. 
This is a picture of Maholi Naj, who joined the Bauhaus faculty around 1925, and he was a Hungarian artist, photographer, designer. He did everything, and he really brings to the Bauhaus another dimension where integration of art and industry under his watch becomes even more strengthened. A lot of his sculptures, actually both before he got to the Bauhaus, like this one, and some later on, really seem to expand upon that notion of making art out of the materials of the 20th century. So things that have the effect of industrial parts that are treated radically differently as components of abstract compositions are part of his work. And most famously, a project that he worked on for years, starting at the Bauhaus, called the Light Space Modulator, which was a sculpture that was uh, set on a base connected to a rotary engine so that this sculpture was kinetic and moved and by projecting light on it the sculpture was one thing but the patterns cast by the sculpture and the different effects that are created in the room by this piece are possibly the most forward-looking work produced at the Bauhaus and that Maholi Naj was so interested in the relationship of the entire environment to technology and to essentially design for effects. He was always associated with experiments in photography and film as well, and the light space modulator attests to this interest of his in light and space as part of the new media that artists would be working with as well. If you look at a lot of Bauhaus projects, sort of with x-ray eyes, what you see are things that are beautiful abstract compositions, like this is Herbert Beyer's design for a newspaper kiosk. And if you just look at it, you see a cube with a sign on top, and it's two rectangular shapes that integrate, that have that white arrow that kind of curves around and points down to the kiosk. And then the kiosk has almost a Dada kind of collage advertisement on one side and the window to buy the magazine on the other. The design of the kiosk itself is this kind of very constructed architectural space. That bright primary color, again, is meant to attract your attention. And then the application of the words on it turn it into a piece of three-dimensional graphic design. Bayer was really interested in, again, these kind of modern spaces, like this design for the lobby of a cinema. That's a movie theater screen that you see in the upper right-hand corner, is applying the same idea of a color palette, basic graphic design space, and then this dynamic use of lettering that's linked to the architectural space. The graphic design that Bayer produced at the Bauhaus, this is for a lecture by a visiting architect, has the same sense of the space of the poster having a kind of architectural structure and then the lettering helps you perceive just what that space is, like the way the word Polzig in those giant sans serif letters hugs the bottom of the poster and the date on the upper right hand corner, the big February 26, the way that grabs your attention to that corner, and then the way that the dynamic of the red circle in the center kind of connects those two. This very like considered placement of typography in a space practically gets as close to an architectural rendering of space as you can get in two dimensions. Here's another Herbert Beyer poster celebrating the 60th birthday of another faculty, Vasily Kandinsky. And while everything appears to be more in motion because of that slight angle, it's, you still have this sense of a room being created literally by the way that the words are placed on the page. And that structure that's endemic to his design at that time has great clarity.
Here is an interesting, it's a catalog for the Bauhaus that Herbert Beyer designed where he uses what I'm pretty sure is probably a Maholi Nash photograph. Again, simply rendering a most abstract view of that building and using it as an iconic form. Or this interesting first volume of a Bauhaus magazine where he takes a set of tools that a design student might use, like the pencil and the clear drafting triangle, and then these kind of white sculptural forms of a cone, a cube, and a ball as symbolic renderings of the basic tools and the basic forms that were the obsessions at the Bauhaus during that time. While Bayer was most well known for typography and publication design and advertising posters that he did when he wasn't teaching at the Bauhaus, he too, kind of like Maholi Naj, was interested in multimedia and expanded ideas of spaces that design and especially graphic designers would work in. So this is a really interesting diagram that he made of an exhibition of how one might think of the design of an exhibition that incorporated many panels or points of view so that you were thinking not only of what the viewer of an exhibition might see right in front of them, but what they might see in the periphery of their vision and how they might imagine an environment that's filled with graphic design. There are other renderings of this diagram that exist but what is so important about it is, again, this kind of connection of the idea of maybe a more immersive media, which could have come from thinking about film or even those light space experiments of Maholi Naj, and thinking about applying buyer's work and thinking about applying those ideas to the design of exhibitions where with print in a space you emulated this more environmentally expansive point of view. This sketch clearly indicates a space that you can imagine walking through and seeing things from different points of view, and it speaks to this area of work that Bayer was so interested in about turning two dimensions into three and thinking about how the audience might interact with that. I've already shown you a color exercise by a student working with Paul Clay. Color treated as a material that a designer or an architect or an artist would have to gain expertise was a major aspect of work at the Bauhaus and, and several interesting color studies and pieces of work that are evidence of the attention paid to color are part of the Bauhaus documents today. And you see them both graphically, like two-dimensional, or thinking about the application of color in architectural space, three-dimensionally, or even just sort of flat exercises to look at the way color can either come forward or recede because of the way that our eye understands it. Those classes that were called design for either commercial design or layout often involved studying letter forms not just for the design of the page or a poster but thinking about letter forms in architectural space again as a three-dimensional project however the fascinating thing about the way students could use found objects like this student who uses a newspaper photograph and then integrates type into the image and then shows the image without the integration is another kind of good example of exploring the nature of material even in graphic design itself. And this is uh, another student project from a set of exercises that Joseph Albers would assign students to use the typewriter to generate patterns the idea of making your design using a simple technology was clearly an area of interest at the Bauhaus. And it connects to the way that photography was taught as well. This is one of Maholi Naj's famous photogram projects where he essentially would bring objects into the darkroom and using multiple exposures directly onto photo paper, create prints. Maholi said something, and I'm probably not saying this exactly correctly, 
But one of his famous phrases was, the literacy of the future would be based on photography. That if you didn't know how to make a picture, it would be as if you didn't know how to read. And so the integration of photography, both as a project in itself and a way of documenting work, and also a way of connecting the thinking about photography with film. For instance, these pictures that Maholi Nash took of the Bauhaus in Dessau seem like film stills in that you're really conscious of where the camera is because of the artificially extreme points of view in the different pictures. All of this speaks to an idea at the Bauhaus about the camera being a major medium of the 20th century. The crafts at the Bauhaus were treated as an extension of the material studies with the idea that objects might be made one of a kind, but also might be designed for mass production. So when you look at some of the works by either faculty, this is Annie Albers, or this student tapestry, which also utilizes very straightforward geometry and that Bauhaus palette of the primary colors. These things were designed with a simplicity that if they were to be replicated, they could be. And so that notion, even in some of the more complex pieces of a kind of viability of this design, is part of that Bauhaus inheritance. Things like ceramics were again designed so that the actual object could be replicated. Like this is the design for a pot, which then could be molded and made in mass quantities. So the idea of linking new design to production. And of course, the other idea was that the Bauhaus could link to local companies who then might actually produce these works and be able to sell them. Interestingly, some of the most radical metalworking done at the Bauhaus was by a woman named Marianne Brandt. This is the design of an ashtray and of a teapot, where you can see that the issue was not only mastering the art of metalsmithing, but rethinking the form of a conventional object that everybody knows for everyday use into a kind of form that is thinking about the future of the 20th century. There was a lot of type design going on at the Bauhaus. Again, experiments in taking the notion of modularity and structure and trying to make it work for the alphabet. Like this is a student project developing a stencil type where a vertical unit that has a kind of radius edge creates a set of simple forms. And here's a student drawing learning how to design and draw what is called a grotesque or a sans serif letter. When you look at posters during this time, a lot of them don't look like they're hand drawn, but they are. And that's because the students didn't necessarily have access to typesetting of a scale. And so the notion of building a letter geometrically out of these same shapes had this appeal again as a kind of constructed letter form using the same kind of modularity and simplicity that the architectural work that was going on at the Bauhaus had as well. And Herbert Beyer was interested in the idea of trying to eliminate capital letters in a further simplification of typography. Maybe you know that in German typesetting, nouns are often capitalized and this convention of typesetting seemed old-fashioned to Bayer, and he wanted to come up with what we would now call a unicase, meaning an alphabet that doesn't have capital letters or lowercase letters. This is one of his drawings for what he called the universal type design. As a result, in a lot of Bauhaus printing, you see the use of things like it, and especially the elimination of capital letters in typesetting. But here's Herbert Beyer actually not doing a Bauhaus project, but this is a poster that he designed for an exhibition on decorative arts in 1927. And this is a clearly kind of entirely hand-drawn font. It's not his unicase, but you can see, you sense by looking at the letters that they're all drawn along the same grid, the stroke on both the 
round parts of the letter and the straight lines of the letter are all the same and it has that kind of uniform modularity which of course is exaggerated by the way he places it on this grid of rectangles of different colors. At the Bauhaus there was a publication program and certainly one of the reasons the Bauhaus was so influential even though it only lasted for such a short period of time had to do with the fact that they often published the projects that they were working on. In part this was because they were dependent on government money and so they needed to give proof of how they were spending their educational budget. So this is the first of a series of things called the Bauhaus books which was a book about international architecture done in 1925 that not only surveys the Bauhaus but also looks at the work of other architects who'd either been visitors or who were connected to it so that there was this interesting desire on the part of the Bauhaus to connect itself to larger movements going on in the world. This is Maholi Naj's very interesting issue number eight of the Bauhaus books, which the cover translates into painting, photography, film. The cover has one of his photogram projects on it. And it has the most interesting interior in that he tries to take the page and split it up into a diagram where you're really self-conscious of moving from one rectangle to the other. And it feels like you're watching a film that's being cut. And even his use of the word tempo kind of implies that he's conscious of the time that it might take you to read through this book. So the notion of trying to connect ideas that come out of film to, you know, even to the sort of static space of a graphic design page is incredibly interesting. I'm not saying that this project works, but it's one of the most clear early experiments in trying to capture something about media in motion into two dimensions, which, of course, graphic designers had to struggle with all the way until we finally got to start designing websites 70 years later. These are more examples of the photographic, this kind of interesting interchange between film, photography, sculpture, and then the basic composition that underlied all of that work. And the consciousness of the work being part of a 20th century vocabulary of art making that wasn't just stuck in the conventional media of painting or sculpture. The issue of experimentation and learning through experimentation and learning a process thinking about design based on a set of simple concepts which then can get expanded in almost any direction are what truly make the Bauhaus such a powerful example for design students even up to present day. We've looked at the new visual language of modernism introduced to design through the Bauhaus. But what happens to modern design when it is introduced to America after World War II, a country then on the brink of transformation from more rural and agricultural to urban and industrial, an infrastructure of modern conveniences and mass media was just being put in place. As businesses grew into corporations, they looked to graphic design to create powerful identities to represent their diverse products and services to wide-ranging audiences. Designers began to use bold, symbolic languages rather than literal depictions. Their compositions compressed ideas, sometimes complex ones, into powerful yet simple forms across multiple media, from logos to print to television. This week, we'll be looking at these ideas through the work of four designers who evolved the concepts of mid-century modernism, each in their own way.
There's a lot of argument about when American design really became modern, but a lot of people agree that the start of graphic design as we know it in the United States began with the work of a group of younger people who were kind of looking at things going on in Europe, mainly the Bauhaus, and then looking at modern art and starting to think more creatively about the kinds of commercial assignments that commercial artists could get and started making work that fused typography and symbols together in really new ways. It's always hard to look at work of the past and recognize just how unusual it looked because we don't know what we're comparing it to. But everything we're looking at in this sequence is work that really appeared radically new when it came out. I want to start with the work of Lester Beale. Lester Beale was a young designer who went to the University of Chicago. He graduated in the middle of the Depression. In one of his memoirs, he writes about spending a lot of time in the library looking at magazines about modern art and contemporary art both in Europe and the United States. And when he starts to make work, he starts making really interesting and unusual things, like this cover for a small magazine that was actually speaking to an audience of printers. It was called PM. It meant Printers Monthly. And it was just an industry magazine published out in New York that mostly carried news about the printing business, but would also have special articles about ideas that were going on in the contemporary world that would be of interest to people making the advertising that the printers were hoping to print. This is a cover by Lester Beale for an issue that's dedicated to the Bauhaus. And the interesting thing is it uses black and red and the big, almost abstract, contrasty composition where just the initials P and M and then two red bars create the form of the cover. It's super striking. But the interesting thing is that P, which looks like one of those old Victorian woodcut P's, is not really a Bauhaus element. It's something that would have, to Lester Beale's mind, been more American, more American vernacular. And the way he kind of makes a collision with that P and then that big square serifed abstracted M is a really beautiful way of kind of reclaiming now this new visual language for an American audience. He created some really unusual work at that time that utilized a lot of things that came out of modernist work in Europe, like this cover of a book called Modern Pioneers in Peoria, where he manages to put together an airbrushed illustration of Davy Crockett laid over a picture of a factory, laid over a machinery, the back cover with the H. You have to put the idea together in your mind by looking at all of the pieces of the composition. So it connects the present and the past so that the idea of pioneers in Peoria is not only the history of Peoria, but also pioneering industries. And then the entire thing is kind of tied together with this energetic swoopy black line that is meant, I think, to create a mental map for you. Lester Beale moved to New York City and he started doing a lot of freelance design. This is a book for a company that made photo engravings. Those were the kinds of metal slugs that were needed to print illustrations in newsprint at that time. He, instead of showing you exactly how photo engraving works, uses an image of a hand and the idea of transferring an image in the positive and the negative with a fragment of a photo of a hand cut off by that big black diagonal line that divides the double page spread. And then that big swooping white shape behind it all, which creates a kind of frame that doesn't exactly fit, but which has this great visual energy around a straightforward description of how photo engraving works. Lester Beale in this piece has reimagined how you could describe or teach somebody about a technical process. One of the things about 
this time period, and Lester Beale's work really shows it, is the interest in utilizing symbols and putting symbols together to create an idea that has more complexity than a conventional illustration. This is a poster that Lester Beale designed for a governmental entity, the U.S. Housing Authority. And it's a poster advocating the building of new housing to replace substandard housing in slums. It's kind of a scary poster. It says, slums breed crime. And you see behind an image of a hand in a shackle, like somebody who's been arrested, a photograph of a police action in a neighborhood with substandard housing. You're meant to see them both together and to carry away a kind of memory that's bolstered by the combination of the symbol and the realistic imagery. Here's another poster for the same entity where a hand that is literally crossing out a picture of substandard housing shows a photograph in the hand of the new government-built housing, which is landscaped and painted and obviously looks more inhabitable. But the overall image is of the new crossing out the old. It's a complex strategy for making an image that you will remember for its overall symbol and then perhaps think back to the detail under it. For a while, in a series of posters that Lester Beale designed for the Rural Electrification Administration that was funding basically infrastructure projects, mostly in rural areas, to put in proper electricity and in some cases water. He created a set of posters which were meant to hang in the offices of the Rural Electrification Administration, which utilized big, bold, brightly colored symbols and then simple, straightforward graphic elements like lines that appear like rays of light or indications of energy, or this poster, which advocates, again, the work for providing running water, which simply shows an outline of a faucet and the idea of water being indicated both by the blue background and then the arrows moving through the shape of the faucet. These posters are like haiku, those short form Japanese poems that mean to create an idea with as little as possible. In Lester Beale's posters during this time, it's almost as if he's created a game for himself to see just how simple a set of symbols he can create to make a memorable idea in a poster. A more complicated set of posters for the same agency are seen in this design where he uses the red, white, and blue of the American flag to subtly remind people that the benefits that are coming from this agency are part of the government. Another series uses pictures of black and white photographs of people attesting to the benefits of the activities of the government. For instance, this woman doing her sewing by an electric lamp with the simple words, now I'm satisfied, or the, this one of a man next to his horse just simply saying things look better. Things look better under light, and that's indicated by that large white shape and the bright yellow background. So the energy of color and those big abstract shapes that you see in this series hold together the idea of the advancement of the future and happy outcomes. Here's another from the same series, Back to the Red, White, and Blue, advocating again electricity in the role of defense of the country, or this poster that utilizes a man using electrified farm equipment. The electricity and all the things that are new are really symbolized by the color and the form. It's this interesting balance that Beale achieves between the photograph and how he frames it in these posters that work so well. These are some examples of Lester Beale's work. The magazine was called Scope. The fascinating thing about this cover is that Beale uses an old engraving. By that I mean he found an old woodcut and he 
detailed it and blew it up. So you can really see the graphic nature of that old cut. So it's an old fashioned kind of image, right? Except not really because he's detailed, he's gone in on it, he's enlarged it, and he's made it into this really powerful graphic format. And then he has imposed a set of dots that wrap, this is just the front cover, but they wrap around to the back. And the dots are printed in transparent ink, and they are red, yellow, and blue, which are the primary colors, but they're also kind of faded and a little bit sickly looking. And the entire thing is supposed to kind of remind you of the nauseated feeling you might experience in choppy waters. It's really a brilliant use of color and the transparency of ink over this graphic element, and it really creates this powerful poster. Later on in Lester Beale's career, he became one of the first designers to create a practice, and this is a picture of him in his office looking at all the logos that he had designed for different companies. So he was able to take his thinking about the use of symbols and apply them to identities for local corporations. This is a double page spread from a book that Lester Beale designed for a local insurance company, Connecticut General. And it takes the initials of the company, a C and a G. He creates this kind of lozenge shape. Actually, to your eyes, it might look like a skateboard. And that is the logo that can be used either as one of a kind or in graphic patterns like the way you see the logo stacked here. This document is actually what's called a corporate identity manual. And what it does is it shows other designers who might work with Connecticut General how to take the design that Lester Beale has done and apply it. This is a way that designers develop their practices after World War II so that they were not always just working inside companies but could work outside as consultants. This is another uh, document that is designed by Beale to describe the kinds of typography and the kinds of color palettes that could be used for Connecticut General documentation. Again, this is a design for other designers to be able to follow so that as companies grew and as their communication needs grew more and more, they could essentially keep design consistent there's a kind of beauty in the practicality of the use of both abstract form and then simplified typography in order to keep a corporate identity consistent. Yeah. This is another example of a very famous design done under Beale for International Paper, International Paper being a huge company that had traditionally had a logotype of a fir tree, and it was an old engraving probably from the 19th century. Lester Beale took the form of the fir tree or pine tree and abstracted it into a triangular arrow pointing up in a circle. And that became the symbol of international paper applied to packages of paper, but it also was used under his direction on everything from those small packages to things like appearing on the sides of trucks or even on the sides of buildings. So this kind of corporate identity that utilized basic symbolic language became part of a practice after World War II. A very different approach to design can be seen in the work of Alvin Lustig. Lustig was an American designer who worked between Los Angeles and New York in the 1940s, but he was most well known for a series of books that he designed for a publisher called New Directions Press. New Directions Press was a publisher of paperback versions of European modern literature. So the literature was very sophisticated. And Lustig designs covers that were really unusual at the time for not utilizing traditional illustration, but coming up with more symbolic illustration 
based on his reading of the novel and what he thought expressed the ideas in the novel. And Lustig wasn't trying even to maybe describe the author's ideas, but rather his interpretation. So this lively but really lopsided star that almost looks like it's dancing is Lustig's interpretation for Kafka's America. Or these figures that appear to be trapped in thread for James Joyce's novel Exiles. Now the interesting thing about Lustig is that some of these covers are painted, some of them are collages, some of them are abstracted, although not really, like this cover for Flowers of Evil by Baudelaire, where he's clearly drawn something that could be seen as flowers, but also look like they might be somewhat dangerous because of the nature of his line and the kind of balance in the composition, the use of color of black over the words of evil creates this very scary looking cover. Here's another very abstract cover for publication of poems by William Carlos Williams, where Lustig has just created essentially a small abstract composition using different textures, creating a, a sense of balance and, in a way, inscrutability, which was descriptive of his reading of the poems. I think with Lustig, what we look at is a kind of interesting extreme of a designer bringing his own subjectivity to his work. He's not being analytical or scientific. It's an artistic response. And some designers perhaps thought that the work was too abstracted. His idea was that by utilizing contemporary visual language, looking at painting and sculpture and printmaking and other forms of expression during that time, he was conveying most of all a kind of energy in the culture. And so the idea that forms and the deaf use, for instance, in this cover, it's the choices that Lustig has made that convey energy and discernment the way those forms interact with each other that give you an idea of something that's brand new but which has this lovely visual coherence. You might notice if you're looking at these images with a close eye that Lustig signed these covers as if they're artworks and it is because he really felt that his work was a personal expression but utilizing symbols that other people would be able to sense and read. So he was approaching his work not unlike a painter, except he had a subject that was outside of himself. But even in some things that weren't literary, like this is a cover that he did for Fortune magazine, the famous business magazine in the 1940s. It's a cover for an issue that describes the costume jewelry business in the United States. And if you look at it carefully, that's a photograph of some kind of fancy brooch, that thing that looks like a star exploding with pearls in the center. But then floating up to the left in that black square is a hand-drawn thread crossing over the black square with white forms of beads or pearls just popping out of it as a flat abstract form. You really start to look at the difference between the photograph and the way it looks in dimension. It's saying the idea of the complex jewelry starts with the simplest gesture of beads on a string. And then that kind of funny curlicue that interrupts the word fortune up at the top is also a flat drawn piece. And it's all against this weird rainbow background that looks like it could be tie-dye or some kind of dyed paper or in an abstracted photo. You really can't tell what it is. But the contrast of all those elements is meant to get you thinking about jewelry and ornament rather than some very specific thing in the magazine. And the fact that it doesn't even have 
a headline that says the jewelry issue attests to the trust that the publishers had that this composition that's really synthesizing ideas about jewelry would speak loud enough that the audience would get it. Paul Rand was an American designer who made a name for himself with some really powerful work that pulled on ideas that came out of modern art and design in Europe. The things that he produced starting in the late 1930s immediately got the attention of a lot of other graphic designers for the way that Rand could create powerful symbols but also retain a sense of play and humor and delight in his work. I'm going to show you a series of covers for a magazine that he designed starting in the late 1930s. It showcased the work of young writers and Rand's approach to the covers was to always tap into something either about the season or about the subjects but in a really delightful, playful, but very symbolic way. Like this is a January issue for 1939. So actually, it's a New Year's baby, the symbol of the New Year often being a kid in diapers, right? Well, he gets rid of the diaper here. It's the kid is a stick figure, that white star in the front, which is like legs, a torso, and arms, superimposed on a red figure of both a flag that just says 1939 and then this face blowing a horn, a, a noisemaker for New Year's, the party hat. So you have this complete holiday symbol rendered in the simplest of lines. If you looked at a Paul Clay drawing from the Bauhaus, you'd see the same kind of ability to make a figure or an idea come to life through the use of the simplest graphic means. And that's what Rand is doing here in this cover. Another very Bauhaus-influenced cover is this issue two months later for the March issue, which focused on many articles about contemporary dance. And Rand takes a photograph of a dancer and then he, he shows in the upper left-hand corner the dancer hole, so the photograph is silhouetted against this bright red. But then, in a kind of Bauhausian, Oscar Schlemmer way, he takes this body form, like the heart, the head, and two legs, and then puts the photograph in it again. So the dancer is duplicated, both whole and then in, in this fragmented but extremely modernistic way. So you have the two things happening at once, which makes you think both about the real experience of seeing a dancer and then the connection of the modern dancer to other modern art forms. Maybe the most powerful cover that Rand did for direction is this one, the Christmas issue. Now, in December of 1940, the United States was participating in World War II. So this is a wartime cover. And if you look at it, it looks, at first, like a package, a present, right? It's got ribbons crossing on the front, and it has a tag, a gift tag, which simply says, Merry Christmas, and then it gives you the date of the publication. And that's laid on top of the logo, which is always this plain stencil font with the paper kind of ripped around it. But of course, the ribbon's not ribbon. It's a photograph of barbed wire. And so that simple gesture of taking ribbon of the conventional form and transforming it, and then the red dots, which also could be Christmas decoration, are clearly also spots of blood. So you have this complete double reading, a thing that speaks of holiday celebration and then a thing that speaks of suffering and war and violence, compressed into one composition. When people talk about Rand and his power to manipulate symbols, I think of this cover as being one of the strongest examples of this idea of compressing a lot of ideas into the simplest of forms. 
Here's another wartime project by Rand, a book that he designed for something called the Auto Car Company, which made Jeeps for use during the war. The cover of the book, it's a spiral-bound book, and the cover appears to be literally sculpted out of the detail of the hardware of the side of the car. And it simply says, mechanized mules of victory in that kind of stencil type that he loved. Rand's use of typography was always really simple. And in the book itself, he used typewriter to create these large chunks of text that run horizontally across the spreads. In a way, the typewriter itself is a symbolic choice because typewriter always indicates work. This is a working document. And so the fact that this book was made during the war, it conveys or communicates the idea of something important that's in progress. And the interesting thing to me about this book is how simple the page design also conveys the idea that only the things that are necessary are included in this book. It has this beautiful use of photographs that again speak of a very kind of modern approach to the idea of using the photograph to communicate symbolically rather than literally. Paul Rand designed this cover for a book called Modern Art in Your Life, produced by the Museum of Modern Art. The subject of the book is the way that objects that we use in the home can either be designed by modern designers or how some of them that are you know, traditional, like certain kinds of drinking glasses, can be seen as objects of modern art and design. What Rand does is he uses a pun, a visual pun. By that I mean a game that is both a word game and a visual game. So modern art in your life he shows us a table setting, except the plate is an old symbol for making art. It's a painter's palette, right? It's such a recognizable cliche that on this cover, you understand that he's created a fork, a plate, which is the artist's palette, and then the knife is clearly also a brush with a daub of paint on the end. And then it's set against the red and the black, these very big brushy forms that ground the whole thing and make you think of modern art. So again, the way that all of these simple symbol of the place setting and the daubs of paint all bounce off each other to make you think about the complex idea inside the book done with a, a minimum of means is really what Rand worked at over and over. Like all of these modern designers, he didn't really want to use pictures of things. He wanted to synthesize ideas into symbols. And it's even interesting when he does use a picture, how he reconstitutes it as something else. This is a paperback book cover for a set of speeches by H.L. Mencken, who was a famous American orator. Mencken's photo is embedded in the background of a drawing that Rand has made, this form that is clearly a torso with a hand pointing upward, the way a, an orator, somebody giving a speech, might be shaking his hands, pointing at the audience, using his arms to gesture expressively. He obviously didn't have that expression in the photograph. But by superimposing the picture inside that form, you get the idea, of course, it's a picture of H.L. Mencken giving a speech. The forms that Rand often uses in his work are quite primitive. And in fact, some of them appear to be almost childish, like this poster for an event in Central Park where several different religious groups got together for what was called Interfaith Day. So it's a picture of an angel blowing a horn. Again, a traditional religious symbol. And the crown and the wing are indicated in the loosest possible manner. If you look at it, it's got the innocence of a child's drawing. Rand wrote a book in 1948 called Thoughts on Design. 
And in it, he talks about his notion that some forms that can be attached to either the abstracted symbol or something that is as recognizable as a child's drawing have a kind of power that anybody can understand. He argues that certain kinds of symbols are universal. And while now people have a tendency not to believe that symbols have universal power, and they certainly don't believe that symbols have that power forever, I think still you look at these kinds of projects of Rand's and you understand how he was trying really hard to find a visual language that would read to an audience, would appear new, and would attach the energy that was connected to contemporary art of the time with other ideas in the culture as well. I've been talking about the way designers did not want to use photographs in a literal manner. And here in this cigar box for El Producto cigars, Paul Rand uses a photogram just like a photogram perhaps that Maholi Nash would have created back at the Bauhaus to indicate cigars sitting against what might be an ashtray. And that dark dramatic photogram is on the lid and then it's surrounded around the edges by this brightly colored cubes of primary colors, red, yellow, blue, green, orange, with the word El Producto in the stencil font, again, wrapping around the corner. Really, if you look at this box carefully, it's hard to date it. You might think it was designed at the Bauhaus, but it's Paul Rand admiring something from the past and repurposing it to create a new idea for a really common commercial product at that time. Here's an ad that he did for the same company where he uses illustrations that look like old engravings to create a kind of humorous collage of the idea of giving a graduate a box of cigars for celebrating their big day. Rand is best known for a set of logos that he did for big American companies starting in the 1950s. And the interesting thing about Paul Rand's logos, we often think of corporate logos as being relatively abstract, kind of little nuggets or buttons that you recognize over time because of repetition. Rand often sought to imbue his corporate logos with a kind of personality. So Westinghouse Electric, which is a huge company, gets a logo that really exists as a face. It's a W in a circle with an underline under the W. But it was designed in such a way that it could be animated on signage or even on television. And you would get this sense of some kind of glowing energy through this sort of animated nature of the logo. One of his most famous logos, which was very unfortunately replaced in the 2000s, was his design for the UPS logo. For many, many years, this logo was seen everywhere on the sides of every UPS truck and label um, from one end of the country to the other. And it is also considered to be one of the most classic logos of the time. I want to talk about how to understand it. The overall shape is a shape of a badge, kind of like a police badge or a military badge and at the time, Rand explained it to say that if you wanted to know that your packages were going to appear on time, that the UPS, even though it was a private company, had to appear kind of governmental or almost like it had a military efficiency. So that simple, strong, three-letter UPS sit inside the lower two-thirds of the logo, but the upper part of the shield has a ribbon, it's a box, it's a present, clearly with, with a bow tied on it. So you have this notion of efficiency, regularity, and dependability connected to the idea of the anticipation of getting something that you really want. It exemplifies the kind of symbol where with the simplest of forms, Rand seemed to capture the complicated ideas that are connected to the delivery of packages 
in a form that really was delightful and well known. This is a group of logos all designed by Paul Rand. And you see a crazy range, everything from the childhood toy color forms in the lower right hand corner that with the circle, square, and triangle looks as if it could have been designed at the Bauhaus to the ubiquitous IBM logo made of stripes. All of these logos have in common a sense of life and personality to them that came through the way that Paul Rand was able to embed a lot of ideas into the simplest of forms. And while some of his notions of universal symbolism don't seem to really apply to the way designers think today, definitely the idea of capturing the energy of a culture and the way that people really think through the simplest of graphic means still represents a very interesting practice. Another example of the use of symbolic language and photography is really visible in the work that was created under the direction of a designer named William Golden, who was the head of design for CBS, the television network. The work that Golden created was done in the early days of television, so we're looking at work from the early 1950s. And the thing that people most know about when they think of design in CBS is the logo of the eye, which is in use to this day. That logo, I think, gets its power out of that most basic symbolic notion of the eyewitness and the notion of watching something connected to the television medium. CBS used the eye with their initials or without in a million different forms. You see it being used for program announcements, titles, and you also see it in their print advertising used as a simple frame or a backdrop for photographs that described the programming. What I'm about to show you is a lot of advertising created in the CBS in-house design department that was pointed at other advertisers, like this for inviting people to run their advertising or buy their advertising time on the network. So the notion of using the eye repetitively and then connecting it to the text, you see the endless possibilities of morphing a simple form like the eye that's inside of a circle, creating a framework and a continuous reference to the identity being extended into other types of subject matter. The other interesting thing at this time was that CBS became well known for its documentary news programming. Like this, there was a famous newscaster named Edward R. Murrow who had a show called See It Now. And so you see the use of very documentary, almost tough news type photography used in some of the CBS ads. Again, most of what I'm showing you is black and white because it was either for newsprint or advertising publications. Or the other thing the art department would do would be to use certain illustrators, like this is work by Ben Sean, to go along with programming announcements that were consistent, like for instance, Playhouse 90, which was a program that always showed live plays on stage, used these very evocative and very modernistic illustrations with a kind of stable typography. The typography for all the CBS ads is done using a font called Franklin, which is a standard American sans serif font. And the simplicity of the type, the dramatic use of either photographs or illustration, and the repeated use of the eye as an overall program identity, created for a media company one of the first very extensive identities that both the audience, advertisers, all sorts of people could recognize very easily. For this last week, we're going to focus on a period of design history shaped by massive change. These cultural, political, as well as technological changes 
from the late 1950s to the early 1970s had a substantial impact on graphic design. But as you might imagine, the forms that emerged during that time did not ascribe to a singular style or aesthetic. It was a time of graphic ideas taking radically different directions. On the one hand, a group of young designers in Switzerland became interested in the idea of design as a universal language. They proposed a rational approach to graphic language embodying ideas of objectivity and internationalism to counteract the political passions that had torn Europe apart during the two world wars. This graphic vocabulary was simple, bold, abstract, and was shaped by a disciplined approach to the graphic design process. For example, using a grid to organize the elements of a page. When imported into the US, Swiss design, or what became known as international style, took a different turn as graphic designers adapted it for American corporate branding. By the 1960s, the style was the ubiquitous face of big biz. On the other hand, the 60s were also a time when ecstatic new forms were introduced by those with a passion to communicate countercultural and spiritual messages. Compared to the slick, refined, purebred Swiss design, this design was more like a shaggy rainbow hued mutt expressive and brimming with personality. There were bright, hued, trippy psychedelic posters. There were sophisticated designs using graphic languages from the past. And there were exuberant flyers and posters created with imagery appropriated from the culture at hand. Those with a passion to communicate used graphic design to take on the social and political issues of the time. This period was hard evidence that design always reacts to the culture of its time, giving it a face and a voice. To help illustrate this, we'll focus on the work and ideas of four very different directions from the period. We often think of graphic design as being something that is really expressive and has a great visual quality, but there are periods when graphic designers decide for several reasons that the visual language of their design needs some kind of control. The most famous time that this happened was in the late 1950s in Switzerland when a group of young designers really embraced the idea of what they called objective graphic design. Objective graphic design was supposed to be design that used typography and photography to communicate facts to people. In other words, whatever the subject was, and it didn't matter if it was a car advertisement or an educational program, or even a, a description of an art exhibition, the design needed to be sober, simple, usually driven by a use of typography that was radically simplified. If images were used, photographs were preferred over illustrations because photographs were seen as something that was a record of what a thing actually looked like instead of the idea of something that could be manipulated or with an illustration, something that had personal expression embedded in it. This cover that we're looking at is from a magazine called New Graphic Design, published in 1958. And this young group of designers, led by a man named Joseph Mueller Brockman, used the magazine to describe the kind of work that they felt really adhered to this strict set of ideals. You can tell even by looking at this front cover that the magazine is set on a four column grid. It's in multiple languages and each one is set identically. And the typeface is Accidents Grotesque, which is an early version of Helvetica. The style kind of continued on to use Accidents, to use Helvetica, to use Universe, 
these plain sans serif fonts were seen as the ultimate perfected modern form that also didn't really refer to history, that looked contemporary, but were extremely plain. This ad that I'm showing you is actually for a department store. It's kind of an Ikea type ad in that it shows a set of products, furniture, and it's from 1960. The department store was called Globus, and it also depicts the designers of the furniture. But you look at the furniture and you realize that the pictures themselves look like they could be just inventory pictures. There's no photo styling, there's no potted plant to make the dresser look nicer. Everything is presented almost like a police forensic photography. Again, the idea was that the photograph should be used as a device to deliver the truth to people, even in a medium that was supposed to be seductive, like an advertisement. Mm -hmm. Now, why was this? What, where did this interest in objectivity come from? These designers were reacting to the idea that the war that had rocked Europe had been driven by political passions, political prejudices, and a kind of embrace of violence and extreme gestures and propaganda and all those kinds of things. And so this radically simplified language was seen as kind of a cool scientific response to trying to eliminate all that extremity out of the lives of people. The idea that the graphic designer, through their production of this very calm, rational work, would be a force for cultural good was part of their program. So the new graphic design really promoted this style not just for an aesthetic, but for the feeling that it could be used to create a sense of cultural calm. One of the interesting things about Swiss design is that it was used for all kinds of clients. For instance, this is an ad designed by a wonderful designer in that group named Carlo Vivarelli. It's for a manufacturer of wall plugs, which seems like a really unglamorous product, and the photographs, as they're presented in the ad, are photographed perfectly. It's a black and white photography. It looks, again, simple and kind of like police evidence, but it's done with a kind of craft that makes the objects really beautiful. And then the sense of the type around it, where you can see all the information is organized on a grid, it's organized without a complicated hierarchy. All you have is the repeated name of the manufacturer large, but all the other type is small, so that there's this kind of clarity and lack of complexity that's favoring this sort of calm communication. Even in this ad for a manufacturer of faucets, the photographs are really beautifully done. Even the photography has been created to fit the grid. The mathematics of the grid, which were felt to be akin to an architecture of the page, was another critical part of Swiss design. The idea that information could be structured in the same kind of rational way that buildings were built was an idea that contributed to the notion of the graphic designer as builder of communication. The interesting thing about design during this period is that there were designers who used the notion of abstraction in very imaginative ways. This is a poster by Carl Gerstner for a printing firm. And what that abstract image is, is it's an enlargement of the idea of the four color dot that produces four color printing. And he's used blue and yellow and magenta, C, M, Y, and K in the type, to create this poster, which speaks to printing technology. But it does it with this very cool abstracted form that looks a lot like abstract painting during the period as well. Sometimes the abstraction can take a realistic object and turn it into a symbol, like this poster for an exhibition of music graphics which of course included a lot of things that weren't this plain and controlled, but designed by Gottlieb Solon, this poster reduces the notion of the record 
to the two concentric red and black fields to visualize a long playing record with the typography announcing the show, having that very simple, quiet voice, which also helps you see that the poster is structured in two vertical halves where the type aligns with the little hole for the record player in the middle of the long playing record. Joseph Mueller Brockman, who was part of the new graphic design magazine group, produced a very interesting set of posters for AAA, the automobile club based in Switzerland. And again, that what's so interesting, these are posters that are about safety, about using hand signals, paying attention to safety issues. They look incredibly cinematic. This image is a constructed image, but it's imagined almost like a film, like the idea of the pedestrian moving across the cars. Many of the other posters created by Mueller Brockman for the AAA have this same quality, like the idea of looking at the um, motorcycle police between the two cars. You feel like you're just looking out the window of the car that's heading into the poster. The angle of sight is very cinematic, meaning you imagine it in motion, but it is not a single picture. It's created with fragments of pictures that Mueller Brockman put together. The interesting thing about the Swiss designer's use of photography is why they preferred it over illustration because they felt the images, again, were kind of like documentary. They were truthful. It didn't stop a designer like Mueller Brockman from constructing an image out of photographs and creating a new image that didn't exist, that couldn't be captured by a camera realistically, but which retained a strong communicating power. Like this famous poster, which really says something like, look out for children. So it's a motorcyclist, a running child in the, in the background of the poster. The wheel of the motorcycle you're just seeing it in fragment. There's a hint of perhaps airbrushing indicating that the motorcycle is rushing forward. You only perceive that it's rushing forward toward the child because of the manipulation of scale of the two different pictures that Mueller Brockman has chosen for this poster. So while it's a really powerful image, and again, you can imagine it working like a movie, in fact, it's constructed out of two still photographs. In the end, the type on the poster has that quiet sans serif that doesn't really express any strong emotion. The photographs do it for him, even though they're done in this incredibly logical way. Another series of posters that Joseph Mueller Brockman designed around the same time, which are completely different, were a series of posters he did for a famous concert hall in Zurich. And each one of them is his interpretation of what the music sounds like. In a series of sketches that exist for some of these posters, you see him going from a dense, more expressive idea of the flow of music into something that appears to be more constructed and architectonic and on a grid. Again, the idea of the free flow of the music is not described by the type, but by the abstract forms that then the type interacts with. Sometimes the forms of the type are a simple block of text describing the concert, but then they contrast with an abstraction like this set of vertical bars that contain color in them that resonate with the idea of a sort of glowing musical experience. This is another really interesting example of Mueller Brockman's work for the Zurich Concert Hall, where there is no image at all, but just simply by moving the type in a series of waves and shifting the color from a pale gray to a pale lavender, you get the idea of the emotion behind the music. In these posters for the Zurich Concert Hall, Mueller Brockman composes the poster with the simplest typography and the interaction of these forms that are meant to evoke in the audience 
the idea of the emotion of music. I think the use of color is the one unexpected and surprising thing in a lot of Mueller Brockman's music posters that conveys the subjective reality of listening to music to the audience. Because after all, people perceive colors in different ways. These are examples of student projects. Mueller Brockman was teaching in Zurich and he would have his students look at the adaptation of an abstract symbol into a corporate identity form. This shows a graphic actually for a printing company that's applied to invoices, the side of a truck, and even at the very top of this image, some photographs of the loading docks at the printing plant. The idea for students working with Joseph Mueller Brockman at this time was the controlled typography, the use of a rational, geometric grid to lay the type into, and then the repeated use of a simplified abstracted symbol to create a kind of visual identity that often had a kind of interesting contrast in its abstraction to that super objective form of all the type. This kind of identity really became influential in the United States the logic of the identity being composed by these two simple elements of typography that had very little or no expression in it and then the repeated use of an image we see kind of shifting the way corporate identity looked in the United States and there are several examples that we can look at that illustrate this. This simplified form of corporate identity was very appealing to some American companies that were working in the multinational sphere because of the fact that it looked so cool and not necessarily attached to any specific national identity, even though everybody at the time who looked at this could say, oh, that's Swiss design. In fact, over the years, many people referred to this kind of graphic design as international design because you would see it repeated, especially on corporate identity work. Even some American designers like Paul Rand in implementing the logotypes that he designed actually created in-house design departments who were trained to understand the Swiss style of corporate identity and to utilize it to create this objective, technocratic form of graphic design. It all started with the grid, and at that time, grids were designed to mesh with typesetting. So if you were going to create a four-column grid or a three-column grid or a two-column grid for an ad or a page or even a poster, you had to figure out how your typography was going to fit on the poster, and then the grid would work around it so that there would always be this seamless fit between text and image on every piece that was done. These are pages from a book that Mueller Brockman wrote about grids that described the rationality of how you would produce pages. Mueller Brockman thought of the grid as not only something that was suitable for the page, but in which you could use the grid to organize the space on a wall. For instance, if you were thinking about how you would design text on a wall in an exhibition or how you might hang pictures Swiss design had this intensely practical edge to it in that it was meant to illuminate the function, how you used this thing, how did you make the thing that you were designing. Even finally, this rendering from Mueller Brockman's grid book that shows an interior space where cabinets are even aligned with the idea of a three-dimensional grid that can define space in infinite number of ways. Another graphic designer who contributed a lot to the definition of graphic design was a typographer in Basel, Switzerland named Emil Ruder. He wrote an important book called Typography in 1967 where he connected a set of exercises and a way of understanding type to the new graphic design group and the way that they use typography in this structural manner. The Swiss ideal of communicating without a lot of 
emotion or variation or complexity in typography is clearly indicated in Emil Reuter's book. And the methods for how to think of it are described in exercise after exercise where he demonstrates how the manipulation of just one simple element across a set of exercises can create attention to a message without going any further than that. If you think back to the Bauhaus and the basic exercises to explore qualities like contrast and scale and form, but which students used all kinds of materials and elements, these are radically simplified versions of the same idea, only with the control of black and white only and the most limited set of geometric elements, like a field with white circles, where by moving the circles around, you create different forms, being able to read the positive form and the negative form. Sometimes the addition of elements, like this problem that starts out with three simple circles, but where different compositions are created by the addition of elements. These are projects where the student is meant to learn how to see, devoid of any of the more expressive problems that are contained in graphic design's communicative world. So there's no idea in these projects other than to be able to see composition and to learn how to create visual difference within, again, a very limited means of production. Like, for instance, this exercise where variation in a group of circles is created simply by changing the weight of the circles. Then the student is allowed at a certain point to become free and to compose with these simplified elements to create more and more dynamic compositions. But the idea of being able to create within an incredibly limited means has continued to fascinate graphic designers even though this sort of design barely exists out in the world. The economy of means, though, is incredibly seductive If the designers in Switzerland felt that they owed it to their public to speak in an objective and clear language that anyone could understand, Pushpin Studios in New York, starting to work in the late 1950s, around the same time as new graphic design in Zurich was being published, felt that they owed it to their public to speak in a language that the public already understood. And that language, that graphic language, was one that was based on really well-known vernacular forms like old woodcuts, old book covers. The pushpin studio designers were all collectors of all kinds of antique printed matter, toys. They were interested in all forms of pop culture, but the old forms of pop culture in particular and the history of typography and all of the variations in form that were available to you if you decided you did not want to be modern. Pushpin, which was a group of illustrators mostly who came together to work after all meeting each other at Cooper Union, would make work that they would then give to potential clients in hopes that they could get hired mostly in the magazine business or in publishing in New York City during that time. So this, for instance, is a cover for a publication that they did to promote their own work called the Pushpin Monthly Graphic. Everything that they produced, though, harkens back to old forms of typography. The last thing in the world they were interested in was the 20th century modern style. They liked looking at old wood type lettering from the 19th century and vernacular American letter forms. This is a mailer that they produced for a typesetter in New York City in 1958, where you see this collision of about four different styles of typography, exactly the opposite of the Swiss style and completely rambunctious and rebellious looking in comparison. They used a lot of humor the combination of illustration and 
clever advertising copy can be seen all over their work. And they created this work in order both to get attention, but to get attention through an incredibly clever use of various graphic motifs. They were not interested in objectivity. Like most illustrators, they were really interested in subjectivity, in the idea of using the gestures of hand drawing and very quirky kinds of symbol making to indicate a personality, a personality mostly that was in love with literature and popular culture and was very accessible to an audience that was there waiting for this kind of imaginative work. Even when they tackled serious subjects, their work has a kind of individuality and a power of communication that comes through almost a, a very subjective psychological style. This is a cover of the monthly graphic with an illustration by Milton Glaser. They had gotten permission to reprint an article about the dangers of nuclear fallout. And instead of using a scary science fiction type image or a technological image, the simple profile rendered in ink almost like a sumi ink Chinese piece of calligraphy of a pregnant woman gets the idea across immediately of somebody of a vulnerable population or a person who's vulnerable to an outside force that you can't see. You can't understand that cover until you understand what's inside the monthly graphic, but the connection once you do make it is this incredibly memorable and rather emotional image. That's contrasted with their standard typography at the masthead of the monthly graphic, where they kind of imitate the New York Times with their use of an old Gothic font, but then they combine it with different kind of rules, and behind the font is a kind of old curlicue from Dutch calligraphy. So the whole thing is a mishmash of typography history, but the power of the image rendered as a symbol still comes through the style of that drawing printed on dark paper that conveys everything about the fear of fallout and the potential horrors of it all. As serious as that copy of the monthly graphic is, is as silly as this one is. This is a paperback cover for a somewhat larger issue of the pushpin, now called the pushpin graphic, which was based on a book that they had scavenged out of one of the many used bookstores in and around the village in New York City that interpreted dreams. So on the inside of the book, each dream has an illustration by a different member of the Pushpin group on the inside. But the cover is what's interesting here because it's, again, a complete combination of different kinds of historical references. Again, the sort of Gothic font for pushpin graphic, their, their kind of knotted calligraphy behind it. But over that is a Art Deco doorway, which was the kind of doorway that you could see in some of the old apartment buildings in and around their neighborhood in New York. And then their new rendering of the idea of 1920s geometric lettering which, true, is modern, but in their mind, it's Art Deco, which is a more decorative pop version of modern typography. It's this collision of different time periods and humor that made the pushpin work so different and which got them a great deal of attention. One of the pushpin designers whose work in posters is really important was Milton Glaser. His posters demonstrate the different approaches he would bring to solving a visual problem. This poster for a show called Big Nudes at an art school gallery in Manhattan is a perfect example of how simply he could formulate a response to an idea by shifting an image. The idea that you would describe scale through drawing a frame and having this figure, a torso and legs bust through the frame, gets the idea of something that's large across in the simplest of means. But it's rendered in such a way that it has this kind of visual beauty and color to it 
the typography here doesn't have to do any work at all. The idea is completely conveyed by the image itself. That's not true of some of his other posters where he'll introduce a headline or the title of an event and the typography does add something to your reading of the poster. This was a poster that was inserted in a Bob Dylan album that CBS produced um, that was one of Bob Dylan's electric albums where he used an electric guitar. Milton Glaser creates a portrait of Bob Dylan, but it's not a realistic portrait at all. It's actually a reference to a famous work by Marcel Duchamp where he used his profile to describe himself. And then Milton Glaser adds the word Dylan in that fake Art Deco lettering that he and his pushpin colleagues loved so much. And then Dylan's hair, the famous curly hair, is articulated as a flowering of kind of Art Nouveau curly cues. So there's a reference to psychedelic posters, which we're going to look at, which is part of youth culture, but there's also this interesting link to history, again, through the reference of Duchamp and the reference to the 20s typography. Milton Glaser used a similar approach in this poster for a concert by the famous gospel singer Mahalia Jackson. This was a poster designed to be hung in multiples on the street in New York City. And again, the portrait of Mahalia is through a simple silhouette of her face, although her face is articulated more than in the Dylan poster through the use of the shadow kind of curving around so you can see her features. But her portrait is wedged between two circular forms, the rainbow form, which holds all the type, which again is set in the Art Deco font in this sort of set of radiating arcs, giving you the information for the poster. And then the other flat color graphic is a set of flowers in her hair, which also appear on this image which shows two posters, a right and a left, glued together to create the semicircles. When they were glued all together in fours, what you get is the form of a mandala, the sacred Buddhist prayer form that creates the radiating circle with all the information. And then the flowers form circles, like a wreath of flowers on her hair or a halo. So the elements all together convey both a combination of beauty and spirituality, but using a color palette that no one would miss on the street. And that link again to the 1960s taste for bright, clear colors used in a very dynamic way. I want to end with this symbol designed by Milton Glaser that everybody around the world can recognize, the famous I love New York symbol. Glaser claimed that he never had any idea that it would have had the kind of staying power that it did. But when you think about it, the absolutely radically simple use of the typewriter INY and then the absolutely recognizable, anybody can understand it, image of the heart created the most simple expression of loyalty and delight around visiting New York. That it became a symbol probably has to do with this utter simplicity. And yet it's not really about the form of the thing, it's about the concept. It just goes to show that sometimes the most perfect pieces of graphic design don't come out of formal exercise, but come out of really understanding what reads to the audience in the most profound way. We're looking at an issue of the pushpin graphic that was designed by Seymour Quast, titled The South. And what's very hard to see in this illustration is that there is a hole that's drilled through the O in the word South. And the hole is drilled entirely through the book from one end of it to the other. The book starts out with a series of images, large images that describe cliches of the American South, like this image of steamboats on a river surrounded by palm trees, hearkening back to kind of genteel ideas of riverboats on the Mississippi. But inset 
in the black and white photograph is a picture of one of the many African Americans assassinated during the struggle for voting rights in the South. So the hole drills through the head of the assassinated civil rights hero. Another page with another portrait. This time the portrait is set against a cliched image of a white couple enjoying a stroll in a palmetto grove. This image of two southern gentlemen enjoying a mint julep, again interrupted by the image of an assassinated civil rights worker. Another portrait against the cliched picture of the black minstrel. On this spread, a portrait of Martin Luther King with a hole through his head against an image titled Georgia Peaches. The last spread of the book flips the script entirely. The person with the hole through their head is the cliché of Southern womanhood against the picture of the March on Washington in 1963 in support of civil rights. This book is such an interesting example of the ability to create a political message entirely through images that people already know. The truth is the images of all the cliches are recognizable and at the point that Pushpin published this book, the pictures of the civil rights workers would have been recognizable as well. But the combination and the use of the violence of that simple drilled hole through the book make this powerful piece in support of civil rights a rather unforgettable piece of graphic design. Sometimes graphic designers know exactly who they want to talk to and they create designs for the group that they're addressing. The following posters I'm about to show you are all designed in San Francisco in the late 1960s and they're all designed to advertise rock and roll concerts that occurred mostly at two different places, the Fillmore Ballroom or the Avalon Ballroom by a group of young designers, I'm not even sure they would have called themselves that, but poster designers who adapted an idea of how to speak exactly to the people that they figured would be interested in those concerts. This is a poster by Victor Moscoso, who was one of the important members of this group. And it's a poster for a blues singer named Junior Wells. And you see the name Junior Wells at the top, then kind of reverberating vertically down the poster into a picture of Junior Wells that's rendered in negative in a kind of screaming day-glow green on top of day-glow orange with day-glow blue for the type in the name Junior Wells. And then it all comes together with more information at the bottom of the poster. The first thing to know about this poster is that however you're looking at this on your computer screen, it's hard to describe how bright the colors are. They create that kind of almost uh, fuzzy headache that you can get if you look at something too long that has two clashing complementary colors all of the colors seem to be kind of buzzing. And of course, this work was produced at a time when people who were going to rock concerts were doing a lot of experimental drugs. And the form of these posters was meant to emulate or hint at a kind of hallucinogenic state that the audience that might be at the concert might be enjoying. While that might be really specific, the other thing that's fascinating about these posters is that they're almost impossible to read, but they're so clearly marked by this crazy use of color and nearly illegible typography that they would have been identifiable to anybody who was looking for the announcement of the concert. They would know exactly what they were looking at. So the psychedelic posters, they're not exactly a secret language because people saw them and started collecting them immediately. They were so unique looking, but it's definitely a language that was pointed at a really specific idea of who would enjoy looking at the posters. The other fascinating thing about the posters is that even if the form is radically new, 
they, like the pushpin work, are made up of the use of historic forms. So for instance, this poster for the band Quicksilver Messenger Service, the type is all woodblock type or the form of woodblock type where the letters have those big heavy square serifs at both the top and the bottom. And you see the square serifs being manipulated into the circle here of the famous Tao, the yin and yang symbol, and then used to kind of create a geometric structure around the poster. You can really only read this poster by looking for the thin parts of the letter forms that connect all these radiating circles. You see the same thing here in this poster for a Chambers Brothers concert at the Avalon Ballroom where Victor Moscoso has used a simple face of a woman where the lettering is reflected in sunglasses. And that lettering, again, is manipulated to sit organically in that sort of oval form of the sunglass shape. The interesting thing about Vis Victor Moscoso is that he knew exactly what he was doing in terms of the color. He'd actually studied color with Joseph Albers when he was a student at Yale. And so he understood the properties of the reverberating color. And part of the power of his posters comes from this incredible chain reaction through this sense that they have this surface that's alive and vibrating. Another interesting aspect of these posters to understand is that actually, although they're made of these crazy riotous colors, they're all hand done in black and white ink. The designers couldn't see the color until they were printed. But the artwork that was created is so interlocked and so tight that it kind of guaranteed that that quality of visual reverberation would be achieved in each poster. Sometimes the imagery seems completely mysterious. This poster where Victor Moscoso has drawn a vase that holds a bouquet of flowers has the name of every rock and roll band rendered as a, one of the blossoms in the vase. It's a peculiar image because there's nothing kind of radical or even particularly rock and roll about this image at all, but the color and the power of the composition take care of that. And again, the audience would have recognized that it's another message about an event that they wouldn't want to miss. Some of the posters are created without imagery at all, but only type. This poster by Wes Wilson shows a kind of flaming pile of typography. Here's another poster by Wes Wilson, which doesn't use that psychedelic vibration through color, but where the hand-drawn type looks as if it's in motion through this sort of undulating form that the interlocking letters take. The idea that images and type from olden times would be the symbol of youth culture seems so peculiar to us now. Clearly, it's based on the idea of rejecting the present and going back to an era not of their parents, but of grandparents or even great-grandparents. And the connection to the young comes through the use of color and the fact that even historical imagery, whether it's serious or ridiculous, still forms the basis for this kind of taste for anything but the present. The past is used romantically and weirdly, like this image that might be from a silent movie. Again, the tendency in Moscoso's posters is to use imagery from the past if he uses imagery at all. Some people feel that this fascination with the past had to do with thrift store clothing that the hippie generation in San Francisco could buy for almost nothing. And this photograph of the poster designers in a group you really can see that style that harkens both to the present and the past. Now we're going to look at some printed matter from San Francisco in the late 60s, done the same time that the psychedelic posters were being designed, that might not look like graphic design at all to some people. 
But it's so interesting because it also is work that is really about how people can use posters or printed slogans to get to their local audience. This is a picture of Claude Hayward and Chester Anderson, who were two guys who were members of a group of anarchists in San Francisco who called themselves the Diggers. And Claude and Chester had acquired a simple printing machine called the Gestetner. It's fancier than a Xerox machine, but not as complicated as an offset press. And they decided to set up a service where they would print things for people. And they would also have a fake advertising agency called Comco, or the Communication Company. And the Communication Company produced posters and flyers and announcements that addressed issues that the diggers were involved in in San Francisco. One thing that distinguished the diggers from the other countercultural groups was that they were really interested in very pragmatic issues that had to do with how their neighborhood ran. They were especially worried during the famous Summer of Love in 1967 about all the people who were traveling from across the country who wanted to hang out with the hippies in San Francisco. And they were worried about basic things like about how people were going to eat and where they were going to sleep, et cetera, et cetera. The flyers that the communication company produced range all over the graphic map. And in fact, one flyer doesn't even look like the next. This is a flyer discussing the issue of the way that people were allowed to be in parks. The headline says, the park belongs to you, it's your park. This was talking about Golden Gate Park and the various objections that largely centered around whether or not people would be allowed to sleep in the park that Comco was involved in. It's a simple set of images picked up from nature, although they're not even nature that you would find in Golden Gate Park. And then this kind of Dadaist mess of typography with the headline. But clearly, what would speak to the neighborhood is the voice in the flyer. The fact that it's your park is addressing the audience directly. And that characterizes a lot of the digger flyers during this time. Sometimes the communication company flyers are this simple. A typewritten poem, this one by Richard Brodigan with a hand-drawn headline. A simple way of being the local publisher of local art. Richard Brodigan was a member of their group. Or this hand-drawn announcement for a sleep-in in Golden Gate Park, which appears to have taken all of two minutes to write, but has a really clever way of describing the event. Sleep in, Golden Gate Park, bring sleeping bags, blankets, bells, beads, symbols, thousands of other people at the bottom of the page. Again, here you have an absolute economy of form, a clever idea, and then on top of it, a way of getting the work out into the neighborhood so that the people could be reached. This is another one of their many pieces that addressed their various complaints against the police or the city of San Francisco. This uses the seal of the city of San Francisco reproduced on a flyer with the simple line, how do you want to live across the top of the page? And then a kind of funny slogan surrounding the seal, a vote for me is a vote for you. The idea here is trying to literally taunt people into getting involved in thinking about the city that they lived in and the neighborhood and how it worked. Some of the messages are cryptic. This flyer that takes a letter from the Recreations and Park Commission of San Francisco outlining the rules for behavior in public spaces where Comco is simply written over it, what is the concept public think? Again, the Comco message over and over to the audience is think about how you live in the world. The economy of means and the idea of doing this with either the simplest hand-drawn messages or repurposing other messages that they're reacting to is a hallmark 
of the radical simplicity, but radical local design of the communication company and the diggers. There are so many ways that someone using graphic design can utilize things that the audience already recognizes in order to communicate an idea. Sister Carita, who was a Dominican nun living in Los Angeles, produced a series of posters in the middle of the 1960s where she used commercial messages, things that she lifted out of advertising, like this word tomato that maybe is from a ketchup ad or a tomato juice ad, where she has reproduced the advertising lettering in the silkscreen print, but then filled it with a meditation on spirituality inside the lettering. The name of the print is The Juiciest Tomato, and it's about the Virgin Mary. And this poster actually upset some of the Catholic hierarchy who were in charge of what nuns did in those days. And the reason I think that they were upset by it was because of its power and that it was seen as somehow disrespectful to connect a religious figure or a religious message to a graphic form that was so blatantly from the commercial world. But Sister Carita, who had seen Andy Warhol's first show of his famous soup can silk screens on display in Los Angeles in the early 1960s, really recognized the, that the same thing that Warhol recognized, that popular culture was actually a kind of form of visual communication in and of itself that had great power and also great flexibility. The interesting thing about Sister Carita is her literal lifting of phrases and slogans and letter forms, like this print, which has that script G was the logo for General Mills, and their slogan on their ads during the 60s was the big G stands for goodness. But in Sister Carita's hands, the big G stands for God. There is a message attached to the print asking you to see the world differently, to read this language differently, and she kind of hijacks the commercial message and turns it in to the kind of message that she wanted to get out into the world using forms, again, that anyone could see. This poster here, open wide so that the king of glory may enter it. The open wide is from some food ad. And her, um, her use of that lettering and that power and also the kind of bright, solid colors of the silk screens. And she integrates messages with her own handwriting into it and it all comes together in these graphic meditations. This is a picture of a silkscreen workshop at Immaculate Heart College where she taught. The idea of the silkscreen prints was they were both school projects and they also were sold around Los Angeles. She did not consider them precious works of art, but rather as kind of really useful graphic expressions, but it's that combination of the personal message attached to the kind of imagery that everybody would have recognized that's so powerful. Here's another one of her posters using the Wonder Bread lettering and coloring, although this is all handwritten. There's a word for reusing something out in the world that already exists in your work. It's called appropriation, where you borrow something precisely because it has this power through recognition for the audience that you're trying to reach. Sister Carita, you could say that she was appropriating the advertising language. Her manipulation of it is pretty strong and she manages to make every poster look like it came from her. So her style comes through the re-rendering of the slogans and the use of color and the integration, again, of her handwritten notations that are like footnotes on a book page that explain the point of view. This is a picture of students at Immaculate Heart getting ready for a procession 
for a religious holiday, Merry Day, where they produced things that looked like protest signs, but they were all this kind of graphic project. And the use of what in the late 60s, a street protest, the use of that form of protest to create a religious procession is another example of Corita's direction of pointing to the things that already had recognizable power in the culture and utilizing them as a design strategy. Here you even see her creation of an altarpiece, which, you know, there is no more sacred space than that, but where the altar is backed up by a slogan, power up from food advertising, and that redefinition of the language of advertising into a language that promotes contemplation and spiritual thinking is completely unique to her work. Another series of work by Corita shows how she would use the actual lettering from the ads instead of re-rendering it, but by distorting it photographically, create new illustrations of the kind of energy she was trying to harness in the work. Even some of the slogans that seem like they can't possibly be interpreted spiritually do get reinterpreted again through her annotation on her print with the handwriting, which what is more personal than handwriting, against that really recognizable advertising lettering. Another set of posters created by Corita show shards of newspaper headlines. This from the Los Angeles riots, juxtaposed just with solid colors with handwritten reactions and meditations upon the tragic events that are described in the newspapers. Her use of the common form, again, the front page, but turning it into an opportunity to reflect upon the lessons that can be pulled out of contemporary events is strongly rendered by the bright colored form that interrupts the newspaper and carries her meditation. Some of these posters from the late 60s where Corita juxtaposed her own message attached to something from the mass media, like this cover of Life magazine, she uses colors that are straight out of the psychedelic book. The day glow appears in her work as if the color connects you to the notion of the contemporary thought that is attached to these things that are out of the news, but which take you out of the space of just witnessing the news and thinking more deeply about the connotations of these terrible events. I want to end with this list of art department rules written and printed by Sister Corita when she was teaching at Immaculate Heart College. Some of them seem like basic wisdom, like nothing is a mistake, there is no win and no fail, there's only make, or to consider everything an experiment. But what I really like is the last paragraph, helpful hints, always be around, come or go to everything, always go to classes, read anything you can get your hands on, look at movies carefully, often, Save everything. It might come in handy later. There should be new rules next week. I can think of no better place to end a discussion of where ideas come from in graphic design. As you can see, they come from talented designers reacting to an ever-changing cultural landscape and making work that is an integral and important part of that culture. We can't always predict where it's going to go, but what we predict is that there will be new ideas next week. Hi, welcome to Brand New Brand, the capstone project for the specialization in graphic design from the California Institute of the Arts. I'm Michael Worthington, graphic design instructor at CalArts, but today, we're not at CalArts, we're here in my studio. This is where I spend my time working when I'm not teaching. Most of the professional design work I do is for cultural clients, and it falls into two categories. One is books and publication, and the other is branding and identity. 
And for this capstone project, we're going to look at branding and identity. And you're going to create a complete visual identity for a company or client that you're going to invent. I think this is a great project for any design student. Every company or client needs a visual identity these days because everyone's business has a visual representation online. The design you make to represent a company is what most people are going to interact with. It becomes the face of the company, and in a digital world, it becomes just as important as anything concrete, like a building or a store. We live in a digital era where we're surrounded by visual identities, which is great for designers. Every startup company wants to have a cool logo and a successful branding strategy. And the more identities that we're all exposed to, the more sophisticated our visual palette becomes. The days when a graphic designer made a single static logo type that could be stamped on everything are long gone. Branding today is comprised of many moving parts involving systems, strategy, marketing and naming, as well as the actual form making part of graphic design. For this capstone project, we're going to build a complex identity system one piece at a time, and you'll be involved in every stage. To begin with, you'll have to come up with an idea of what your company does. Think of it as a startup that can be anything you want it to be. It can be serious or funny, high tech or handcrafted. It can be realistic or as fantastic as you like. You'll write a fake history of your company and we'll look at some strategies for coming up with names for your company. Once you have a history and a name, you'll be ready to start with some physical graphic design. You'll develop a logo type for your company and we'll look closely at how to customize typographic form and refine that form into a sophisticated typographic mark. After that, we'll be expanding the palette of your identity to include a graphic mark or icon, a color palette, secondary typefaces, styles of imagery, and a mystery ingredient of your own invention. You'll be testing your identity components out in the form of pieces of branded graphic design of your choosing. Anything from t-shirts and tote bags to business cards and billboards websites or, mo or app mock-ups, products or packaging. Along the way, we'll collect all of your identity components into a branding guide PDF, so that by the end of the capstone project, you'll have a single container to showcase your skills of ideation, invention and conceptualization, as well as showing visual research and visual development, plus your skills in typography, image making, composition and systematic thinking. Two things to remember as you work on your capstone project. Firstly, try to grow your visual design out of your conceptual ideas. So the two have a relationship. It's what we call context-specific design. And it's a way of checking your design has a solid relationship to what it's representing. Secondly, be as inventive and creative as you can. Don't worry about trying to make something real world or something that looks like an existing identity. Add your own voice to the design. Think about what you can do as a designer that's different from what anyone else would do. So, have fun and good luck. Hi, welcome to Brand New Brand. I'm Michael Worthington, graphic design faculty at California Institute of the Arts. And this is the capstone project for the specialization in graphic design. What we're going to do with this project is try and figure out a vehicle for you to take all of the knowledge that you've learned in the specialization and put it all together in one project. And that project is going to be a branding project. Now it's quite a complicated project, there's a lot of moving parts to it, but I'm going to walk you through it piece by piece so that you'll have a model to work with when you come to make your own brand. In a lot of ways, branding is the intersection between graphic design and marketing. And what that means is, it's a way to take something that doesn't necessarily have a form or an identity and to give it a visual identity and a strategic identity that's going to make it immediately recognizable. I'm willing to bet that when you look at this list of companies and products, it's pretty hard for you to look at them and not imagine their logo types. It's hard to look at Nike without thinking about its mark, the swoosh. And the same for other companies as well. You can't imagine Coca-Cola without seeing its signature typographic form and its red and white colors, or Adidas and its geometric typographic forms in its logo type. And the same goes for all of these companies. They have strong visual identities that become much, much stronger than just the words themselves. We're used to either associating a graphic mark or a logo type with them. For this project, we're not really going to look so much at the marketing and the strategy involved in brand design we're really going to try and focus on the graphic design part of it. 
So we're going to be looking at typographic form, at color and shape and imagery, and all of the things that we've looked at already. Most identities comprise of a word mark, or as I like to call it, a logo type. These two terms are synonymous, and what they basically mean is the name of the company or the client that has been treated typographically in a very distinct way. More often than not, this means tweaking the letter forms, so they might actually change and less be a typeface that already exists and be much more customized. And part of this customization really involves looking at the letter forms in a particular word. So for instance here we're looking at the word logotype and we're changing it bit by bit to give it a more distinct look. So we might look at spacing for instance within the letter forms. We might look at ligatures or scale and position of letter forms as well. We might tweak little parts of the letter forms to give them a better relationship. But a lot of these things are about the relationship between just the letters in this form. So it's less about using an alphabet that already exists, a typeface that already exists, I should say, and much more about customizing letter forms where their only job is to operate distinctly with the letter forms that they're sitting next to in a particular word, the name of your company. A brand is made up of many different component parts, a logo type being one of them, and color being another. Brands quite often have a corporate color, a distinct color that's hand-picked for that particular company to work together with the logo type to form a strong and memorable visual identity. As well as the logo type and color, there's often a mark or an icon that goes with that particular company. Sometimes that can be an abstract mark, sometimes it's a pictorial mark. Normally these things work together, sometimes the logo type can be sit next to the mark, sometimes the mark is embedded in the logo type. If you think of something like Nike for instance, the swoosh is the mark and the logo type is the actual word Nike in the particular script based typeface that you see it in often. So the mark can operate on its own quite often as well if you think about Apple that has a very distinct and recognizable mark. But these are all parts of just a larger kit and that's what we're going to do with this project. We're going to develop each of these individual parts and try and get them to work together. And Once you start to get them to work together you'll have a logotype and you'll also have a mark and they'll start to have a relationship. Whether they sit together, whether they're multiples, whether they have a flexible relationship or a fixed relationship, but they'll become components that will help you give your brand an identity. And one of the reasons we're looking at identity in terms of graphic design is because it's an area that's increasing and ever-growing. It seems that everybody these days uh, has a logotype or a company that needs a logotype. And I think this is going to just increasingly happen more and more, particularly as everyone has a visual visibility for their company online. It means that even the smallest company needs to have a logo type. And I feel like at some point we're going to reach the point where every single individual is going to need to have a logo type as well. But for now, what we're going to work on is a brand development guide. So what we're not going to do is make an identity manual. So our brand development guide is going to be a place where we take each of these pieces of our brand identity and we figure out how to show our working process and put them together into this guide. So it will become a way for you to showcase all of the work that you've done and have it culminate in some finished graphic design as well. So you'll get to show people both your process and you'll get to show them the final results of that process as well. If we're going to design a visual identity, we're going to need a client. When you work in the real world, the client already exists. For instance, one of the examples I'm going to show you is the Pasadena Conservatory of Music that I designed a logo type for a few years ago. And they already existed as a company, had a mission statement, and they just wanted to take their ideas and what they did and give it a new visual representation. So for instance, they clearly could articulate who they were. They were a place of study, performance, collaboration, and they were dedicated to teaching traditional and contemporary music. So I could take that mission statement, if you like, and try and translate it into a visual identity. But you don't have a client, and rather than take an existing real-world client and try to rebrand them, 
I think it's much more fun for you to invent your own startup. And the reason why I think this is better is because then you're not tied into a visual vocabulary that already exists. So for instance, if you were designing a car logo, you might get stuck in the visual vernacular that car logos already exist in. So when you're inventing this startup, I really want you to be as creative and inventive and imaginative as you like. It's a way to really free yourself up and give yourself a very open starting point, a very fertile ground to start working. So here are a few examples of ideas for startups that I came up with, just to give you an idea of how fantastic these things can be. So for instance, my startup is a museum that exhibits people's dreams or my startup manufactures a mood-altering wearable necklace, or my startup takes tourists glamping on the planet Mars. So you can see how these things are fairly fantastic and futuristic, but at the same time fairly feasible and possible in the near future. Or for example, my startup makes a glove that gives the wearer's hand incredible strength. Or my startup has a food truck selling snails. And this is actually an example that I'm going to use and walk you through the whole process using this example. So you get an idea how to do each stage of this project and how to put everything together into your brand development guide. Since we're inventing our company, our startup, we're also going to have to invent a little bit of history about that startup. And the reason for that is so that we've got some fuel or ammunition to give us some design ideas and to give us some context to see whether our design ideas are working or not for our client. If we take our real world example, Pasadena Conservatory of Music, they already had a history, so it was very easy, it already existed. But of course, you're inventing your company and you don't have a history, so you're going to have to make one up. So you could start by thinking, when and where was the company founded? Who founded it? What's the company's philosophy or attitude? What are its goals? And what is the engaging backstory of your brand? And these are the kind of questions that you would be asking a real company anyway, to try and figure out what your identity is doing, what it might represent, and what kind of look and feel and attitude it might have. So I'm going to use my imaginary startup company as an example to write a fake history. So my startup has a food truck selling snails. And in 1968, during the student protests in Paris, France, a young student called Jean-Pierre Dumas took to the streets in his Citroen 2CV, which he filled with garlic fried snails and French bread to distribute to the other student protesters. Unfortunately, the police let the air out of all his tires and he could only drive the car at five miles an hour which turned out to be great because it enabled him to stand up in the car and lean out of the sunroof and hand food to all the protesting students. Jean-Pierre emigrated to Los Angeles, California, USA in 1972 where he became a successful bank manager. He recounted his story of his student active days to his grandson Jean-Pierre Jr. on his deathbed in 2014. His grandson vowed to honor his grandfather's actions and started his snail food truck company the following year. So as you heard, my description of my snail food truck company, its history, is pretty silly. And that's because I want it to be a fun company, so I want to write it in a fun way. Now your company might be much more serious, or it might have a different tone of voice, so try and think about how you can reflect that in not just the content of the writing of the history, but also in the way that it's written, the style of the writing as well. Now we have an idea of what our company does and we have a history of our company, it's time to think about some words that are going to describe our company and its philosophy and ultimately describe our design as well, describe our brand identity for the company. And what we're going to try and do is really build a relationship between the visual and the verbal here. So we're still working with writing and working with language before we even get to start to think about working with form. If we look at our real world example, back to PCM for instance, if we look at the kind of adjectives that might describe that company, we would look at things like they were a classical contemporary mix, they were advocates for a broad range of people across wide communities.
they wanted to be inspirational, they wanted to be educational. So we can come up with a list of words, but then you also need to unpack those words and expand upon those words. And this is going to be useful in, it's going to be a tool to help you think about what you might name your company as well. In this real world example, we don't really need that because the company already has a name. So you can see how these different adjectives might help you develop a design direction. So the classical contemporary mix might help us think, well, my design is going to be a mix of old and new. It's going to be some kind of combination of tradition and modernity. Or the fact that they're advocates might mean, I, well, I want my design to appeal to a wide audience, a lot of different cultures, economic backgrounds. So it has to be friendly, not too intimidating. So being inspirational, might be a shorthand to mean a lot of other things. Uplifting, it could be a reference to the music, the kind of crescendo in music, but it could also be a kind of humanist attitude that might indicate a certain kind of spirit as well. So PCM is also a company that takes education very seriously. So definitely a little bit sincere and scholarly rather than flippant. So if we take my invented example, the snail food truck, let's look at how those, what kind of adjectives might be used to describe that. So I might think of words like gourmet, it's definitely French, it's libertarian, which might relate to French culture but also to the student protests, and the idea of it being kind of plodding or slow, which again might relate to food but also to the truck itself. So in terms of design direction, we could look at a word like gourmet and think about its design implications being perhaps fancy or classy, maybe something that's meticulous or very carefully put together. We could take the word French and think about it being cultured and cultivated, intellectual, stylish, perhaps even conversational in some way. We can take the word libertarian and think about it being somehow revolutionary or representing protest graphics. Or we could look at plodding and think about its design direction being slow and quiet, perhaps spacious or static. So you can see how we can take all of these adjectives and start to unpack them and have a much wider vocabulary and a wider set of words that can describe what our goals might be for the company in representing it visually. Now our company has a history and a definition of what it does and some adjectives to describe its philosophy and its goals. But what it doesn't have yet is a name. And names can be really important. As we can see from these three very famous companies, Blue Ribbon Sports, Dassler Brothers Shoe Factory, and Backrub, or as you might know them better, Nike, Adidas, and Google. Nike comes from the name of the Greek goddess for victory, so it's quite easy to see how that name is very appropriate to do with sports and winning. With Adidas, the name actually comes from Adolf or Adi Dassler. So it's a shortened version of one of the brothers who founded the company that became Adidas. And Google means a one followed by a hundred zeros. And that talks about the ones and zeros in computer language, but it also talks about a mass of information that's going to be searched for. So you can see how all three of these names, they have a great deal of meaning that attaches them to their company, even if that's fairly abstract and you don't know its history, it's there and it's relevant. So we're going to work on that and we're going to try and figure out how do we come up with a name. And you can see the difference between these sets of names. None of them seem very interesting when they started and they might have been making the same product, but the naming, much shorter, much more concise, and even typographically make a much better shape. But it's hard to come up with a name just off the top of your head. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do some brainstorming. So let's go back to my startup that has a food truck selling snails. And let's think about how to brainstorm some language around that to try and come up with a name. So one of the things I might do is look at my history and take some of the key words out of that history and use those to make a mind map. And what this is is really a way of getting everything all the thoughts and research and connections in my head and getting them down onto a piece of paper so I can return to them at any given time and have them there but also so I can mix and match things and maybe get to some places that I hadn't quite expected. So one way of doing this is to have a list of words and then to build upon that list of words and expand upon each branch of them. So I might take the word here for instance 
let's look at this. I might look at 1968, and instead of just thinking about the student protests that were happening, I might also look at new wave cinema or the Situationists. I might look at fashion and it being particularly French and cool, or a certain kind of perhaps sunglasses or clothes that were being worn at the time. So what you're really doing here is building a web of information, a web of references, and these things are all connected to your company. If your company, imagine that your company is in the middle, then the things that are not too far away will be directly connected, and as you move further away, they'll be more indirectly connected and a little more tangential. And you can keep going with this web and build it to be as large as you want, but bear in mind that the more you build it, the further away you go from the center, the less connected these things are going to be. So this process is really about generating a lot of ideas, a lot of references. But it's not a lot of good to have hundreds and hundreds of references. You actually have to go through them and you have to edit them. So once you've gone through this period of output, there has to be a period of editing and evaluation because we want to take all of these different ideas and all of these different words and try and figure out how to distill those down into the name of your company. So from that much larger list, I've distilled it down to a much shorter list. And these are really key words that I think sum up something that's very important, an important aspect of the company. So now I might look at these and see, well, perhaps there's a word here that might be a good name for the company, but perhaps I need to combine some different words or to play around with the language and develop a word or make up a word of my own. You might also find that as well as individual words, you might come up with some slogans or some language that might be useful later on as part of your whole identity package. Once you decide on a word that you like or that you think is appropriate, then try and play around with that word, expand it, figure out if there are some options, what are the variations that that word offers. For instance, I like the word escargot, which obviously means snails, but also contains the word car and the word go. So it feels like it's got something very, very relevant to a lot of different aspects of my company. But then I can play around with that word. I can take the original word, I can break it up into those pieces, I can add other language to it. So I have a variety of options that are all in the same direction, but I'm really exploring which one is going to be the best. So here are my three options for my snail food truck company. So I decided to go with the escargo, which I like because it develop, it splits up the word escargo, but also has car and go. I went with revolution, which talks about the fact that eating snails might seem quite revolting to some people, but also the student protest and the revolution part of it, and also that it might be a culinary revolution as well. And my third option is snail trail, which just really talks about the snails themselves, but then the vehicle that they're being sold in moving very sl slowly, and perhaps people tracking the food truck and trying to follow it as well. So once you've decided upon your name, you've got all the components ready to start to build your brand development guide. So even though this is going to be a rough design and you won't be finished with the design, we're going to use this as a container, as a way for you to showcase your process. And you'll be going back and revising and reworking some of these pages. But for now, it's worth just getting everything in there so you can really see what you've got and evaluate it. So for instance, here's my first page that just tells me that I have a startup company that is a food truck selling snails. Here's my history that you heard earlier about the student riots in 68 and how the original truck came about. Here's my mind map that shows some of the things I've been thinking of. And I think if you could uh, actually draw, hand draw your mind maps, it's going to be a lot better because then you'll, they'll really look like process work and they'll look like your thinking and your ideation. And finally, here are the three key words that I chose as part of my philosophy for the company. And then here are my naming options. And I highlighted the one here that I chose to go with for my company, Escargo. So now we've got our company's name, we've got our research, we've got our goals for the company. But so far we've worked mainly with text and ideas. Now we're going to start looking at visual research. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at things from the past and from the present that might visually relate to our company.
we're going to put those images together into a collection of images and they're going to try and sum up the mood or atmosphere of our company and what we think the mood and atmosphere of the identity should be. So when we're looking at the past we're trying to get ideas to inspire us but we're also trying to make sure that we don't create an identity that already exists somewhere that we weren't aware of before. An interesting way to also think about it is that we're not really trying to copy anything from the past but we're trying to use it as an influence. We're trying to develop our design from something that might already be part of visual culture. So if we look at our real-world example of the Pasadena Conservatory of Music, here's some visual research that was carried out when we were working on that identity. So we were looking at visual identities from around the world for music conservatories and for orchestras. And we were really looking for marks and symbols and typography that had a flowing musical feeling to them. And so they were existing examples of what our goals were for the identity that we were going to redesign. So it's really useful to see a range of ideas and a range of competitors, both typographically and in terms of how symbols and icons might work as well. So as well as looking at existing identities, existing logo types and existing marks, we also looked at the overall look and feel of some competitors, how they used imagery, how they used color. And then we also looked very specifically at typography trying to find some examples that were musical in their forms. And this is something that you can do online as well, where now it's very easy to find websites where you can type in your name and look at it in a certain typeface to do initial research. So you can see the forms of that typeface without actually buying that typeface. So it's a great resource to try out typographic form for the name of your identity. We also looked a lot at the history of music, especially experimental music and scores, we were really interested in how music had been visualized in an unconventional way and we thought a lot of these forms were very energetic and very exciting. In a lot of ways they were visual representations of the music itself and that was one of the goals for our identity. There was a lot of energy and a lot of movement in these scores and we were very interested in taking some of that visual energy and having that be a key component in the mark that we were going to design for PCM. As well as looking at the more experimental scores, we also looked at traditional music markings and other language notations that are used for music. We also looked at the relationship between graphic design and music and looked at how different kinds of visual forms have been used to visualize different kinds of music. Visual research is a lot easier these days with the internet. There was a time when you had to look through books and meticulously spend weeks trying to search for images so you could put mood boards together, but nowadays you can do that very very quickly by searching online. Sometimes you even find that someone's already collected a group of images that are exactly what you're looking for. So now let's go back to our imaginary identity. Here's my food truck selling snails, the beginning of my brand identity manual. So here you can see some visual research for my imaginary startup. So for the contemporary images I mainly looked at the form of the snail and the form of the car and the van. And I looked at really how a snail could be represented in a wide range of ways, scientifically, in a cartoon, a photograph, graphically as an icon. For the more historical images, I looked at how the 1968 protests had been represented graphically at the time, but I also looked at documentary photography from the time, I looked at some old technical illustrations of snail shells. I also looked at how escargot had been packaged. And I looked at some Art Nouveau posters that felt very French. One of the things that's important to remember when you're doing this visual research is that you're not actually going to use any of these images and copy them. They're really there to inspire you when you're making your own graphic forms. So now we can take our visual research and we can put that into our brand development guide. So here is my snail food truck company guide and I can take those images for both the contemporary and the historical visual research and I can give them their own page and so you can see all of the images individually. Now I might have researched a whole lot more images than this and this is really an edited selection, a selection that I might think are the best images or the best range of images or the ones that feel the right for the kind of mood and tone that I want my company to have. 
but as well as laying these out on these individual pages so I can see the images as a set and try and get a mood and a feeling from them as a set, I can actually use them as individual components to make my brand development guide itself feel a little bit more like I want my whole identity to feel. So let's look at how that might work. So here's my brand development guide with just the textual research that we've carried out so far. And now if I start to put those images into the pages, you can see how they become illustrations, they flesh out the design, and suddenly it becomes much, much more interesting as a guide, I think both visually and in terms of meaning. So this is one way that we can build our guide as we're developing the content for it. So it's not a case of us just doing all of our research and all of our development and then putting it into some kind of publication at the end. It's really a case of developing that as we go and using that as a vehicle to show our design as we build it. In this module, we're going to look at creating a logo type for your imaginary startup company. Rather than diving in and starting to choose typefaces straight away, first of all, we're going to look at the shapes of the letters that you have to work with. So we're going to look at the words or the word that is your company name and try and examine that a little more closely. So if we use my escargo as an example, you can see here just by varying the uppercase and the lowercase, we get several different shapes out of the letter forms. So already, just in one typeface, we've got plenty of decisions to make. And it's not just the difference between uppercase and lowercase that can create a different feeling in your name. Here, for instance, I'm looking at different typographic marks to break the word up. And you can see that they start to feel very different just from, again, one change. So it's worth exploring the variations in that one change. And sometimes that's a good way to generate a lot of very fast variations to try and think of a category, a change that you might make, like uppercase or lowercase, or in this case, changing the punctuation, and then try and examine all the possibilities that that could possibly mean. And it doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily use all of these, but it's a way to sometimes come up with something that you might not have originally thought of, or you might not have been able to imagine. And some of these decisions are going to affect the overall shape that your logo type is going to make. And again, irregardless of what typeface you choose, some of the basic shapes are going to be the same. So if we set a logo type in all caps, for instance, it's going to make a much more rectilinear shape. It's going to have a lot of more direction to it. But on the other hand, if we set it in upper and lower case, it's going to have a little more rhythm, a little more bounce to it, and it's also going to probably feel a little more human as well. As well as looking at the shape of the word, we can also look at the individual characters. And this is where we start to begin to get a direction for what kind of typefaces we might look at. Within any given letter form, there's a number of variations to it, and it's still recognizable as that letter form. So if we look at the lowercase a, for instance, we can see a number of different variations to it. It can be a single story, a double story, it can have a serif, no serif, slab serifs. So there are a lot of variations just in the shapes. And again, it's worth doing a little bit of research and examining all of these possibilities and all of these shapes, because there might be some shapes in a particular typeface that you want to use in a typeface that doesn't have them. So for instance, you might decide you want to make a double story G in a sans serif when it's traditionally only been seen in a serif. And if we compare the amount of variation that's possible in the letter forms between the lowercase on the left and the uppercase on the right, you can see that there's actually a lot more variation in the lowercase. So this gives us a lot more possibilities in terms of the shapes that we might use in our logo type. If you look at the right hand side with the capital letters, the uppercase letters, those tend to have a little less variation and tend to be much more similar, despite being the same range of typefaces that you can see on the left. And there are obviously certain characters, certain letters, that have a lot more variation than others. So A and the G, for instance, are good examples of letter forms that are quite intricate and complex and have a lot of variation. So these might be worth identifying as places that could be typographically interesting in your logo type. 
But if we look at certain other letters, so for instance, looking at the letter O, there's a little less variation there. It's very, very similar. So this might be a letter form that we know that we can't pull it around too much and change its form too much because there's a little bit less to work with there. So again, what we're doing here before we even look at anything to do with typefaces is really looking at individual letter forms, looking at which other letter forms they sit next to, trying to look at the overall shape of the word, but also trying to identify what particular letter forms might have interesting shapes and might have possibilities for us to develop in an interesting way in our logo type. A good way to get a starting structure or skeleton for your logo type is to look at typefaces that already exist that might have shapes of letters that you think are particularly interesting or relevant to your company or they might have a conceptual or formal connection to your company. So if I look at my Escargo selection of typefaces, I'd be choosing them for quite different reasons and I'd be looking at a different range of typographic forms but they cover different ideas and head in different directions. The first one is a contemporary sans serif and I like the geometric forms, the round O feels like a wheel and I also like the rounded terminals in the letter forms and that's because these have something of the quality of a snail's body. For this second typeface I'm choosing a typeface that's by the French type designer Roger Excafon and I feel like this has a very very French feeling to it but by choosing this particular cut of the typeface that's rounded at the corners it also feels again a little bit like a snail-like form but then using the italic gives it some direction and speed as well. And this third typeface I chose because it's used for Jean-Luc Godard's movie titles which I feel like they have a connection to the student protests in Paris in 68. And I chose this particular typeface because I like the repetition in the C, the G, and the O. And that circular repetition, you can see it in the lower case as well, with the C, the A, the G, and the O. It feels a little bit like wheels or has a sense of motion to me. I also like the fact that it feels modern and contemporary. And it feels a little bit kind of classy as well. So I feel like it could fulfill some of the requirements of my adjectives that I picked for my company. This typeface I chose because I really liked the forms of it, purely just because they feel a little bit old-fashioned, they feel a little bit art deco, but they've also got a nice flow to them and a nice rhythm, so they feel a little bit alive, a little bit organic. So that felt like it was quite relevant to the company as well. And this final version, I chose this typeface because it's very similar to a lot of European license plates on cars. So I felt like there was a connection there to the uh, Citroen 2CV that was part of my backstory. So again, you can see there's a lot of different reasons why you might choose a particular starting point, a particular skeleton. But any of these skeletons that you choose, you're not going to use them in a literal way as a typeface. You're going to have to alter them and change the forms of them and really think about the particular letter forms you've got in your word and how to make them be much more distinct. You might end up at this stage in your process with quite a lot of typefaces to look at. So how are you going to narrow them down? Well one good way is to quite quickly take them for a test drive. Really just throw them around, look at their forms and do some really fast visual tests just to see if there's something interesting there because you never know what you're going to hit on and this can be a, a fun and experimental and playful part of your process as well. So if we skip over to our real world example, Pasadena Conservatory of Music, these are some of the initial tests that we did when we were just looking at typefaces that we thought had potential. So you can see that rather than just picking a typeface and then letting it have one iteration, we were carrying out various different iterations and trying out various different formal things quite quickly and we weren't expecting all of these to work in any way at all. We were really just trying to generate a lot of material and really explore the typographic territory and then we'd sit down, 
look at what we've made and try and analyze and pick out the things that were interesting and maybe things that we were going to develop a little bit further and take to the next stage of the identity. So you can think about this stage of the project as if it's a kind of digital sketching. So you're not really looking at finessing anything or making anything be a final finished logotype but what you are trying to do is explore and do a rough sketch of the possibilities for these letter forms and what you'll find is because we're used to working on the computer now even a sketch can look quite finished quite quickly and the key here is for you to really remember that they're just sketches and that you're going to have a lot more to explore as you progress with the project. Now that we've got a typographic skeleton to work with we can start to begin to customize the letter forms and move away a little bit from perhaps the systematic rules of the typeface design and start to look at a different kind of system that might apply more to the relationship of the individual letters we have in our word. So here is the version of Escargo that I chose to develop. And one of the first things I would probably ask myself is, hmm, why did I pick this one over the others? So I would try and analyze it and see what are the points of interest within this particular version. So I would look at some repetition in the G, the O, the C, and a little bit in the S that feels quite nice. Again, I feel like the roundness is both perhaps a reference to a snail shell or perhaps wheels that's interesting. I very much like the arm of this G pointing back in and the way it almost lines up with a lot of the other horizontal lines and that feels like these could be areas of interest or potential areas to make something happen typographically distinct. I also feel like it's almost a sense of symmetry where the only vertical in this R is almost in the middle of the type itself so that there's quite a nice symmetry if you think of this folding over the A goes to the R and there's counter spaces in both of those that feel quite similar. The C to the G has a similarity and even the S to the O. So I feel like there's quite a lot of potential to work with and it, overall it's also very clean, very simple and I feel like that was part of my goal as well. So here are some variations where I'm trying to manipulate the typographic form and to get it to move a little bit away from the typeface and perhaps start to think about building relationships between these individual letters. So let's very quickly look at these in detail and talk about them. So here's my original version for comparison that I started out with and now here's a version where I'm starting to manipulate the typographic form. So you can see I've taken the crossbar from this A and dropped it down and dropped down the hyphens and the reason why I like this is because it perhaps indicates a sense of movement or the dotted lines on a road. So I feel like that has a good relationship to um, my company. It might also be the, the trail that a snail had left behind. So if we look at this next version, you can see I'm trying to do something similar with the line, but now I'm putting much more emphasis on this arm of the G connecting and instead of lowering the bars in the other letter forms, I've actually raised them so I can try and align them all together. So we can look at the two of these together and try and judge which one we think is more successful than the other. In this version, I'm adding some weight to the typeface and I'm also italicizing it. So it's getting a little heavier and a little blobbier. And part of what I'm trying to do here is get a sense of movement and direction, but also make the letter forms feel organic and snail-like. In this version, I'm taking away the hyphens and instead I'm using a change in weight to try and emphasize the differentiation between the two words that are contained within Escargo. So the car is now standing out, not because it's isolated with the hyphens, but because of uh, it being in a lighter weight. So again, I like a little bit of the echoing of the typographic form here. And these are alternate characters that exist within this typeface McBean and they're quite interesting in themselves so you can see where the R is truncated here and flattened is quite interesting. And in the final one I'm really looking at adding serifs, slab serifs throughout these letter forms and this makes the forms quite interesting again trying to relate this line 
but as you can see it's perhaps a little too much going on it starts to be very overly active and it isolates a little bit some of the rounder characters so it feels a little bit uneven perhaps a little bit too much going on in here and not enough going on at the outside edges but again all of these things are tests and we're not expecting to produce five or six great logo types we're really just trying them out and seeing whether they have potential. In this next stage in our process we're going to look at variations and refinement to our logo type. So if we go back to our escargot as our starting point I'm going to take the logo type that I thought was perhaps the most successful from the last round and now I'm going to try and make much smaller moves and I'm going to try and make those moves into a series of logo types so that they feel like they belong in the same family so they're all quite similar but then they all also have something different about them a particular design move so in this first one the only move that I'm making is just extending the arm of the G so by isolating this one thing I can easily compare the two logo types together and that's quite often a good way of deciding whether a move that you're making is successful or not by having something to compare it to. Is it better like this or better like this? And in this version you can see that I'm now extending a kind of logic that existed with this dotted line and making that work with the crossbar of the A. So again it's one isolated move and I can look at it and judge whether I think that's successful or not. In this version I've taken it a stage further and I've built an even stronger relationship between the dashes and the crossbar of the A. By putting them all at an angle they create a, a kind of rhythm and a repetition that means they're tied very closely together. And here there's a similar idea but now I've taken the crossbar of the A and moved it entirely out of the letter form and you can see that I've to replicate that I've also joined the hyphens to the back of the C, the back of the G, and extended the bar of the R as well. So you can see this has created a, a very similar but a different kind of system. But again, it's really just one move. And in this last version, I've left the hyphens and the dashes down at the bottom because I liked the way that they looked like the markings in a road. But here, I've started to try and make the O replicate the image of a snail. And by taking this form of the dash and putting that under the O, I can also get the form of the snail itself, both the shell and the body, but build a relationship between the animal and the trail. So that gives it a sense of direction as well. And I think this is perhaps the one that I'm going to try and develop further. So now I've got my final logo type. And this is the slightly finessed version of it. So I looked at the spacing of the letter forms tried to make each letter feel fairly even and one of the biggest things was just drawing this head of the snail just lifting it up a little bit so you know that the snail is heading in this direction and this is the trail that it's leaving behind so now we have a finished logo type we can take both the process work from our logo type and the finished logo type itself and put that into our brand guide so here are the first few pages of my guide with the illustrations that I'd added earlier. So now I can also add both my image research and my typography research. So here's a page for instance of type explorations and the logo type development. And then here's another page that much larger shows the final logo type. So now you can see our brand development guide is starting to get a little bit more interesting and feel like it's less just process work and now it feels like it's heading towards a more finished result. In this module we're going to expand your brand. We're going to add some extra elements to it so we've got a broader palette to work with. And it might be that we don't use all of these elements all the time but it gives us a little more range and flexibility in the identity. The first thing that we're going to do is think about adding color. Most identities have some kind of corporate color or commonly used color. So it's up to you to try and think of what might work for your company. 
and there's various different ways of thinking about what's the right color. Color can always be fairly subjective, but you can try and think about reasons for why your company might use a certain color, and it might be something that just feels very appropriate. So for instance, with my escargot company, I might begin by looking at browns and greens because they look like nature, but also because they're the color of snails and of snail shells, and also of the snails when they're cooked. Another way to think about coming up with color ideas is to go back to your research. You can look at your adjectives about your company and you can see if there are any colors that fit those adjectives. But you could also look at your image research and see if there's a way to pull colors out of the images that you've already got. So for instance here I'm looking at a dark muddy green that's coming out of the snail shell or the snails themselves when they're cooked. Or perhaps a bright red orange color that looks like the protest posters from 1968 in Paris. Or I might look at the 2CV and try and find a color that's commonly used for that car. Once you've got some initial ideas for the kind of colors you think are going to be successful, you can put them into a digital context and pull them around on screen. So you can change the hue, the saturation, the value, and this will give you a chance to see your logo type actually in the finished color. So you'll be able to judge fairly accurately whether it's working or not. When you're looking at color for your logo type, it's also very useful to look at it in both a positive and a negative way. In other words, to look at the color when it's the figure, the color of the logo type, and when it's the ground, the background color as well. Sometimes this makes judging the colors a little bit easier because when it's a ground, quite often the field of the color is larger so you see more of the color, so it becomes a little more apparent when it's working and when it's not. And one other thing to think about is how your color is going to appear. Is it going to be printed? Is it a Pantone color, a spot color? Or is it CMYK? Or is it going to be primarily on screen, in which case you really want it to look good in RGB? So it's worth taking your colors and seeing the difference between how they might look on screen and how they might look in print. And this difference is going to be a little bit less apparent on screen because you're not really going through the same process as CMYK, but you can still see a little difference. So if we zoom into these three colors, for instance, you'll be able to see, hopefully, a little bit of difference where quite often the colors will be a little bit darker as CMYKs and a little bit brighter and cleaner when they're being produced as RGB colors. But what you're really looking for here is something that is fairly close in both its RGB and its CMYK or Pantone iterations. The next thing we're going to add to broaden our palette is a mark or an icon. And this can also sometimes be called a logo. Not a logo type, but a logo. So in general, these marks are often pictorial or abstract and non-typographic. So we could spend a lot of time just making the mark or the icon and making it be the central part of the identity instead of the logo type. So if you think about Nike or Apple, for instance, their marks are probably more recognizable than their logo types. But I'm going to turn it over to you and let you have the responsibility for developing your mark or icon. So here is my mark that I'm working on, and this one is taken from what I developed earlier when I was looking at my logo type. So now I'm going to pull the mark away from the logo type and work on it separately. Symbols, marks, and trademarks often work using very simplified, sometimes geometric form. They also generally work in black and white using negative and positive space. And this is because a lot of them come from a tradition of a time when marks were made for reproduction in print and color printing was much more expensive so often they'd have to work in black and white but that's not really the case these days now your mark is probably going to exist mostly on a screen so you can now think of your mark as using color as a more integral part of its design and also perhaps having a little more detail and maybe not necessarily having to work in such a simplistic and geometric form and you could also think of your mark as having a different line quality as well. It could be much more textured, it could be much more hand-drawn, for instance, and it could also be less flat, more three-dimensional. Also these days, you have to think about how is your mark going to move. It's almost certainly going to be animated on screen, 
so that's something else to keep in the back of your head. Since I'm a relatively old school type of designer, I'm going to keep my mark fairly traditional. I'm going to mostly work in black and white and with contrast and with simple geometric forms. So when I look at my logotype, I'm trying to think how might I develop this. It's not just about making it the most simple that it can be, stripping away any unnecessary information. It's also about making that information communicate the right thing. So if this was my original O that was looking like a snail, I can make it look a lot more like a snail by creating a spiral in the shell because this is a quintessential piece of visual information in recognizing that it's a snail that you're looking at. And you can use a similar process when you're making your mark that you used when you were making a logotype. And that's to make a lot of iterations to then to evaluate them, see which ones work and develop those and gradually work more and more with smaller details. So here, for instance, I'm looking at a shell with a slightly different shape. And in this version, I'm trying to see if I can get rid of the snail's body entirely and just convey the idea of the snail with just the shell. And when your form becomes abstract like this, it can also have other connotations that can be quite useful. Sometimes you want your mark to mean more than one thing, and perhaps it can have connotation and denotation. So it can be a denotative image that's a snail, but be a connotative image of something else. In this version, I added the snail's body back in, but just the head this time, and also added some antenna so it's even more recognizable as a snail. And then I tried mixing an earlier version with the antenna head snail so that the shell appears to be white instead of dark with a white spiral. So you can see how it's playing with the figure ground relationships. When the space is contained, you can look at it as both negative and positive. So here's my final set of marks that I made. And again, these can act as process, so I'm going to put them into my brand development guide. But I'm also going to take one of them and use that as the mark for my company. And I think I'm going to use the bottom middle one. And I think part of the reason that I like this version is because it's cut off at the bottom, so you don't need to see the whole of the snail's body. And that also makes it feel like it's less of an illustration and more of a mark. And it gives it a little bit more of a base, so I feel like it can sit on the page a little bit better. And I also like the negative and positive relationship with the spiral in the shell. So the next thing that I'm going to do with my mark is look at how it might work in color. Now I've already looked at color and I have a color palette and a selection of colors, so now I'm going to see how those might apply to my mark. So I could think about the mark being in black and white, but I could also think about it being used, being reproduced in one of my corporate colors. But I could also think about it working as two colors, as you can see on the right. And these colors look quite traditional in brown and green. They're quite expected, I feel. So I could also try my mark in a much more unexpected color. So here I'm using the red-orange that was symbolizing the protest graphics from the student protests of 68. So here you can see my mark working and in black and white, working in one color and working in two colors. And you could also make your mark work in full color or full color. There really aren't that many restrictions anymore. But there is something quite interesting about trying to work in black and white in this reductivist way. And even though it's a quite an old-fashioned modernist tradition, I feel like it lends to a sense of legibility and readability of your mark that's going to help it operate at a number of different scales. The next component that we're going to add is a secondary typeface. And this is something that just helps us build out our palette. And it means that whenever we're going to have any large amounts of text or even small amounts of text, we're going to try and give that a distinct voice as well. Quite often the secondary typeface is something that works together with the logo type. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same kind of typeface, and it could be used to signify or add another kind of message that might have been one of your adjectives or might have been something very important in your company that isn't being communicated by the logo type. So here are three typefaces that I chose to look at. Antique Olive, which we saw before, the Roger Excafon typeface, which I feel is very friendly, very French, and it has some nice rounded forms to it in this particular cut of it. And then I have Ashley's Script, which is a 
handwritten typeface, and I particularly like the capitals because they feel like they're written with a paintbrush, and they those I'm choosing because they really relate to the student protest graphics. And then my last typeface choice is Apoq, and this is a modern typeface, very recent typeface, but it's geometric and very clean, so this is a way for me to try and get a little bit of a modern contemporary feel into my identity and also to keep it looking clean and classy. So once I've started to pick my typefaces, I really need to take them for a test drive. So that one of the best things to do is to see how they work as body text and also see how they work as headlines and also see how they work as a medium size, like a subheading. What I find useful to do is to put them next to some of the other components that I've already made. So here I'm adding in my mark and my logo type so I can see the three different typefaces all together with those elements and I can start to judge which ones I think are working better. So when I look at these I quite like the bottom one, the APQ, because it feels very clean, it's very legible and it feels like if I was going to eat food I would trust that kind of typeface. But I feel like the middle one, the Ashley script, is probably the most interesting formally and it adds this element of student protest and a little bit of a handmade nature and perhaps a little bit of nostalgia that I think is missing from my other elements. So I think I'm going to choose that to use probably just for headlines since it's hard to read as a text face and then maybe I'll use APQ as my text face. So again I'm building a suite of components and I may not use them all the time but they're there if I need them. The next thing that we're going to add to our design palette is a style of imagery. Now this could be anything that you want it to be. It could be an illustration in any kind of aesthetic style that you like. It could be photography. It could be 3D digital imagery. It's really up to you. And again, I'm going to give you an opportunity to add whatever style of imagery you think is appropriate, whatever you think is right for your startup. For my particular startup, I think I'm going to try and use black and white photography because I want it to have a little bit of an old feeling. And I also want to use the aesthetic of old black and white street photography because it has a very French and hip aesthetic that I want to try and maintain in my identity. So you can see here I'm very quickly just mocking up some ads so that I can see what my photography might look like in context. And this is a good way, again, to test drive your photography to see how it's going to work with your typeface choice, with your color palette, with your logo type, with your mark. And again, these are things that can go back into your brand development guide so they can show your process and how it's growing. And as you can see, we're gradually putting all our components together and getting a more coherent voice. And if possible at this stage, you should really try and make your own imagery. So if you're using illustration, see if you can make those illustrations yourself. If you're using photography or a photographic style, see if you can use that photographic style. So I'm just using stand-in images for now. And these are images that are just pulled off the internet. And you can search for things that are copyright free that will allow you to use them. But you do have to be careful that if you're actually going to use any images really for a client, you do have to pay for them and make sure that they're cleared by copyright. But for now, these are just really, again, about look and feel. So if I was going to use this particular photographic style, I would use this as my inspiration and I would try and recreate something similar myself. The final thing that we're going to add to our brand palette is a secret ingredient. And this can be anything that you make up, anything extra that you want to add, as well as the other things that we've already included. Quite often this can be something that is a rule for how your identity system works. It could be something modular, it could be something that changes throughout the identity, but whatever it is, it should be something that makes it more interesting. So for my Escargo logo, I'm going to take the logo type that I'd already developed, and I'm going to take some of my marks that I'd made, and I'm going to fuse the two together in a modular system. So on the left, you can see the logo type that I'd made, and six of the marks that I'd made. And on the right, you can see that I'm going to combine them in different ways. And these can then form a modular set of logos that somebody using them could use them at different times or for different things. 
I'd have to figure out exactly what that strategy might be, but one might be for, say, the van itself, one might be for the parent company, and one might be for staff and employees. Or I could do it in a more playful way and just have them be random. And you can think about how to extend this into a broader system, even if you don't implement it. So for instance, I could think that these snails might be something that anybody could create their own snail online and upload it to the Escargo company website, and it would then become part of the logo. And I'd have this great big bank of different kind of images that anybody could pull down and use. So whatever your secret ingredient might be, it's entirely up to you. It could be systematic, it could be an additional element, it could be something strange and weird and funny, or it could be something that's really functional. Whatever it is, it's really your chance to add something to the personality of your brand identity. And sometimes those kind of systems can really add a lot. If you think, for instance, about Google Doodles, that's become a really important part of Google's visual identity and its online identity. Even though it uses a wide range of styles, it's really about a strategy that's being added to here. So you could think about adding a secret ingredient that's going to make your company feel a little bit more special than all its competitors. And your strategy might be something that needs a written explanation as well, especially if it's something that is systematic. It might not be apparent just from the visuals that you're showing, so it's always a good idea to write down how your system works. In this module, we're going to look at how you can take all of the pieces that you've made as part of your brand identity palette and apply them to some pieces of collateral that make up your brand. So these pieces can be anything. They can be any kind of design object that you think is relevant to your particular startup company. So if I look at Escargo and come up with some ideas for what kind of vehicles might be good to apply my design palette to, I might think of creating a uniform for perhaps the waiters or the staff or drivers in my vans. I might also think about what the truck itself is going to look like, how I might design some kind of mural wrap that's going to work with the Citroen 2CV. I could also think about table settings, about collateral that could exist along with that. And I might also think about at least one digital application. So I might look at a tracker app so that I could find wherever the trucks might be. So these would be four choices that would be related to my particular company, but your four choices could be totally different because they really should be things that grow out of what your company does. There are some things that are staples that most companies are going to need, so you could easily work with letterheads and business cards, but I think it's interesting to try and think of what your particular company might want and what might be relevant just to your company. Making these kind of mock-ups is a great way to test your identity system and it also means that you can visualize it in a fairly finished state. Sometimes this is the best thing to do because it lets a client see their design as it's living in the real world. To show you some examples of this, I'm going to walk you through our real-world client, Pasadena Conservatory of Music, and look at some of the presentation material from that. So here in this initial presentation, there's three different ideas, and you can see a lot of the elements that we've already looked at. So there's a logotype, where it's typographically treated. There's variations of how the type locks up. And then here you can see there's various different applications of that design. So there's business card, letterhead, and annual report. There's also here some t-shirts and some banners, and these would all be elements that PCM would be wanting to produce. So it's a great way for them to see what this particular identity might work like. In order to compare it for this initial presentation, we actually produced the same materials for three or four different identities. So here you can see a slightly different direction, much more classical with a totally different lockup, but also a very different color palette and a very different hierarchy to the relationship between the mark and the logo type. But again, you can see here that we're actually applying it to the same kind of materials. So you can have a comparative situation where you can look between the different identities and see how they're going to work and see which one works best. 
So here in a third direction, you can see that there's musical notation embedded within the type and a very cool, much more conservative color palette. The style of the imagery changes slightly as well to be a little more moody here. And then you can see the same applications again with the t-shirts and the street banners. This is the last direction, which is the one that we ended up developing. So here you can see the mark, and the mark is actually modular, so it breaks down into different pieces. So here you can see the mark in some variations with a different color palette, different typography as well. And here it is applied again to business card, letterhead, and annual report. And the same again, you can see it in the t-shirt and the street banners. We developed the mark itself into a modular system, so it could grow and be used in different forms. And we equated this to how the structure of musicians work, so whether it was a solo with one piece, a duet with two, trio with three, quartet with four, etc. So you can see here a lot of similarity between how this system is working in a presentation to a client and the kind of brand development guide that you've been working on. So at this stage, our mark was fairly fixed, and we were really looking at the typography and the logo type and seeing which might work the best. And we're also looking at different scales and different kind of lockups and relationships between the logo type and the mark. And here's some secondary typefaces and a color palette. So again, very, very similar to the kind of roadmap that we've been following with our own identity guide. And here are some mock-ups with the annual report again and the business card and the letterhead. And again, here you can see some applications with the business card and the letterhead and the annual report, but here it's a little more playful and the scale relationships between the typography and the mark have changed, so we're also looking at what our design and composition strategies might be. And in this version you can see a different color palette, but also applied in a radically different way. So it's affecting how the imagery is going to look, and also how the overall feel is going to be. So as we get further into this process, we're narrowing down our colors and our typeface choice. And we're also looking at things like the website, and even though this is just a mock-up design done very quickly, it's really to look at how the color palette might work within that identity. So if you think about your secret ingredient, here with Pasadena, one of our ingredients was that we created a set of business cards where we allowed different people within the organization to pick which design they liked. So this gave them a chance to personalize their card and feel a connection with the identity. And the letterhead had a similar approach where there were various different versions that people could choose from. We also created an identity manual, and this is different from the kind of guide, the brand development guide that we're creating. The manual is really for people that are using the logo type, and it's a set of rules and instructions. What we're creating with our brand development guide is really something that looks at our own process and how we've built up this identity. In this final module, you're going to spend some time developing and finessing your brand development guide. This is your chance to really display your brand to its best potential. So you want to show your process, but also show the finished resolution of the identity that you've created. So spend a little time going back, finessing anything that you're unhappy with, reworking your writing, but also think about the design of the brand guide itself. So in a lot of ways, you're really doing two projects. You're showing the identity that you've worked on, and that's one design project, but then you're also designing the guide itself, which is another design project. So for my snail food truck, Escargo, I'm trying to make the pages look like they belong together. I've gone back and added some images that I found, but I'm generally following the roadmap that we set out, and that shows my process growing in a logical way that I can explain to a client. So you can see that we go from the initial idea to the development of the idea through thinking and writing. Then we go through editing and refinement to try and come up with a name and a set of goals. And then in the next stage, we start to become more visual and carry out visual research. And then we begin to look at our logo type and develop that typographically. In the last stages, we start to see our logo type being developed broadening our palette, adding color and a mark, secondary type, and also some kind of systematic approach.
And finally, what we reach is a point where that identity can be applied to a number of different elements. Think about your PDF as having a kind of narrative, and that narrative being the growth of your identity. So try and make the pages flow a little bit from page to page and escalate in terms of their complexity and in terms of their finesse. We've worked on your brand development guide as a PDF because that's often the easiest way to show it to people. But you could also use this as a printed guide as well. So you could print it out and make a small book from it as well if that's a better way for you to show the work to the client. When I work on an identity project like this, I often show the client an on-screen version and also a printed version so they get an idea how the identity is going to feel in both the digital and the printed world.